Good afternoon. I'd like to ask the interpreter currently on the Spanish channel to commence translation of the meeting. For those just joining the meeting, live translation in Spanish is available and members of the public or staff wishing to listen in Spanish can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the interpretation icon in the Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you only hear the Spanish translation. Pablo, will you please restate this in Spanish? Para los que recién se unan a la reunión, interpretación en vivo al español está disponible y miembros del público o personales pueden unirse al canal. Para unirse, haga clic sobre el icono de interpretación en la barra de herramientas de Zoom que ahora aparece como un globo de raqueo. Una vez se una al canal de español, se recomienda que apague el audio primario para que solo escuche la interpretación al español. Hello and welcome to our April 9th, 2024 Santa Rosa City Council meeting. It is now 2.32 and we will be starting our meeting. Seeing a quorum, Madam City Clerk, may you please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Rogers? Here. Councilmember Okrepke? Here. Councilmember McDonald? Here. Councilmember Fleming? Here. Councilmember Alvarez? Present. Vice Mayor Stapp? Here. Mayor Rogers? Present. Let the record show that all council members are present. Thank you. We will now proceed to item 3.1, which is our closed session for today. It is um, 3.1 conference with legal counsel about existing litigation. Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment on this item? Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 3.1. If you're in the chamber and would like to comment but have not yet provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please state your name for public record if you choose to do so. The first public comment will be from Eris, followed by James, then Steve. Hi, I'm Eris Weaver with the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. For the last seven years, we have circulated petitions, made public comment, written letters, uh, to you, to the SMART, to the CPUC um, about this issue with Jennings, and I don't think there's a single fact or feeling that I could express that haven't already been done a zillion times. But never in those years have I doubted the commitment of the city of Santa Rosa to the Jennings Crossing until I got the agenda for today's meeting and saw a kill the project option coming before you. I was flabbergasted. Uh, it's also kind of confusing to me on the agenda because it's under the reports rather than the public hearings section later today, which made me wonder, is the real decision going to be happening in this closed session or is it going to be happening at the later agenda item? So I busted my butt to ride up here from Petaluma to get here in time to speak to you before it. Option three is just not an option. Um, whether you go for option one or option two, at the next SMART board meeting, I will be there with my posse to suggest that if SMART wants to um, get our support for a future tax renewal measure, it might be in their best interest to stop obstructing this. Um, their objections are illogical. Their demands on the city are unreasonable. We don't just care about them building the smart path. We want to see an interconnected active transportation and public transit network, which this crossing is a big part of. So again, I don't know what all happens in your closed session with the attorneys and whether the decisions happening there are happening later today. I'll be back for that. but. Please, option three is not an option. Thank you. The next speaker will be James, followed by Steve, then Janet. Yes. I am James Duncan. SMART's real property license agreement suggests that SMART staff believes that they can determine the safety of the Jennings Crossing and whether the city can construct it or not. My research indicates that it can't do either. Article 12, Section 8 of the California Constitution 
states that a public body like SMART may not regulate matters over which the legislature grants regulatory power to the Public Utilities Commission. Public Utilities Code sections 1201, 1202, and 99152 give this PUC exclusive authority to approve the location, the terms of installation, operation, maintenance, use, and protection. That is, in other words, the safety of railroad crossings. SMART's real property license agreement would be unenforceable by SMART because it is contrary to those provisions. The PUC previously directed SMART to cooperate in good faith to reach a construction agreement for the Jennings Crossing. But SMART's real property license agreement states it is not an agreement to construct the crossing. The administrative law judge at the PUC has more recently specified that the agreement to be reached between the city and SMART is a construction agreement, not a real property license agreement. The third option suggested by city staff constitutes abandonment of the Jennings Crossing, but the city would first have to fulfill all procedures and requirements mandated by state law before abandoning the Jennings Crossing, which would involve notice and a public hearing. And it would also have to establish that the crossing was not in the public interest, which at this point would be near to impossible. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next comment will be from Steve, followed by Janet. Thank you, Steve Bertelba with the Transportation and the Andrews Coalition. Um, I think it's important for us to understand the reason why SMART is dragging its feet about this crossing. It's clear that the crossing is needed. It's clear that it is a very safe crossing. Pedestrian crossings are at the bottom of the list when the FRA issues its reports on hazardous crossings. Crossings that have thousands of, motor, of automobiles using them are much more prone to a problem than crossings that have two or 300 people crossing them on foot or on bicycle. And so their records predict that there's a very, very small chance of any sort of an accident at this crossing. So why is the Public Utilities Commission staff so concerned about this crossing? The reason is that Santa Rosa had an $8 million grant in order to build a grade separation. And after examining all of the reasons for one or the other, they decided that it was appropriate to have an at-grade crossing. And the staff admitted that this was their reason for opposing. You look at page 199 of the transcript, and they say, this is a bad precedent. We don't want it to happen. Well, it's a good precedent. It's something that needs to happen. But I think you should keep that, that position of the CPUC staff uh, in your mind as negotiating with SMART, because SMART does need to build crossings between here and, and Windsor, between here and Hillsburg. So they're always going back to the staff and so they're inclined to want to back up the CPUC staff. They don't want to be at crossroads with them. We need to get them past that. We need to have them agree to a reasonable agreement. And the option number two is the best start. Thank you. Thank you. The next comment will be from Janet. Mayor Rogers and city council members, my name is Janet Baracco. I'm a homeowner and Santa Rosa residence on Jennings Avenue for 24 years. Um, and for um, over eight years, I have worked with my neighbors and others to support restoring this 120 year old crossing that provides bike and pedestrian access east-west in our community. 
I wish to thank the city, city council for the work you have already done with SMART, and I ask you to please continue to represent the interest of our community and to not give up on restoring this car free at grade crossing at Jennings. I urge you to continue to negotiate with SMART for a fair and balanced agreement. Abandoning Jennings Crossing after so many years of hard work by our neighbors and citizen organizations is unacceptable. Please don't give up on us. And once again, I extend an invitation to each of you to come view and walk the crossing site with me so that you can see how valuable it is to our community. Thank you. Mayor, I'm seeing no one else approach the podium for public comment on item 3.1. Okay, and with that, we will now recess into closed session. Thank you.
All right, welcome back everyone. It is April 9th, 2024, and we will be beginning our Santa Rosa City Council meeting. Um, it is now 3.32. Um, Madam City Clerk, may you please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Rogers. Here. Councilmember Okrepke. Here. Councilmember McDonald. Here. Councilmember Fleming. Here. Councilmember Alvarez. Present. Vice Mayor Stepp. Here. Mayor Rogers. Present. Let the record show that all council members are present. Thank you. We will now proceed to item four, which is our study session for the day. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, members of council. So item 4.1 is the impact of development uh, impact fee waivers. Uh, so before staff gets started, I want to offer a little bit of context on initially how we as city staff got to this point. So drafting the 2023 work plan, one of the items that we discussed was what was the impact on um, waiving impact fees. So we started that discussion. In between that time, there have been several proposals, some internally, and the most recent one that we received uh, from Gen H um, as to how there might be other options uh, to waive impact fees. So we as staff are prepared to offer uh, a couple of solutions at the end of this um, uh, report um, and we're also ready to execute and move in the direction, the policy the direction that this body um, requests us to uh, move. Um, as we uh, talk about um, impact fees and where we are with our arena numbers, here's some context. So for very low, the city has completed 403 units of the 1,218 units that we are required to complete, which is 33%. And these numbers have not been officially certified by HCD, which is why they're not in the presentation. In the low category, we have completed 467 units of the 701, that is 67%. In the moderate level, we've completed 75 of the 771, that's 10%. Above moderate, we've completed 2,167 of the 1,995, which is 109%. So of the total 4,685 units we are required to complete, we've completed 3,112, which is 66%. Um, so again, staff initially um, are charged from the work plan which is talked about talk to discuss the impacts of waiving impact fees. So you'll see some of that discussion here. But again, uh, we're ready to move and execute the policy decision and the will of this body. And we will offer some additional recommendations at the end of the presentation. Thank you. So Mayor uh, Rogers and members of the council, uh, I'm Alan Alton, the chief financial officer with me is Gabe Osborne, the uh, Director of Planning and Economic Development. Um, that was a good lead up and probably cut through some of my slides, so <laughs> we might be able to move quickly through this, but um, uh, I, I would say that even though this was a, a, a work plan item on, on my work plan, this was a, uh, um, a group effort as, as we move through the analysis uh, Gabe and, and uh, Megan Bassinger um, were instrumental in, in helping with this. And we also have uh, um, directors from Water, uh, TPW, and Rec and Parks here to be able to provide uh, some subject matter expertise to uh, questions uh, that you may have. So, um, as mentioned, we, we, we were looking at this as a, uh, an initial proposal of waiving development impact fees in order to spur uh, affordable housing. Um, and, you know, specifically what would the, the impact be to city operations or city infrastructure? Uh, should they do that or should we do something along those lines? Um, so what we what we have come up with, and this is what you're going to see, is a lot along those lines. 
and um, but we can kind of pivot toward the end. Um, this just provides some some basics, and and Gabe's going to take over in a uh, in a second um, to go through some slides that goes into a little bit more detail into how we study uh, um, these fees, but. You know, basically, development impact fees are charged to new developments to freight a cost of public facilities and improvements related to those developments. Um, it's set by by city code, uh, and the fees that that while there are uh, um, a few of them, uh, the ones that we're really focused on are the capital facility fees and the park development impact fees. But there are water and wastewater demand fees, housing impact fees, and commercial linkage fees. So with that, I'm going to let uh, Gabe kind of walk you through some of uh, the next slides that go into uh, the, the studies that we do for those fees. Thank you, Alan, and good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council. The next few slides will discuss uh, the fees, how they're studied, and really how they're implemented through the development process. Uh, for both CFF and Parks, those are based on a Nexus fee study that was performed. Um, it started in 2015, and it was adopted by council on May 22nd of 2018. Uh, that study focused on a few different things. The main piece of a Nexus study is the Nexus analysis, and that's really the relationship between the fee and the projects. So when growth occurs and new development comes in, that new development does build infrastructure abutting the project or within the project. This really goes to bigger infrastructure projects in the regional area that support the growth. Uh, so they're often off-site, and the fee study looks at the cost of those projects and develops a proportion fair share payment for all the usage types and it could be multifamily single family commercial it looks at all the development categories uh, the fee study also creates a uh, program guidance on the use of the CFF uh, that's really any constraints on the use of the funds it is typically focusing on a project list of defined projects and a nexus fee analysis um, one of the changes that we made in 2018 is oftentimes that project list is based on full build out of a city so it focuses on general plan goals it focuses on master planning or specific plan goals uh, what we shifted to is more of an immediate need project list that focused on a 20-year horizon and that was mostly what was justifying the fee and the developments obviously play into that because that's the population that's increasing with those fees so it didn't really look beyond that that reduced the project cost reduced the fees down um, we also look at a feasibility analysis when implementing the fee so when you add the impact fees with service fees and you look at the total fee package for new development uh, how does that really compete with other jurisdictions and what percentage of that it, or what percentage of that total dollar amount is of the total construction cost so that feasibility analysis looks at that bar and determines where the fee needs to sit so for the CFF funds, uh, those go to capital projects only. That's the restriction under the fee study. Um, these are specific infrastructure or facility types. And the important piece is they go to upgrade or expansion only because they're focusing on growth. It's typically not maintenance of existing facilities. Um, as we can see from the table to the right, uh, there's a specific percentage breakdown for the allocation. 62.8% uh, goes to roadway and in intersection improvements based on the study, 10.7% to transit bicycle and pedestrian, 12.8 to public safety, 12.7 to storm drain, and 1% to the administration of the fee program. Uh, it's also important to note that there is a developer reimbursement component to most of these fees. In the event that a developer goes above and beyond what their requirement is abutting the project and builds off-site improvements, they are eligible for either a fee credit or a reimbursement out of the program, um, and that's included in the code. Um, and then, of course, fee administration, it can be fee studies or managing that program, that's the 1% cost. Uh, so the park fund is very similar. Uh, it goes to park and recreation facilities only. Once again, it's upgrade or expansion. We can um, implement a developer reimbursement component in that. So for example, if a developer builds a public park within the boundaries that benefits the area, uh, they're eligible for reimbursement under the code. Uh, also fee administration. Uh, the parks program is a little different. It's quadrant based. So the fees differ based on the specific quadrant. 
Uh, so over the past few months, there's been quite a bit of conversation about Assembly Bill 602 and how that impacts fee studies. Uh, 602 went into effect really in January 1 of 2022, and it basically states that local agencies conducting an impact fee study must follow the standards listed on the slide. Uh, so the first is you must perform a fee study, and that's the nexus study to create the relationship. Um, the study must identify and justify the level of service, so the project list, and ensure that the, the growth that you're assuming with the new units, that the projects are needed to support that growth. Um, it also states that studies adopted after July 1 of 2022 must calculate housing development fees proportionately to square footage. Uh, it is a re general requirement. Local jurisdictions can justify another methodology uh, if that works. Um, what's happened with a lot of these impact fee programs is over the years, jurisdictions have gone with a unit-based approach. So a multifamily unit would pay the same as a single family, and it really isn't a recognition that it's the people in the unit that justify the need for the projects. So square footage attaching to bedrooms, reducing with size, um, often shows that you can go from a studio with one individual to a four bedroom home, and then in theory, based on that, the four bedroom home should pay more. Uh, so this is really tackling that. Um, it also states that studies should be updated every eight years from the period beginning January 1, 2022. Uh, so that would put us on the clock for 2030 based on that eight-year calculation. Um, but once we do that, then fee studies are on an eight-year update cycle. Uh, time of payment is a critical piece to impact fees. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion sort of regionally in the state of California about deferral of impact fees. Uh, for the longest time, jurisdictions would collect impact fees at the time of building permit issuance. Uh, that's fairly early on in the development stage. Oftentimes, construction loans are still in the mix. And there was a push to defer fees to final occupancy, close of escrow, and getting off of that construction loan in many situations. Um, those were referred to as the fee furls. Um, we've addressed that in previous years through much of our economic development initiatives that we put in place due to the 08-09 recession. Uh, we actually collect most of our impact fees at final, uh, so we're not really deferring. We have just changed the time of payment. Uh, so that holds true for CFF and parks fees for eligible projects. Uh, we also have a further deferral program that allows an affordable housing builder to defer two years from the published payment date. So in this particular case, it would be final, so it's two years beyond final. So much of the, the conversation today will, will circulate around affordable housing. So just a, a reminder of how we handle that from a policy standpoint. Uh, there's really two different types. There are there's affordable housing that's deed restricted, which is really a guarantee that it's that it's rented as an affordable unit for a period of time. And then there's a concept of affordable by design. So inclusionary affordable housing, uh, those are units that are built into the development, and they're typically deed restricted for a 55-year affordability with a 55-year affordability agreement at a certain income level. Um, and our inclusionary ordinance controls what that income level is and the percentage of inclusionary that needs to go into the certain project type. Um, uh, market rate developers can elect to either include affordable units into the design of the project at those levels, or they can pay the housing in lieu fee as another impact fee to offset that. Um, we often hear 100% affordable projects, um, and those have come around quite a bit over the last five years. Uh, generally, how we interpret that is all of the units in the development are deed restricted. It's not a project that's market rate that's meeting its 10% affordability requirement. They're all deed restricted at some affordability level, except the manager's units. So they have on-site management with one or two units. Those are typically free and clear. Um, we tackled this with our recent uh, adoption of our service fees that went to council a, f a month or so ago. Um, and those adjusted the service fees and provided a reduction of those fees for 100% affordable at a 60% or less AMI. And that's really tackling our very low and our low categories. Um, we also have a concept that, that has been around for a few years of affordable by design. Uh, so those are typically smaller units. Um, ADUs often fall under that category because they are smaller, and due to the size, the construction costs reduce associated with that. Uh, they do not have an affordability agreement typically, so there's no restriction on the rent or the sale. Um, and oftentimes they reduce amenities or other features in the unit that reduce construction costs. Um, and at this point, I will hand the presentation back to Mr. Alton to discuss the process. Thank you. So um, this slide basically 
it, it looks at our uh, budget process uh, relative to these fees. Um, uh, and where we come from is uh, uh, on a fee collected basis. So what we'll do is during a fiscal year, we will collect impact fees as they come in. We record those uh, uh, and then calculate what is available uh, at our year end close. This ensures that, that we have the actual revenue on hand, that, that there isn't a, d a deferral that would uh, keep us from getting the cash in to be able to fund these projects. Um, it, it unfortunately does sometimes create a delay in, in the fees coming in to our ability to program them in the CIP budget, but this is the, the safest way to be able to ensure that we have those funds there. Um, the funds are made available to uh, CIP program managers for programming, uh, usually at the beginning of the calendar year as part of our budget uh, 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 preparation. And then we have, uh, the council will adopt the CIP budget uh, during the June budget adoption. So uh, as we look at the type of projects that are um, uh, that are funded through the CFF typically, typically funds uh, uh, roads and intersection, bikes, pedestrian, storm drain, public safety and fire projects. Um, we've listed a few out here as examples of the projects that we've done and, and what uh, uh, the amount of CFF that's been collected um, uh, that goes into that. So. For example, the, um, the bike ped overcrossing, uh, the estimated cost of that project is around uh, $46 million. Uh, we've collected so far about 16.6 million. However, we do uh, have grants that should be able to bring in a, a large amount of that gap coming in uh, um, soon. Uh, we have collected uh, $2.5 million of, of CFF over a three-year period, and that's part of that $16 million that has been programmed into the project. We have the Sonoma Avenue re rehabilitation, uh, about $1.8 million of, of CFF was collected, and this was really the only uh, funding source that went into uh, uh, that project. Uh, we have some fire-related uh, street recovery projects. We use funding uh, uh, about 2.6 million uh, over a two-year basis to uh, um, fund the gap that came between our grant funding that we had uh, for that and what the, the actual cost of the programs were. And then we had some fire station improvements where we uh, have collected uh, over a five-year period, about 3.9 million. For park development fees, again, these are, are used to um, uh, acquire park land and, and develop that. Um, and generally in these cases, uh, the park development impact fees is the, uh, if not the only source, it's definitely a primary source of revenue that comes in. Um, that can't be used for maintenance and they are to be used within the quadrant where they've been collected. So uh, of the examples that I have here, we've got uh, the lower Colgan Creek uh, project that's in the Southwest. Um, that's about $3.9 million uh, uh, collected and we are uh, supplementing funding with grant funding. Uh, we anticipate a three-year planning and construction process, so we're looking at between uh, 2025 and 28 for construction and completion of that. Uh, the Finley, Finley Aquatic Center, which is in the northwest, there were uh, $4 million collected in park development fees, and then $2 million came in from Measure M uh, to complete the funding on that. Uh, um, that one, I believe, is in construction. We have Fremont Park in the Northeast, uh, $3.8 million from park development, um, and that we're looking at uh, between 
construction around uh, 2025. Um, and then uh, Kiwanis Springs Park in the southeast, uh, there was about $5 million in park development uh, impact fees uh, to support um, the housing that was built there back in uh, 2004 uh, to 2006. So it's taken a uh, considerable amount of time to build up the amount of funding uh, necessary. And then even at that, uh, we needed uh, some grant funding to close the, close the gap there. And then we also have a, uh, a separate park project. It's a community garden that, that is going in there. All of this we're targeting for uh, 2026 construction. So uh, the reserves, there's, there's discussion about um, uh, the increase in reserves and could this be used to pay uh, for um, uh, the, at the time it was the waiver of impact fees. So just a, a note on these reserves as opposed to your general fund reserves or enterprise fund reserves. Uh, um, these are special revenue um, funds, so they really don't have the same uh, reserve structure as our other funds. Um, basically, it's what we collect goes toward a project and, the, and they're to be spent on that project. So uh, uh, the way our accounting system works is that we will, we will budget an amount, so you'll see a budget in, in, an, in an area, but until those, those dollars are actually spent and the dollars go out the door, you don't see the cost reflected. Uh, um, uh, so what you have are reserves that build up, right? So as, as we go over time collecting more fees that go to a specific project and are budgeted in that project, they actually, uh, um, we could see the reserves going up even though the budget is going up uh, until we are able to start spending those dollars down and then you should see the reserves uh, uh, go down later. There is no uh, um, uh, reserve percentage need, any of those things. Again, it's dollars in need to go out. So um, the, again, we're, I, this is kind of outdated, so, uh, but we will talk, uh, I'll go through it a little bit. Um, you know, we originally got, the proposal was to look at uh, uh, waiving impact fees on, on certain types of affordable housing projects for a three to five year period. So that was really where our focus was. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we saw the, the, um, uh, the proposal or the policy proposal for the right size impact fees. And, um, you know, with our, uh, 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 timing on staff reports and stuff, we, we're not able to do that as a part of this presentation. Uh, and I, I do think we, we still need a little bit of further time to, to go through it and understand the nuances of, of what the policy proposal is and to look at what the impacts would be to the city's budget. Again, what we're looking at, at least from my standpoint as, as uh, a, a finance person is what, what can the city actually afford? Clearly, it's it's the council's decision to to enact policy to go in whatever direction you'd like to go. Um, I'm here to provide the information on what we can actually afford to do. So, as we went through our staff analysis on this, uh, you know, we the I guess there's one main takeaway is that when you're looking at a uh, a revenue source that comes in and one-time revenues at that, if you, if you take uh, uh, that revenue from those projects, from, uh, from where they're intended, uh, it, it, it cripples your ability to actually construct the project. So there it does have a negative impact on our ability to uh, 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 complete the infrastructure projects uh, 
in, in other ways. So what we would, uh, the, the only way to get around that is to find a, uh, a way to backfill those dollars to come back uh, into, um, into the fund to make those whole to allow the, the infrastructure work to go forward. Um, so that was, that was pretty much where we were coming from with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, the, with the, at least the initial proposal. As part of when we looked at at um, at what fees we had uh, um, recovered over or collected over period, we looked at a at, at a 10-year um, base. So going back to 2012, what this chart shows is uh, the total fees collected over that period, um, and. Uh, uh, so in the shaded column, those are the total development impact fees or park and uh, uh, CFF fees over that period. Uh, in the columns to the right of that, we're showing what was actually collected for a 100% uh, affordable projects and Gabe defined that earlier. Um, it's just a level of, con of context to, of those types of projects and what they are doing to uh, uh, fund projects, especially, uh, um, you know, uh, comparison to the total amounts received. Uh, over the last three years, you can kind of see the ebb and flow of, of the projects, but over the last three years, w uh, we saw that about 41% of the park development fees came from these types of affordable housing projects and 35% uh, of CFF came from the projects. So an, another issue that was brought up was, and what we wanted to look at um, was what the uh, project costs would be for the development and how much we're looking at in terms of the CFF and uh, park fees from there. So what this shows is the last uh, 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 affordable housing projects, and these are the 100% the affordable housing projects within the last 24 months. Um, it shows what the uh, where we knew the cost, what, what the development cost was, what the CFF uh, um, uh, were paid and the park fees paid for those individual projects. And what you have to the bottom is that uh, um, you have about, of those combined, represents about 2.9, so about 3% of the total development costs, which breaks out to about 1.1% for CFF and 1.8% for the park development fees. So with that, I will turn it back over to Gabe and he will help us sum things up. Thank you, Alan. Um, so just in summary, uh, the few bullet points here on the slide, and then I have four solutions here we potentially could discuss that I'll go over. So um, the goal of the council and the housing advocates obviously is to increase housing development. That's been a council goal for some time. Um, we do incentivize affordable housing production and housing development in the general downtown, and actually in a lot of other ways. Uh, that we do prioritize the review of affordable housing development. We too try to address predictability in time. Um, we have actually reduced service fees for affordable development. Um, we have actually reduced impact fees for downtown development when they go up, and we have reduced impact fees for ADUs. So there's certain things here that have already been put in place. Um, reducing or waiving fee revenue can have a dramatic effect on the city's ability to build infrastructure, um, especially when the waiver isn't in a narrow band of projects. Um, so there is also no guarantee that the additional incentives would increase the amount of affordable housing production in, in the city. Um, affordable housing is a complicated form of development. Every dollar does matter, but they rely on a variety of different funding sources. So usually what happens is one form funding source alone isn't necessarily the catalyst. But as I mentioned, all the dollars do matter. 
So with that said, we have a few different options here for moving forward. Uh, so one option is that the city can conduct a new impact fee study consistent with AB 602. That would re-look at the analysis. Um, various reductions could be put in place for various development types. Uh, that would analyze the project list and that would better understand the impact of those reductions and how that program can sustain itself long term. So that, that is an option. Um, it would also bring us in compliance with SB 602. Once that's done after 2022, we're on the eight year cycle and then it would move forward based on that. Um, the other option is, and this is similar to what other jurisdictions have done, is you can basically produce a waiver on any fee type that's impact for any affordability category. So that's fairly open-ended. Obviously, the more that's added to that, the bigger the reduction is on that fee. And also determine a total dollar amount to backfill. Uh, so, for example, if a specific dollar amount was dedicated to fee waivers, we would accept applications up to that dollar amount for eligibility. Once that runs its course, it essentially acts as a pilot program. We can come back to the council and talk about the effectiveness of that program. Uh, the benefit to that is it holds the fee study whole because the projects are still funded through another stream. Um, the easiest way to look at it is essentially that money is granted to the developer to pay the fee. Uh, so that is an option and the total dollar amount is the council's determination. Um, another option uh, is to basically waive the fee without backfilling and that presents a few different challenges uh, because the Nexus fee study basically looks at build out projections. So it's looking at the unit counts, it's developing a hard cost of project list which doesn't really change with time and we have people paying into that program. So when the fee is waived without putting that funding source back in, the delivery of projects becomes inconsistent and potentially there's the ability to remove a project off the list and that creates a challenge with the Nexus fee study. Uh, so there's certain smaller studies that we could do to analyze those impacts once we better understand to see what that would do to projects. Um, but our recommendation would be that if we're not backfilling or there isn't a clear backfilling to at least analyze what that impact would be during the length of that waiver process. Um, the fourth option, um, which I think this is a piece where we already have some things moving in that direction. Um, as our city manager mentioned, our, our arena goals, really the, the challenging categories in the city have, have been really very low and low, um, but we've seen a lot of resources move that way to see those units move forward. Uh, it's really moderate, um, and moderate is workforce housing, moderate is missing middle. Um, that's really as people evolve and increase um, the amount of money that they make, how do they move up in housing, um, in previous cycles, we struggle with hitting 50% of that number. And we usually don't see 100% moderate um, developments go. Moderate can be ADUs, moderate can be the occlusionary. Um, so what we can do is a very targeted approach that looks at our compliance with our arena numbers. And we're going through our missing middle ordinance now. That is actually running as a companion to our general plan. So there's the ability through that process to look at fee waivers, to look at service fee waivers, to look at really aggressive programs from a processing side that help us bolster up that moderate category and really anything that falls in that missing middle. Um, and what we'll see from the, from the low piece is that it really is contingent on a lot of those funding sources come in. And what you saw from the chart is there are years when it doesn't happen and there's years when it happens in big unit totals. Um, and that's usually based on how those funding sources are going into producing that. Um, so. With that being the case, you know, the more um, targeted focus would be a collaborative, we look at the overall program for really bolstering up our arena numbers and making sure we hit that moderate category. And yes, impact fee programs could be part of that, um, but that would tag to our program of missing middle and we would just incorporate that into the review. Uh, so those are really some of the four solutions that we've discussed. Um, at this point, we can turn it back to the council. I know those aren't in writing, so I would be happy to explain those further as the conversation goes. Um, but with that, we're happy to answer any questions the council has. Thank you for that presentation. And yes, probably gonna need to explain that again. Um, so are there any questions from council members, starting with Okrepke? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <clears throat> so if we we're to consider the 602 Nexus study, um, and I know you haven't had time to research some of the proposals that have come in, so I'm kind of asking you to think in the abstract. Um, AB 602 Nexus study versus a right sizing um, ordinance 
uh, or policy. How do those align? Are there redundancies that are there? Are the, does it kind of overlap, or are they completely separate? Um, that's an excellent question. If you do a full-blown AB602 study, that can look at a variety of different things. It can change the methodology associated with the fee calculation. It can look on increases of fees, which I think that's an important point. So, and then it can also incorporate the review of other impact fee totals, or other impact fee categories, excuse me. So uh, that's really more or less the Cadillac program if you want to look at updating a fee, and, and that's really what you have to do is refresh that nexus argument year to year. Um, if you look at a reduction of a fee, you're not really changing the methodology. What you're looking at is how can the city deliver the projects that are embedded in the list and what sort of other funding sources are available for that. So in a right size fee structure, um, the whole concept of single family dwellings being charged out at the current rate, which would have to happen, we can't increase the fee above them what the study shows. Um, the rest of the unit types become a reduction and then it really is just analyzing the reduction. So if if there is a total dollar amount that can backfill the reduction behind that, then you're still holding the nexus argument together. Um, so really the easiest way to describe it is that if you're changing the fee programming, increasing fees, changing methodology, reducing fees, then 602 in that avenue is the best. If you're looking to analyze the financial impacts of reducing certain fees and not increasing, then there's other models to do that where you're using the fee study as a base. Okay, and then, um I know AB 602 is somewhere in our work plan. I don't know exactly where. Um, and in terms of, uh, of where it ranks on our work plan as well as the length of work it would take to undertake this, uh, the, the bandwidth it would take for staff, as well as what the bandwidth for a right size um, uh, proposal would be, are those similar? Are those, would we have to, would we, would we have to shuffle things around? Would it, I'm trying to get. It, I'm trying to find out if there's a redundancy in efforts. If we take on both, if we do one or the other, um, if we could kind of capture a, a middle ground. Yes, absolutely. So just to give you an idea, when we did our nexus fee study in 2018. Once again, it attacked or it addressed um, parks fees plus CFF. Uh, that's typically a consultant-driven exercise, so there was a hard cost of around 350000 just based on the consultant piece to that. Um, it started in 2015. There were starts and stops. It really pulls in a significant amount of staff across the city. Uh, so one department may take lead on managing the consultant through that process, but as you're determining project lists and understanding nexus arguments and the feasibility of developing those projects, it does bring in our transportation public works department, our parks department, any, any division or department that benefits from the fee. So it's usually a huge staffing lift, um, and oftentimes those fees run over a two-year cycle because of that reason. Um, if we're going through a smaller analysis, uh, typically what that would look like if the council determines the specific band of waivers that would be applied, uh, then we would take average numbers of units that occur within those, look at the financial impacts of that to the program, and then do our best internally with other departments to determine where that falls. Uh, so really that's, that's typically an exercise, um, sort of when prioritized, that you're talking about six months instead of two years. Okay, and then just two more quick questions. Um, if we did a right size or a waiver and backfill or waiver without backfill, would, would we still have to comply with AB 602 at some point? Yes. And then um, you said there's already moving pieces with the missing middle policy. Um, is that an AB 602? Are those mutually exclusive or can they be married and work together? Uh, it can work as a companion, so really the missing middle is looking at how we can incentivize that certain band of housing. So that's going to look at a variety of different things, um, but it, it can get into the fees and it can get into this analysis associated with that. Um, and, and that will be, it is a process already moving forward. Um, that's the most effective way to look at it because of that, because it looks at all of the potential pieces that we can address as part of that. Um, so I, I would say it could include this study as part of that. We can look at what that would look like if that's the direction from the council. Councilmember Fleming. Yeah, I'm wondering if some, if you could one, re, read slowly the four options and also if someone could simultaneously make a slide for those of us who are not auditory learners, I need to see it in order to digest it. Can you read those for me? Absolutely. Uh, so the first is to do a full study consistent with AB 602. 
Um, that would be your nexus analysis. And um, in the previous response, that's really the two-year process that has the consultant-driven exercise, compliance with 602. The second option is to basically define a set of waivers for specific housing types under the affordability categories and determine a total dollar amount for a backfill. And then those waivers would be applied until that backfill amount is exhausted. That still holds the project list intact, does not affect the study. Director Osborne, hold on. Can I make certain somebody's making a um, note of that so we can get a slide up on, on the screen? And, and that's the pilot one you were mentioning? Yes, that, that would be run as a pilot program. Thank you. And then the third is to basically provide a waiver without backfilling. And that would require an analysis to determine the impacts on the project list and then the impact fee, or excuse me, the nexus study for the impact fee. Um, so really what that would look like is that if the council determined just to apply a waiver uh, without any cap or any pilot program nature to that, uh, we would have to look um, in really perpetuity for however long that waiver would last, what the, impact fee, uh, what the impacts are to the overall fee program. Can you say just a few more sentences about that? What, what types of impacts you'd be looking for? Yeah, so the impacts would be, and I, I think uh, very similar to what Sacramento did. Um, Sacramento, uh, whether behind the scenes there were different conversations, but they ran a pilot program for a period of time, extended from 2018 to 2022. Uh, they developed all of the fee categories that they wanted to provide the waiver for, which were most of the fees. And then they analyzed that over that year period and then determined what to do on the back end. Um, in that situation, it was looking at a backfill option, um, but essentially it went into it without a defined cap on the dollar amount with the program. It was more of a time cap. Uh, so that didn't provide a set dollar amount to backfill. And the, really the difference is, is when the dollar amount is there, you're allowing the waivers up to that cap, where in the other option, you're really allowing those waivers up to a defined time period or not having a time period. And then it's very difficult to judge the impact to the overall capital project programs associated with that uh, because the revenue stream becomes um, unpredictable and we would have to determine if projects need to be juggled or removed from the list. And that creates some challenges with the Nexus study. I see, but the idea is that, let's say, you build XYZ development, and then after the period of time, you go back and look at what the, the clear impacts were and try to at, assign a, a dollar number to those impacts. Like, let's say a sewer needed to be upgraded or something, and then the city pays for it, what the cost of that was. And so you sort of do the, the a retrospective so really the, uh, the dollar amounts for both the fees and the projects are set with the Nexus study. So the reality is what, when we get into impact fees, the revenue is not predictable for a variety of different reasons because we don't know when development's going to occur year to year and you see those gaps. Uh, so based on how quickly development moves forward and if you created a five-year pilot, you would be able to make estimates on what comes in and the estimates on the revenue, but you really don't know at the end of that five-year period what the total amount's going to be. So as you let that five-year period go, the waivers occur for all those developers at a very set rate so at the end of the five years, you determine the financial impact of those waivers at a set amount based on the Nexus fee study. And then the challenge becomes from a backfilling because it's unknown, the revenue, it could be two million to nine, somewhere in that range. And then you're trying to identify how to backfill that or not. And if the backfill isn't there, then how the projects get delivered and justifying how those projects get delivered becomes challenging because that revenue is lost. What, what, you said it requires an analysis. What requires analysis? The city, state law, council policy, where is the requirement coming from? So the Mitigation Fee Act controls a lot of the nexus studies that are performed okay. um, and the reporting associated with that, so state law. Okay. Maybe we got through three of those. What's the fourth one? 
And the fourth one is really the more targeted approach um, where we can look specifically at where we're missing our arena numbers right now or we think at the end of the cycle it might be a challenge. Uh, so that's the missing middle concept and we can incorporate a targeted fee reduction as part of that study. Um, but as it focuses on RENA, it will focus on very low and moderate, which are those are typically the areas, as our city manager mentioned, where we're seeing the percentages on the lower side. That was really helpful. Thank you very much. Council Mayor Roger, Roger, or pardon me, Mayor Rogers. Um, I just received notice from the interpreters on the line. If staff can slow down, they are working very hard to keep up. If um, speakers can slow down on some of these very complex comments and um, concepts, they would much appreciate it so they can uh, make sure they're doing meaningful translation on the Spanish channel. Thank you. Council Member McDonald. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. I have some clarifying questions and, and just some um, information I'd like to have. So on the CFF impact fees that we get, are those designated by quadrants of where that money needs to be spent on projects? Uh, they are not. Uh, so they're, they are um, allocated based on the percentages that are listed in the chart, um, but that can be allocated citywide. And the quadrants, just so I'm clear on the park impact fees, is that our um, is that our rule or is that something in statute? So when I'm looking at all the projects that need to be done in all the parks in the city of Santa Rosa, do we have to do them by quadrant or can they be moved, can the money be moved? It's defined in code and we have set those quadrants. Pardon me? It's defined in our code and at the local level we have set those quadrants. So we would bring back the policy to address that. So, so I'm just gonna take for instance, we have money in park fees. Um, place to play potentially could end up having a sports complex area, but I'm hearing there's no money for that, but we actually do have money, so we could potentially take money that's in that park development fees and move it to that, because it's our rule that's not allowing it right now, just so I'm clear on how these impact fees work. Yes, and I think there's a few a few ways you can change that. That's getting into the methodology and the nexus. So when you study the impacts in the various areas from parks and where that fee should be generated in the various areas, the local jurisdiction really controls those. So we set policy around that. So it could require an additional study to look at that and then also a code amendment to make that change. Thank you. And then as far as the actual um, upgrading or expansion of the current parks, um, because it says new development or ac acquisition of parks, but if I'm reading the slide correctly, it also said the upgrade or expansion, but not maintenance. Is that our rule or is that in state statute? I think it's Quimbiac, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's state code. It's state code? Yeah. I'd like to see the state code specifically around these impact fees. And the reason being is it says there sometimes is language that allows us to do more work than, um, than we're doing, I think. So is it the state statute or our own codes that are preventing us from moving forward on projects? But as far as expansion or upgrade, if that's the state code or our code, and then also to know um, if it is an upgrade, I'll take for example, um, the tennis courts. Can we use park impact fees for the tennis courts at Howard Park or does that have to come out of a different budget and why maybe, maybe it's important for us to know what's in the reserves for each of these current budgets. Could you, could you give me that, Alan? What's in the park impact fees reserves and then what's in the other budget as well, the CFF budget, just so we have an idea of how much is in reserves. Okay, so I, I don't have those specific reserve numbers for you right now. What I would say, and maybe uh, Deputy Director Santos can come and talk about the specific projects and how those things are funded, but I, I would, again, say that that when you're looking at funds that are in reserves for 
a particular part in, in each uh, park development fee quadrant has its own fund, they, uh, uh, those dollars are encumbered, if you will, into certain projects. So they're not, it's not a pool of dollars, it's just, they're just sort of collected there, but they are all directly tied to a specific project that's being, but that's, we, that's happening. We, we set the quadrants ourselves. It's not something in a state statute that says you have to do it by quadrant, and it's not something that says we couldn't move money to finish one other project. So if you have not enough money to finish projects, I'll use the Hearn Avenue overpass. We didn't have sure. quite enough money to do that project, so we move money from another project to that project so we can complete it. I'm just trying to understand better how these impact fees work. And I, I think uh, we can probably get a more direct answer. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, Council Members. I'm Jen Santos, Deputy Director for Parks. And thank you for your question. Uh, the, the answer is looking at two state uh, laws for that, two state codes. We use the Quimby Act and the Mitigation Fee Act. And so uh, the Quimby Act uh, requires the city to put the money into wherever, you know, whatever zones we want to put it in, however we want to arrange it. The Mitigation Fee Act would allow us to move money for something that is citywide, like a big project, like a big sports complex, tennis <laughs> complex, something like that. And so we can make those decisions as a city body. Okay, so the Quimby Act asks that we do it a certain way, but we actually could make the decision, if it's a decision made by council that we want to do something in one specific area. We could move money around to finish projects. Yes, we certainly could. We do try to keep them in the quadrants that are created to uh, serve those residents in that quadrant. Uh, but the city has in the past moved funds around to assist with projects that are uh, underfunded. And do you by chance have the amount of the reserves that are in just the park impact since that's your budget? Uh, the funds we have allocated going forward that we've received so far are around 25 million. And I'm sorry, how much is fees. it? Around 25 million um, will get you the exact number. We'll follow up with the exact number, but it's approximately 25 million. All of that is allocated already to current projects. Okay. All right, I'm getting through my um, my notes here. So I think the biggest thing is we don't know really what the long-term effects are to any of the budgets based on the conversation today. If we were doing a, any type of right size impact fee, I, I would be interested in knowing what that's going to do to the long-term effects of the budget because I feel like right now we're making decisions without all the data and information, whether that's a new Nexus study um, with the, I, I think it would be number four, kind of a targeted ap approach or something that's along the lines of a pilot. Um, we know that, that we need more affordable housing. We know we are missing middle housing. We know that we need to work on some of these things. I would be interested in having staff work with our partners to see how we can get to almost a net neutral on, on the fees so that we aren't going in the hole that much, but that we can still see um, some support because truthfully local fees are the only thing we can control right now with the high interest rates and the cost of construction. We know that that's the only thing we can actually look at to being able to incentivize and partner you know, with developers and with, with folks that are for housing. Um, as far as looking at um, the long, that's why I'm concerned about the long-term impact though, is we, I feel like we don't have enough information to do that. So that's why a pilot might be um, a smarter way for us to go when we're, when we're looking at the out years. And then I might have another question, but I think that's most of mine. But thank you for the presentation. Thank you for Councilmember Fleming going back over those four different bullets. I appreciate that. And I think that's all my questions, Mayor. Thank you. Vice Mayor Stapp. Thank you, Mayor. All right, I wanna try my hand at some back of the envelope math, um, which, which is always risky. 
So thank you very much for the chart on the impact fees collected from affordable housing. Uh, and so I was trying to just to come up with some rough estimates on the, the current level of impact fees that we're collecting, both in the last three years and then over the 12 years that are listed. Um, and Gabe, am I in the ballpark if I say that over the, an average over the last 12 years for both the PDF and CFF fees is about 420000 a year, something like that? I'm, gonna be, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here right now. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. So I was I was trying to figure out, um, given that the fees you, you have the um, you have the total impact fees collected, and then you've got the percentage that are coming from deed restricted housing projects, and so I was trying to come up with an average over the 12 years that it were listed, as well as uh, what we've been taking in over the last three years, which have seen an, a, um, a good amount of development. And with the calculations I was doing, it looks like an average over the last 12 years, just to give us here on the dais a rough estimate of, of the, the sums that we're talking about, is that it was about it was about 420,000 a year with large variations given the the un uncertain development or uneven development. And then over the last three years, it looked like we were we were um, pulling in about 1.5 million of these. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. I'm hoping, <laughs> again, I know I'm putting you on the spot, um, but I, I, it was helpful for me to have those numbers, or it is helpful for me to have those numbers, as Councilman McDonald was, was indicating, just to give a sense of what we would have to backfill, even if we just eliminated the, the uh, impact fees for deed-restricted housing, for, for very low and low-income housing. That there is a, there's a reasonable budget chunk that we'd have to figure out. Right, and I think that's part of where this is kind of a starting off part, right? I mean, we, uh, um, there, there's a proposal that's out there that warrants study and warrants uh, um, action one way or the other. Uh, what, what I would ask is that we take a look at it from a, from a thorough, thoughtful standpoint of what those budget impacts are. It's, I, I think it's, uh, the fees are, are, and how they're coming in is a little more nuanced than, unfortunately, you know, uh, having a slide that just, you know, kind of shows what we collected. There's, there's a lot of things that go behind those, those numbers that, uh, uh, that we, we need to uh, uh, address in any policy going forward. But uh, I, I think we're ready to do that and and Gabe told you some options that we could do that kind of goes along that path but uh, uh, there there's more study that's going to need to be involved there unfortunately it's uh, um, probably not the best on the on the fly type of deal that's, Sorry. that's fair to say no thank you um, and then director Osborne I, I appreciated your your response to council member Krepke's question regarding the, the difference between the two kinds of studies whether it's a full a full Nexus review um, versus a right size fee survey um, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate what my council, council member or my, my colleagues have said and say that I'm certainly interested in seeing the results of one of those kinds of study um, it's I, I'm in intrigued by the fact that the right sizing study can be done a little bit more quickly um, that that sounds like a big, a big advantage to taking to taking that Avenue um, and then just as a final comment going back to the, to the um, city managers remarks at the beginning I think it's worth underlining again that our city's hit is is currently at 66 percent of rena obligations that's a really we've, we've actually done pretty well with our housing all of us want more and all of us want to use every tool at our disposal to build more but it's worth noting that Santa Rosa really is especially compared to other municipalities across the state doing doing pretty well um, so and that's that's in large part due to the to what our what our planning Department has done over the last several years to, to, to incentivize further development in the community. Thank you. Councilmember Rogers. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I want to reframe a little bit if I can. Uh, so first, Gabe, for some context for folks, we're talking about this proposal to start assessing fees per square foot as opposed to per unit. Uh, if I was to build a mansion, I don't need exact numbers, if I was to build a mansion in Santa Rosa, 
relative to a unit of downtown affordable housing uh, apartment, what's the differential in the fees? So typically it, it depends a bit on the fee. So when, when you look at the impact associated with that scenario, and the assumption is, and it's, it's just how engineering works with management of infrastructure based on the number of bedrooms, there's an anticipated occupancy load in the buildings. So your larger building that has four bedrooms in it uh, would typically have an escalated fee over a smaller unit. Um, the total dollar amounts, I'm sorry, I don't have those today, those exact numbers. Um, but generally, if you think about the overall impact fees, we're talking about CFF and parks, so those are individuals that are putting pressure on the infrastructure. But when you get into the other fee types, like sewer and water, all of a sudden that larger lot has more of a demand from water for irrigation. So you'll see certain fees will escalate differently based on the impact. Um, but truly what the Nexus fee study should look at is when we're talking about bike and pedestrian facilities or road widening is it should be looking at the number of people that are being generated and the increase in population based on that. Um, so we have changed some of our fees to better really align with that concept where smaller units are charged less than larger units and that really is across the board with CFF and sewer and water. So some strides have been made as we evolve the studies to recognize that fact. Um, but what this is a fix of as many agencies in the past would treat those two scenarios the same way. And that's what I remember being the main part of the conversation in 2018, especially as we started to bring equity into our decision making potential, that there was an inequity that existed. And though we fixed some of it, 602 switching to per square foot as opposed to per unit is really trying to push uh, cities in a direction of being more equitable in terms of what type of housing is incentivized through its fee structures, correct? That is correct. Um, and, and just for the record, I want to make sure that we are currently in compliance with 602. Um, that it's just when we go through that study again, that's really what it's looking at. But 602 also has an option that if another methodology can be justified that I think goes along that same concept, then you can use that in the Nexus study as well. Perfect. And then when we, and remind me because I don't remember, but in 2008 when we did the Nexus study, we also had a conversation about the recovery rate of many of these fees uh, because under 218 we can charge up to a certain amount but also had the opportunity to charge less than a certain amount. Did we do a 100% recovery rate? On, we, did, we looked at the, that's the feasibility analysis, which it looks at the reasonable approach of that. Um, we can look quickly. Um, I know the various fees were set at different levels. Um, I don't have the final answer for that, but I can look at that right now, actually. Okay. Um, if you could just even when we come back after public comment and whatnot, I think it'd be helpful for us to see to what level are we uh, incentivizing, I suppose, uh, certain types of housing already throughout our community, and you talked a little bit about that. Right now, uh, the biggest concern that I hear from many developers about projects is, uh, yes, fees, but also the interest rates and access to capital. Can you give us sort of a snapshot on what that, broadly speaking, throughout Sonoma County or throughout the state, what we're seeing in terms of interest rates or ability for construction loans? Uh, with interest rates, has it made it more difficult for folks to be able to build? Yeah, I think what we've seen, there's there's been a, a few factors, and, and really some of this started in response to the Tubbs fire. I think as we saw really construction start going as part of that, um, that actually inflated construction costs, labor, materials went up. Um, we moved from Tubbs fire really into COVID, which created the unpredictability of supply, and a lot of the cost of construction is just much higher than it was 10 years ago. Um, so then really if you look at it, it, it is simple math, especially in a resale market. Market. Obviously, there's the cost of construction and there's the return on the back end, and then there's carrying that project for the longevity of it until that return comes in. So between interest rates coming up, between some funding sources going and coming away, um, it makes it much more unpredictable for developments to occur. And when we see this situation, what we see oftentimes is really a sitting. So projects go to entitled, entitlement, which we're still seeing that. We have a lot of entitled projects, but then the, the time in which it goes from entitled to build 
building permit, which in a very aggressive economic condition where they can build and they can make money goes quick, um, but now there's there's more factors at play. So when one thing doesn't work, then all of a sudden there's the further delay. So we have seen that, and I, I think um, you know obviously the development community is better suited to discuss all the fine points associated with that. But what's been communicating to us between construction costs on the rise, um, between in some situations with the development type, the unpredictability of the rent on the back end, um, the holding costs for that project, the interest rates, all that factors into it. And then we're talking sort of abstractly about where these funds might come from if we were to move forward on a, on a fee reduction. But that only assumes that projects are actually built. So if nothing gets built, if interest rates are too high, if people can't get their financial stack in order, nothing gets built, there's no additional impact. The city really hasn't lost out on anything in regards to fees. That is a correct statement. And I think that's just the unpredictable nature of especially analyzing the revenue stream because development as a whole is unpredictable. I mean, we've saw it in the chart, there are gaps in the production of affordable housing. Uh, so if nothing goes, then there's no impact to really analyze because you did not waive the fee. So that would be a correct statement. Right. And then if we look at, as the council has multiple times talked about, look at housing development as economic development, if nothing goes forward, we didn't risk anything, we didn't lose anything, but we also don't get the benefits from that economic development as well. Uh, that's the way that I look at it at least. So what would be helpful for me in public comment is to hear from folks, uh, particularly folks who are in the industry, if you're saying that this is potentially 1% or I think it was 1.1 or 1.8% depending on the, the fee, how close are we actually talking about to this type of a proposal making the difference between a project being able to move forward or not? Because uh, I think that that's really the big question for many of us from the dais is, are we doing this because it sounds good and it continues to tell people that Santa Rosa is open to housing and there's some merit to that? Or are we also talking about making up for an economic climate or at least making it easier in an economic climate so that we get something when we otherwise might not get anything? I think that's what I'd be interested in hearing from folks. Mayor. Council member for me. I have a question um, piggybacking on what Council member Rogers brought up, which isn't is really kind of a philosophical question about how we incentivize what we all are here for today, I imagine, which is to get housing built. And I, I will be listening um, in public comment. And if there are any public commenters who have the knowledge to speak to this, what I want to talk about is this other tool that the city has, which is the Renewal Enterprise District, where we, we put in $10 million. So if we're looking at a pilot where we put in X amount of dollars and we have all these units that have been built from this partnership with the, the county, this $20 million partnership, um, is this, is the impact fee removal piece going to be the piece that, to Council Member Rogers' point, gets the shovels in the ground and gets the housing built, or would the, our, a better use of our dollars if we were to do a, a pilot be to uh, additionally capitalize this other vehicle that we already have up and running that is last dollars in money. So it, it's, and it is money that gets pulled back if you don't go ahead and build the housing that you said that you're gonna build. So that might be another way to ease the pain and keep things moving um, as we go, as we go along on this path. I understand the Renewal Enterprise District does a certain kind of housing in a certain kind of location, but um, I do wanna understand if we are putting our money to the best use and making sure that, because what I don't want to get is 100% of zero. That's a real concern I have. And so if people can speak to where the greatest pain point is, is the greatest pain point these fees or is it the interest rates and, and the last dollars in, in your capital stacks? Council Member uh, Alvarez. To me. Uh, actually, I was going to piggyback off of Council Member Rogers, but actually, with with the mention of the red district, it it, it furthers my my question, and that is the metrics of this. I mean, uh, with the easy metrics is more houses are being built, but I'm wondering when we do take into account the red district, uh, the renewal, 
how can we actually mitigate that the projects that we're looking at are being built in a timely fashion? What are the consequences for the developers who are waiting for a moderate that suddenly becomes lower and lower becomes moderate? Uh, and, 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 and is there a way for us to put something in writing or in the, in the, in the, in the project should we move forward of having these incentives be removed if it's not complete in a timely fashion as we're uh, contemplating increase of costs? Well, pretty much what metrics do you do you foresee being used? Yeah, and, and that's an excellent question. I think with uh, affordable housing in general, uh, just the, the challenge we really run into is affordable housing projects are presented through entitlement. They're not really required to incorporate that affordable housing through the building permit stage uh, because they can pay the in lieu fee when it's market rate. So some of the items that we've been discussing internally, and we'll come back to the council with this, is how can we ensure that, number one, the development achieves those benefits? Um, if there's a desire of the council to see the development move forward in a timely fashion, to achieve those be those benefits, uh, we really can build that in. Essentially, the way it works with fee waivers is the fee waivers apply to the project up front, but the fee is not collected on the back end, and that's when the units actually finalize. So, is there a check at final occupancy to ensure the fees are paid? So, that is something that could be incorporated in. Um, and discussion about a reasonable time frame to construct is really based on project complexity. There's a lot that goes into it, um, but I think Councilmember Alvarez, what what you're alluding to really is to avoid projects sitting on the shelf for five years when we put all these incentives in place to move it forward and how do we protect against that? That is correct. And the additional question that I have has or pertains to the parks. We're hearing that we have twenty five million dollars in, in 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 projects that have yet to be completed. And in, in summary, page 18, it stated that there's no guarantee that additional incentives would increase the amount of affordable housing production in the city. And I'm also wondering about these projects that we have on, on ICE when it comes to parks. Uh, what additional sources do we have to complete parks should we lose this ability to, to uh, generate revenue? There, there aren't a lot. Uh, grant funding would would probably be one. There may be something that's Measure M or or some other funding source. They're available, or but that that's about it. The the city traditionally does not put a lot of general fund into capital programs. Most of our, if not virtually all of our general fund dollars, goes into operations. Uh, so that's that's the challenge that we ran into doing this analysis is that there are there are just some projects where especially in parks where you're looking at that at the impact fees being the primary source of revenue coming in to complete them you you eliminate that even for a short period then the, to be able to catch that back up you you really can't it can take decades to be able to to get where you need to be and my final question have we seen anything similar a hybrid to this being uh, introduced in anywhere other than in the state of California uh, the, uh, what I mean by this I mean the right the right size fee I have seen um, a, a variety of different combinations of waivers and fee adjustments. Uh, so you know, I think Sacramento, I think more of our regional partners, Petaluma, did something similar. Um, those are more waivers, and I've seen that either in the pilot form or more of the long-term form, where it's waiving specific fees for specific project types. And, and that really differs through that. Uh, in some situations, people all go all the way up to, or jurisdictions go all the way up to 120 AMI, try to capture that, where or some are a little more strategic. Uh, so the combination of things that I've seen to affect the fees are timing of payment, um, and deferrals, which pushes it a little further along in the process, a combination of waivers or reductions for certain incentives. So a reduction would be as you increase the number of units or the density or fee lowers, same as what we've done downtown. Um, but most things fall within that narrow band of options. It's just the combinations differ a bit from what I've seen. 
And I just came up with one additional question. I, our city manager did introduce a, a quite a bit of numbers of where we're at currently with our housing and, and our percentages. And I'm wondering what, what's in the pipeline? What, what, what projects have been submitted but have not yet been, have not yet broken ground that might actually increase the number of potential projects being completed before 2031? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and, and we should be able during public comment to get more information on that. Uh, typically, the RENA tracks the building permit issued. So once the building permit is issued, the number is populated on that chart. So a lot of those numbers are still going through construction to be finalized. So a lot of the active construction you're seeing will result in those numbers. Um, what we're really seeing as far as the development cycle goes, it is typically a 10-year cycle we see of peaks and valleys. Um, so right now, we are seeing projects come through. We still have projects that are pending construction, which basically means that they're in the building permit stage and waiting for that, and I can easily produce those numbers. Um, but that really gives you an idea of what's ready to go. Um, the big jump for projects is going through entitlement to building permit. That's when a significant investment in the construction takes place, so that's usually our indicator that they're moving forward. Um, entitled projects may very well not follow through, and a lot of times do not based on the factors in the economy, um, but more than happy during public comment to pull some stats. Thank you. Looking to make sure you didn't come up with any more questions. Um, so I, I think kind of going back to the basics for me, uh, what are RENA numbers for our, our public? Like how are they made or designed? I feel like we're saying that a lot. And then what are they, why are they important? And what happens if a jurisdiction does not meet their RENA numbers, and has Santa Rosa ever been in that predicament? That's a good question. So the RENA numbers are regional housing need assessment. So HCD looks at what the needs are in a greater area from a housing standpoint. And there's quite the analysis that really goes into that. Um, and then ABAG will take those numbers and form those into specific numbers for each jurisdiction. So they essentially divvy up the more regional numbers to more of a localized need. Um, and often the RENA numbers are very challenging to hit. So in our last RENA cycle, we're in the sixth, and that would be the fifth. Um, we ended up in some scenarios being fairly well, but then in our moderate, we were roughly 50% of our allocated total. Um, and then in one of our low categories, we were slightly less. Uh, so generally what happens, and, and many jurisdictions fall into this bucket, you know, the state of California has modified processes to ensure that units get pushed in jurisdictions where the RENA numbers are less. Um, and SB 35 is really a prime example of that. That allowed projects to go through under a ministerial state, depending on where you are with your RENA numbers. SB 35 either comes in and requires certain affordability levels or it doesn't and it pushes. Um, so typically you'll get that on the back end. Um, but there, I know that oftentimes the RENA numbers are seen as a bare minimum when we're really trying to meet the, the housing requirements, but some of those RENA categories are very challenging to meet and, and require different tactics to meet them. Thank you. I think you left off one part of that question. Um, if cities don't meet the RENA cycle, I believe for this cycle, they are not going to be able to qualify for certain types of funding. Mm. Okay, so that's the consequence. Um, so, let me see. We did talk a little bit about Sacramento. That was um, an area that you said actually had a pilot. Um, and if I recall correctly, you said that ended in 2022. So, did they implement um, a, a policy that was no longer a pilot, or where are they now? Well, what they did is they ran it from 18 to 2022, and then they were revisited it in 2022. Uh, so uh, some of the discussion points there that uh, the total dollar amount, they were roughly had about 3,000 units that went through the program. There was a total dollar amount of all the impact fees of approximately $9 million. Um, they, were, they did that at a time, and I, I think it, it speaks to other concerns that were raised. They did that at a time where a lot of affordable housing was being built. Uh, we had roughly 1,300 units that went through the city of Santa Rosa at the same time in a much smaller jurisdiction. And it was the, very difficult for them to make the finding that it was the one piece that was the catalyst to move that forward. Um, it was one piece of many, um, but they were unable to make that finding. Uh, so what they revisited in, in 2022, they went all the way up to 120 AMI, so that covered all the affordability 
categories. There was a discussion about potentially reducing that. And then there was a discussion about backfilling those dollars to be able to hold the capital projects whole. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, they did not mothball the program and is still alive. Um, and you may or may not know the answer to this question, but was Sacramento already meeting its RENA numbers? Um, unfortunately, I, I don't have an answer to that question. Okay. Um, I have more. Hold on. All right. So uh, the, the current proposal um, that is before us, um, as far as to increase affordable housing production in the city, that one on 14, slide 14, 120% um, AMI and below. What does that really mean for uh, a citizen? What is 120% AMI? Absolutely, that focuses on area median income. So it's really looking at the income level. So as you look at the different affordability categories, moderate is 80 to 120, and then it starts working its way down into the lower categories. So when these units are deed restricted and they're allocated to affordable units, they're affordable to a specific category, and then the individuals occupying that unit have to qualify for that category. So as a builder, um, if this were the policy, I, I can build something that is, goes all the way up to, to moderate. Yes, yeah, so the builder actually can elect to put whatever affordability level they want in a project. Um, our inclusionary housing ordinance requires that they either incorporate a specific percentage um, that, that depending on the type of project, it differs from rentals to for sale. Uh, so if we look at moderate, which is at the 120%, it's really incorporating 10% into the project for that level. Um, but I think it's important to note that most market rate developers actually pay the in lieu fee, um, and then it goes into director passengers programs, and then it gets worked through housing. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that that housing gets built. Uh, there has to be an incentive on the back end really for the builder to do it. The waivers can be that incentive, um, but in some situations the return on the affordable unit in a market rate project is not as high obviously as other market rate units and it doesn't offset. And I think that's often why we see the housing impact fee paid instead of the inclusionary units. So um, I'm just going to throw a few things out for me. Um, if if we waive anything, I want to make sure that the housing actually um, is being built, and I want to make sure that it is affordable um, to RENA numbers that we are not currently meeting. Um, it's very important that we have all housing for all, and so uh, finding a way to get to that is very important. Um, I did read. Uh, somewhere that the the residential single family residential developments to make uh, budget neutral. I just took a snippet out on 14. Um, I worked three jobs to buy my single family home, and I had four children. So just because someone has a single family home does not mean they have a lot of money, because I worked very very hard to buy my home so my children can have generational wealth. And that is a sacrifice of time and kissing on them and putting them to bed and everything so that I can buy my home. So I budget neutral, I get it, but not off the backs of people that work really, really hard to get their housing. Um, and then lastly, uh, we keep talking about a, a backfill. I keep hearing that word, a backfill. Uh, Alan, this is on you. A backfill. W where is this money coming from for a, a backfill? And I heard someone say, well, we can spend our money in other places. And I'm wondering, what money are we talking about? You would need to uh, have your most unrestricted funds to be able to go to backfill that. And your most unrestricted funds is the general fund. In short. So we have we have money in our general fund that is not allocated or that we can spend somewhere else? Well, you would have to take that out of, there's, there's two ways of looking at it. Uh, either you go through a, a project or a program where we take a part of our general fund reserves 
and and use that as the backfill mechanism. Um, the other way to go about it would, and uh, uh, I, I believe where the the right size impact uh, proposal was going was to uh, take it out of your budget in general. Um, uh, really, when you're looking at doing something like that, the way I read it, and and to be perfectly honest, I haven't spoken to the uh, Gen H representatives. I'd love to have a conversation, um, but the way I look at that is you're you're taking out of operational budgets at that point, um, and the the the. The percentage that was used looks like it. They're comparing it to our total city budget, which you wouldn't be able to do. You would have to focus probably on the general fund. You wouldn't be able to go and to uh, use enterprise fund money to offset this. That's you start running into Prop 218 issues. So you're you're looking for the areas where you have the the most discretion at at your disposal, and that unfortunately always falls to the general fund. Okay, and when we're looking at uh, our budget for 24-25, um, where are we at with that? Uh, currently, we are uh, showing a deficit in the general fund of about $5.2 million. And, and how long do we have uh, money for our in response in safe parking? Uh, the ARPA funding will run out uh, in end response. They could probably go through the end of the period of performance, which is December 2026. I believe safe parking will will go. Yeah. 25, 2025. Yeah, uh, and uh, housing right around the same time. So we would be looking. Uh, um, at uh, uh, definitely having those part of the 25-26 budget, the housing uh, in particular, because that was a general fund piece before. Um, I believe we are going to have a discussion at the budget study session about uh, in response and safe parking and essentially where uh, where we go from there. So we can start planning what to do with those programs. All right, and I do not have any other questions, but I wanna look to my council members to see if anyone else has something to say, and I'm gonna ask. Um, through the chair, I do have uh, Sacramento's RENA numbers for the fifth cycle. So they only met 20% of their very low um, numbers, 56% of low income, 66.3% of above moderate, and moderate income, they did meet 182%. So they did not meet their arena numbers. Thank you. They did not meet their arena numbers and they still decided not to do the waiving of the impact fees. There. Oh, so that was when they were waiving the impact fees. Okay, perfect. Council Member McDonald. Thank you. I've been hearing a lot about the long-term economic stimulus that happens when we do um, housing and building. And I'm not sure, I'm not an economist, so I can't give you that information, but is there a way that you could get the information to council? So if we understand if we built a thousand more houses um, with, with different, like middle, missing middle, as well as low income, what does that do to our local economy and what does that backfill in our coffers as far as um, property tax goes and some of those other ways that we make up for it when we create housing. So a lot of the conversations is we don't have workforce housing, we don't have housing for people to come, that's why businesses aren't coming to the downtown area. So when I'm looking at housing right now in, in a kind of a bigger picture, could, is there a way, a way we can get that information as you bring this information back to council? Uh, I believe we can, we can, we can absolutely do our best to, to do a deep dive in there. I can just give you at a very high level. Um, absolutely, 
uh, the increase in housing is going to increase property tax. Uh, you're going to have more people uh, there that are that are buying goods. It is generally a good thing for the economy, and and uh, and so that's that. Those are all positives. Uh, when we get into the deed restricted and and that level of affordable housing. Uh, uh, there is no property tax on those, so they're exempt from that. So now we start l losing a bit. Um, and the other thing that I think we need to keep in mind is that for all the benefits that come from the housing, the revenue, and all that that goes in, there's also a service uh, delivery aspect that goes along with it. So the challenge is having uh, and, and that increase in revenue that comes in versus the, uh, the service delivery costs. So if you uh, um, increase your population by a certain amount and that requires you to add a fire station or to do anything like that, then you're looking at those costs that go in on top of it. And you need to balance the two to get the full picture of, of where you're going economically. And then I think in addition to that, when we look at building specifically affordable housing, how much could we reduce potentially the costs that we are putting out right now for um, the unhoused? And so homelessness issues, that type of impact that we could potentially have on a budget as we grow housing and, and have more affordable housing. And then the last thing, just as a follow-up, because I, I want to make sure, sometimes I'm delayed because I'm reading the actual text, so I apologize to staff when I have to come back with questions. Um, with the $25 million specifically that we allocated in park impact fees, how much is unallocated? So when I'm looking at reserves, I think it's important for council to know how much we're currently allocating in these specific impact fees and then how much we're just not. They're still just sitting in reserves. Um, okay, so I think both of those would be best to, to come back with a kind of a thoughtful response in writing on that, especially uh, the, the um, of course we would wanna see uh, housing affect our homelessness in a uh, or unhoused individuals in a positive way. Um, I think that's part of the the, the goal of that. Um, but we can come back with with an answer specifically there. And um, and uh, uh, let me. Uh, I, I have the reserve numbers for you, but I think let me just because we're sending a lot of stuff to you in writing, I think it would just be easier to give that to you there and to also uh, combine that with the uh, allocated funds uh, for those uh, or for the projects if if that's okay. All right, she did a thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Councilmember Okrecki. Just real quick, um, <clears throat> Director Osborne, can you address what the pro housing designation is from the state, how we received it, and where we rank within the state because of receiving it? Yes, yeah, so the pro housing designation is really a ranking based on all the initiatives that we put in place to support housing. Um, and a lot of jurisdictions in the state did not receive that. Uh, so it is actually fairly difficult to get. And you get, it's based on a scoring system. And through our last ranking, we rank seventh in the state of California. All right, so seeing no additional questions from council members, Madam City Clerk, may you please conduct public comment. Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 4.1. If you are in the council chamber and would like to comment but have not yet provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please state your name for the record if you choose to do so. The first public comment will be from Michael, followed by Peter, then Adrian.
Hi, uh, I guess you met me, Michael Hilber. Um, first of all, I want to mention that uh, with respect to the Roseland Village project, that's been held up for you know over a decade due to litigation, so it's mainly attributable to county incompetence. They've been uh, embroiled in litigation with the uh, owner of the re remaining portion of that parcel, and all they had to do was really to buy the whole thing, and they would have avoided that whole mess. So that that's added, you know, I think a decade plus on to that timeline. Now, with respect to this, um, you know, what they're asking for is um, fee waivers without backfill up to 100% of median income. So you're talking about waiving fees even when people are making above the median income. You know, that's on top of um, all the others, like affordable housing projects, yes, they are typically exempt from pro property tax, and that's huge. That's on top of the federal tax credits and the Section 8 vouchers and the state uh, subsidies. So this is just, you know, another freebie they're looking for to be piled on top of all this. And I'll tell you, I think that, uh, you know, the impact fees, they need to be uniform. Anything else is, you know, just crooked. Like, for example, we pay a monthly sewer fee. That's for maintenance and, you know, treatment of the wastewater. But new development, you know, means the plant may need to be uh, increased in its size. It's capacity and that needs to be paid for by a uniform impact fee anything else is just not fair and the same goes for schools when you build uh, new housing and the schools have to expand they got to get an impact fee to um, cover that thank you the next speaker will be <clears throat> excuse me peter followed by adrian then lauren Peter, Peter Rumble. Okay, uh, can you please state your name for the record? Sure. Hi, Ananda Sweet. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy and Workforce Development for the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber of Commerce. Um, so good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, council members, staff. First, thank you so much for all the work and time that you put into this critical issue. Uh, I'm here to urge you to make meaningful adjustments to impact fees to incentivize affordable and workforce housing. Our housing crisis is the greatest threat to our long-term success as a community. And beyond the moral imperatives to support access to safe shelter, the economic impact of housing scarcity is profound and far-reaching, posing significant challenges to individuals, our community, and the economy alike. It's because of this far-reaching economic impact that this isn't as simple as it may seem. Not as simple as looking at a budget adjustment. It's a choice that we're making to invest today or to pay more for that lack of investment down the road. And we're talking about significant higher costs later, both economically and socially. Housing scarcity and unaffordability exasperate a range of issues that impose heavy financial burdens on individuals, communities, and governments in the long run. Without adequate investment in affordable housing, households are at risk of substandard living conditions or homelessness. Without adequate investment in affordable housing, it is difficult for businesses to attract and retain talent across all skill levels. Addressing the affordable housing crisis is essential for businesses to maintain a competitive edge and to ensure a robust workforce pipeline. Alternatively, making strategic investments now to prioritize housing in a meaningful way can yield substantial savings and benefits for individuals, businesses, and the city in the future. From a direct city budget perspective, access to affordable housing reduces reliance on costly emergency services, leads to increased property values and tax revenues over time as a vibrant and inclusive neighborhoods attract further investment. By investing in affordable housing, the city of Santa Rosa can achieve significant cost savings, foster economic resilience, and create healthier, more equitable communities for residents and businesses alike. Ultimately, incentivizing affordable and workforce housing not only addresses pressing social needs, but also serves as a catalyst for sustainable economic development, fostering resilient communities where individuals and businesses can thrive. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to remind members of the community providing public comment this evening that we do have interpreters on the Spanish channel. So as you're making your public comments, please pace yourselves, take a breath, um, and be mindful that we are trying to have meaningful uh, interpretation on the Spanish channel for those participating via Zoom in Spanish. Thank you.
The next public comment will be from Adrian, followed by Lauren, then Nick. Good, af good afternoon, council members. My name is Adrian Covert, local lead for Santa Rosa Yimby and West Side resident. Um, as President Biden is fond of saying, don't tell me your values. Show me your budget and I'll tell you your values. Now this city, Santa Rosa, has repeatedly told its residents that it values housing at the very top of its priority. Now this is a great opportunity to show that we value housing by reducing our development impact fees. So the Gen H proposal to right size development impact fees would reduce fees on multifamily housing and rationally scale that by affordability and square footage. These are exactly the type of units that Santa Rosa needs to not only meet the minimum requirement for RENA, and those RENA numbers are just minimum requirements, but this is an opportunity. This is essential for us to meet our, to build a vibrant, uh, affordable, and low carbon city for the future, for ourselves, and for our kids to stay in Santa Rosa if they wish to as they grow older. Now, these costs, there's going to be some costs to this, and we've heard about some of that today, but these costs must be weighed against the cost of inaction. For example, the cost of having one of the highest rates of homelessness on a per capita basis than any other city in the United States. The cost of our working class having to commute ever farther distances. Study in Santa Clara County found that over half of their homelessness expenditures were just from dealing with the symptoms of unsheltered homelessness because they didn't have the infrastructure. So you're either going to pay for the housing or you're going to pay to not have the housing. So where is that in the Nexus study? It's not. So when you're taking this into consideration, um, I please, uh, please take into consideration the cost of inaction and the opportunities to build housing adequate for the demand and for our future. Thank you. The next speaker will be Lauren, followed by Nick, then Chris. My name is Lauren Fury. I live here in Santa Rosa and I work for an affordable housing developer, Midpen Housing, who has an office here in Santa Rosa and two projects currently under construction in Santa Rosa and several throughout Sonoma County. Um, I want to extend the invitation for any council members who are really interested in this economic question of what the current environment li is like for construction uh, to dialogue on that more. I have a lot of numbers and details that I can throw at you. Um, but to briefly summarize, rates have really increased and are having a profound impact on the cost of construction. So envision um, an imaginary community of 50 new homes, including studios, ones, twos, and three bedrooms that would cost $40 million to build. Two years ago, in that rate environment, um, construction interest rates were as low as 2%, and they're now closer to 7%. And then permanent debt is more like 6 or 7% compared to 4% a few years ago. So what does that mean in actual numbers? Uh, you're talking about an additional million dollars spent on construction loan interest for a two-year construction project. And then you're reducing the amount of mortgage that that property can afford by another million dollars. So that project now, just based on interest rates, rates costs $2 million more to build. So when your staff says every dollar counts, they are accurate. They are completely accurate in that statement. Every single dollar counts. Impact fees are something that developers are borrowing either via the construction loan or the permanent loan to pay back. And those impact fees can be between 300,000 and a million dollars on something like a $40 million project. So I really um, encourage the council to act, keep asking those questions and Again, to echo Adrian's comments, to think about the costs that are much harder to quantify than these impact fees that um, our community pays when we don't have affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Nick, followed by Chris, then Ben. Thank you, members. My name is Nicholas Burtzel, speaking on behalf of Providence uh, and representing our 44,000 caregivers over 17 ministries across the state of California. Uh, Providence is committed to supporting the poor and especially vulnerable. That includes affordable housing. 
We contributed in 2022 over $700 million to these programs. Specifically for this area, between 2020 and 2023, we contributed $7.5 million to affordable and supportive housing projects. That includes the Caritas Homes Project at $2.2 million, the Caritas Center at $2 million, and a Rohnert Park affordable housing development at $1.3 million. Specifically for that development, we've run into these same issues being mentioned uh, at this meeting, although not in the city of Santa, Santa, um, Santa Rosa, uh, but we have run into cost issues that have made us doing that project alone unsustainable and are searching for a partner. Um, being without a stable home is detrimental to your health. We cannot treat individuals if they don't have somewhere safe and stable to go to, they don't have access to meds, and they can't come back for the regular care they need uh, to sustain a healthy lifestyle. According to the American Hospital Association, housing instability increases health risks for children, specifically with asthma and long-term depression issues. Uh, I heard some questions about the cost of providing care, especially those of homeless. I want to put into perspective, according to the American Hospital Association, 33% of all emergency department visits are from unhoused individuals. It's an incredible strain on our system, and we don't just simply release them into the wild. We need to make sure and ensure they have a safe place to go. Uh, of those 33% of ED visits, 80% of those visits are from preventable conditions. So again, an incredible strain on the cost. And adding to that burden, 51% of those individuals need to come back to the hospital for uh, uh, continuing treatment. Um, additionally, just to the health care costs, it is incredibly difficult to recruit care providers, even with their uh, excellent benefits and pay in the area, and uh, as to the burden of trying to maintain access to care. Uh, it's for these reasons that we see this proposal as an investment in the community and an overall benefit to the community, and we appreciate your uh, um, Thank you. The next public comment will be from Chris, followed by Ben, then Albert. Thanks. Uh, I'm Chris Gunther. I'm a part of Bikeable Santa Rosa and a resident of the Montgomery Village area. I just want to take a very quick minute. We're sort of in allyship with um, Gen H, UMB, and a number of other groups in the room, and so want to endorse the call for you know all measures to accelerate housing development in the city. And in particular, I want to emphasize the, the value of taking a systemic perspective. I really appreciate a lot of the questions from the council members that were doing that, and I think we should continue doing that. And I would just add that, you know, from a transportation perspective, that nexus between denser housing and, you know, impacts on infrastructure costs and transportation, we can save money in the long run by getting this right and getting housing developed in the right places, which lowers that impact and makes this more affordable, more beneficial over the long run. Thanks. Thank you. The next speaker will be Ben, followed by Albert, then Mike. Ben Wickham. I, I believe he's left. Uh, he was here earlier, but I believe he's left. Okay, thank you. I'll circle back uh, towards the end of public comment. Albert? Yes, uh, good, evening, good afternoon, Mayor Rogers. Members of the council, my name is Al Irma. I work at the Mitote Food Park over in Roseland, but I'm here today representing the Sonoma County Hospitality Association. We represent lodging, food and beverage, retail, wineries, outdoor recreation destinations, and a whole lot more. Employee-wise, we probably represent 30,000 plus employees in Sonoma County. And as an economic development matter, housing, the availability and affordability of housing for our workforce for that sector is Number one, job one, we really, we really need housing. We've been struggling, particularly during the pandemic. And so uh, we are here to support uh, either the emergency ordinance or a pilot project that would eliminate the impact uh, fees for particularly for affordable housing. Uh, from a public health standpoint, I think the pandemic revealed that there's huge disparities in housing here in Sonoma County. If you look over in Roseland, the, the uh, COVID uh, uh, incidents of COVID and Rosen were astronomical and in, uh, in large part because of the overcrowding of housing or lack of housing there in that community. So uh, if you go to any restaurant in Sonoma County and see who's working there, it's largely Latinos. If you go to the lodging establishments and see who's turning down the beds and cleaning the rooms, largely Latinos. If you go to the wineries in Sonoma County, guess who's working there? And so it's really a disproportionate impact on that community in particular, but it's impacting our entire workforce in Sonoma County. So if we want to continue to support economic vitality and economic development in Sonoma County, we encourage you to act now and move to uh, suspend the impact fee waivers for the next several years to support the Generation H housing proposal. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next speaker will be Mike, followed by Deborah, then Lauren. And Deborah and Lauren, if you can make your way to the opposite podium then as Mike, it'll keep the flow of the meeting going. Mike, is that you? Oh, all right, we'll move on. Uh, Deborah? All right, Lauren, thank you. Lauren Brigaman, uh, president and owner of Phoenix Development Company. We built um, three major housing projects now in the city of Santa Rosa, and um, I'm going to just speak off my experience. Um, we've typically seen uh, 20 to 25,000 per unit in impact fees on each of these projects. On top of that, we've spent between 20 and 25,000 per unit in infrastructure repair, street repair, curb replacement, sidewalk replacement. In some instances, we had to replace the entire water main up and down a block because, you know, which I get, this is infrastructure repair, but on top of that, we paid impact fees. We paid CFF. Um, when you take that forty-five to fifty thousand dollars per unit, and uh, it comes out to about three hundred dollars per unit per month to offset that uh, cost, you're looking at um, about twenty-five percent of the average affordable rent that we get off our affordable projects. So when you put that in perspective, you can see where the problem is. Uh, my second point is, you know, all our projects, all our affordable projects and our market rate projects all have green features, all have park features, all have play lots, all have play structures, yet we have to pay for that and then we pay for a park for somebody else. Uh, CFF, again, we do the infrastructure repair, but on top of that, we pay for infrastructure repair somewhere else in the city. In regard to Councilman Rogers' request, currently, uh, Midpen is borrowing better than I can, but it's 450 to 550 bips over SOFR, so rates are about 10 to 11 percent. Return on investment, 8 percent, two, three years ago, now is about 18 to 22 percent required. Thank you for. Thank you. The next speaker will be <clears throat> uh, Deborah, then Abby, then Kathleen. Deborah? Okay, we'll move on. Abby? Thank you, Abby. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm going to put this down for a sec so you can see me. You got Thanks. it. Thanks. Hi, my name is Abby Arnold, and I am a resident of the Montgomery Village area. Um, I'm here today to support the proposal to uh, right size the impact fee. We need more affordable multifamily housing that will add to the housing available for everyone. We need housing at all income levels to allow the law of supply and demand to bring down or at least stabilize the cost of housing in the family budget. That means uh, people who are working in our schools and in City Hall and in our parks, they all have trouble finding a place to live that they can afford here and many of them are commuting from very long distances. Y there are some things that you don't have control over, like the, the um, interest rates for construction loans, but there are some things that you can do something about that relate to the high cost of new housing. And this proposal, the uh, right size fee proposal, is something that you can do. We understand the cost of materials and of course we want the workers who are doing the construction to be paid fairly, but fees are part of the problem along with the length of time that it takes to get local approval and those are things that you have control over. Reform of the development fee can make a big difference in how long it takes to get housing built. I encourage you to adopt the right size impact fee proposed by Gen H and help make Santa Rosa a city where our workforce can find a place to live. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next, next speaker will be Kathleen, followed by Abby T, and then Jenny K. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Stapp, Capital, Council members and staff. My name is Kathleen Natividad. I'm a program manager at First Five Sonoma County. I'm also a resident in Santa Rosa. I'm here to voice support for affordable housing and emphasize the urgency of the housing crisis in the city. Through our community partnership with Generation Housing, we have been assessing the housing climate in the city and county and learning how children and families can be uplifted through the affordable housing policies, especially our families most impacted by structural and systemic racism. As most of us know accessibility to affordable and stable housing is a huge precursor to positive health and development for families with young children. Research has repeatedly shown that disruptions in housing, frequent moves, housing insecurity, and being unhoused are, per are profound barriers to optimal early brain development and school readiness and learning. <clears throat> Not only do we have a housing crisis, but we continue to see in First Five's annual assessment that nearly a quarter of our community's five-year-olds who, due to disruptions in development, such as housing instability, lack the necessary readiness to succeed when they start kinder kindergarten, which we know is a um, huge impact on their future. Now is the time to make policy changes to disrupt the harmful patterns that are affecting future generations in the city and to ensure success and achievement for our youngest citizens. So I urge the council to support the adoption of Generation Housing's right size impact fee policy. By doing so, we will be on a path to enhance health and education outcomes and strengthen family, um, families with access to affordable housing. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you. The next speaker is Abby, followed by Jenny, then Josh, and then Stephanie. Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Staff, Council Members, and City Managers and Staff. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Staff, Council Members, City Managers, Smith and staff. My name's Abby. I'm the operations manager at Generation Housing and an SSU graduate who wants to stay and work here in Sonoma County and one day be able to achieve the American dream of buying a home. Last year, Generation Housing released a report called Making the Rent, and we asked families what they would do if they didn't pay so much for rent. And here are a few of the many responses we received. I would be able to afford dental care. I would be able to afford childcare and healthy food. I would be able to afford a healthier diet, open up a savings account, and save for retirement. I would be, I would be able to invest in more health care. I would be able to provide my kids with the things they need. I wouldn't be so stressed out, and I could financially have money to spend on bills and on my kids. Mayor Rogers, Council Members, Council, um, City Manager Smith and staff, these are our neighbors, our friends, our family members, our colleagues asking for the basic needs and you can make a difference. Thank you for your time and your leadership. Thank you, the next speaker is Jenny, followed by Joshua, then Stephanie and Sonia. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members, Madam City Manager, Jen Close, Executive Director of Generation Housing. Um, I graduated from Montgomery. I spent my allowance money at the last record store, and I grew up thinking all ice rinks were Swiss chalets. I am a Santa Rosa kid, and uh, this is my hometown, so I care a lot about it. Um, four years ago, I took this job because I knew that housing was the linchpin to our community's recovery, resilience, and a more equitable, sustainable, and prosperous future. Um, and this was a collective community opinion, so I believed everyone was ready and willing to put skin in the game to tackle this priority. And I believed that the same bold leadership and can-do spirit we saw in our fire response and recovery existed, efforts still existed. But four years later, I will tell you that my belief is waning. Um, I see paralysis through analysis, a whole lot more time spent explaining why we can't do than time spent strategizing on how we can do. Less urgency around actually doing equity instead of just talking about it resistance to trying new things, and less focus on investing in the future. So I ask you today, please, make me a believer again. Make me a believer again by walking your pro-housing talk through your budget walk, by prioritizing the 92,000 Santa Rosans paying too much for rent, 
the more than 5,000 Santa Rosans sitting, uh, the more than 5,000 people sitting on affordable housing waiting lists, nearly 3,000 living without shelter, and one in four kids living in uh, overcrowded homes. Make me a believer again today by directing your capable staff to go back to the drawing board and draft up a few options on how to dedicate 1.5% of the budget a year for the next eight years to catalyzing housing through impact fee reform by adopting our right size program. I thank you in advance for your leadership. Thank you. The next speaker will be Joshua, followed by Stephanie, Sonia, and Omar. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, uh, City Manager Smith, Council and staff. My name is Josh Shipper. I'm the Director of Special Initiatives at Generation Housing. Um, the Council has raised a lot of questions, on, especially on Sacramento, and we can try to answer a few of those. We've been working with Sacramento uh, staff for about four months. And just to, just to clarify a few things, um, they have built about 3,000 affordable units within the last uh, four years after waiving fees. Um, this was compared to just a few hundred in the past seven. So we count that about a nine-fold annual increase. Um, and we'd be very excited to see what, what Santa Rosa can do similarly. Um, the waiver worked out to about only $3,000 per unit, which is an extremely efficient investment in gap funding for housing. Units were evenly split between low income and very low income, which is exactly what they were trying to do to meet the arena. And last but not least, this surge happened when market rate units were holding pretty steady, and they expressed to us that they attributed this to the fee program. To questions of whether Santa Rosa can do this, uh, it has $60 million in impact fee reserves. We, we can answer that, uh, including $25 million, as you heard, for parks, uh, parks and 15 in capital. Petaluma in implemented a similar program to Sacramento in 2022, uh, covering infrastructure from other revenue. The city of Sonoma has a square footage uh, program already in place, accomplishing much of what AB 602 and our right size program does. Our right size program accomplishes much, much of what Sacramento is already doing, and it's costing less and will apply to more than just uh, uh, deed restricted affordable units, but also deed restricted moderate. Um, a significant portion of the current surplus of fees has been collected off of this recent burst of new housing that you've heard all about, built during a time of one-time rebuild funds, but these funds are, are now spent. So our question for you is what happens when that housing pipeline slows down? Uh, we do not think this is a zero-sum choice between housing and infrastructure, and we urge you to view this right-size program as a renewed one-time injection of funding for housing to keep that pipeline full. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Stephanie, followed by Sonia, Omar, and then Maz. Good evening, council members and staff. My name is Stephanie Picard Bowen, Deputy Director at Generation Housing. I was born and raised in Santa Rosa. I'm raising my family here, and I hope to buy a home here in the next year. I don't know if that's going to happen. The Regional Housing Needs Allocation, RENA, is the absolute minimum that the state requires, but it is nowhere near our actual need. Given that building housing now is more expensive than ever thanks to the economic climate, it's clear the city must take action if we want to avoid falling further into a housing deficit. The good news is that you, City Council of Santa Rosa, have tremendous power to enact, enact local policy change to address this. Our right size program is the first and most crucial step that Santa Rosa can take right now to actively fight against housing unaffordability. It reduces the cost to build housing in Santa Rosa by targeting fees. It benefits the most deeply affordable units the most, targeting the residents and workers who need the most support. The city of Santa Rosa additionally did pay for an in-depth economic analysis on, housing, on the housing impact of the economy and it was completed in September, and we are confused why it has not been presented to the full council yet. Housing is at the top of Santa Rosa's priorities and has been for the past several years. A top priority deserves a budget that prioritizes our top priority. We stand at the ready to partner with you in addressing our community's housing needs, and thank you in advance for your leadership on housing. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Sonia, then Omar, Maz, and Jamie. Staff, my name is Sonia Big Barwick, and I'm a lifelong resident of Sonoma County, co-owner of Paradise Ridge Winery, and currently serving as a civic engagement manager at Generation Housing. I joined the team at Gen H because I see the fabric of our community unraveling due to the high cost of housing in Sonoma County. 
I understand that adjusting impact fees has a cost, but there is a much higher cost to waiting. I could talk to you about how as a mother, I don't think my children are gonna be able to live here. I could also talk about my employees moving away. But what I ask you guys to do is you receive 20 plus letters from high schoolers in Santa Rosa. I ask that you read those letters and really hear what those voices are saying. Those, are, those children are our future. Um, it is important that we consider the cost to our community when there's no affordable housing available. Our young families and our workforce will move away. Homelessness will continue to rise and schools will continue to close. Commuting times will get longer and businesses may be forced to close due to the high cost of living. Local companies like Manzana and La Tortilla Factory being two recent examples. It is critical that we invest in housing solutions across every level of affordability and offer options for families at all stages of their lives. The ARENA goals include a requirement for production of housing at all levels, but there are no subsidies for market rate options. It is this type of housing that employers say is needed the most for recruitment and retention, including teachers, nurses, and government workers. Yet amidst these challenges lies an opportunity for bold leadership. I ask you to seize this moment to stand as champions of change and to advocate for the measures we need to bring affordable housing to Santa Rosa. The time for action is now. Please vote in favor of progress, and in doing so, you will lay the foundation for a more equitable and sustainable future for all residents in, of Sonoma County. Thank you. The next speaker will be Omar, followed by Maz, Jamie, and then Ariel. Good evening, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Staff, Council Members, and Staff. My name is Omar, I'm the Program Associate at Generation Housing, and I've been a resident of Santa Rosa for over a decade, specifically the Roseland area. I'm here to address the severe impact of our housing crisis on children and young adults. We know that housing instability harms children's health, development, and school performance. Infants in unstable housing are more prone to health issues like asthma. Moreover, unstable housing increases a child's ACE score, affecting the neurodevelopment outcomes. This instability disrupts children's security, education, and well-being, often forcing parents into multiple jobs, reducing family times, and contributing to overcrowded living situations, especially evident during the COVID-19 lockdowns. For young adults like myself, the crisis bars access to independence, forcing many to delay or abandon higher education and career aspirations. The challenge to secure affordable housing pushes our young adults out, severing community ties and undermining our local economy. The struggle for stable, affordable living space restricts our ability to contribute meaningfully to the economy and community. Housing stands as the most pressing issue facing our families and youth today. Many of you have talked at length about concerns for our youth and their future, but if our housing policies continue to hurt and push them out, we must question what is our future. Today you received 38 letters from students in Santa Rosa, which I greatly encourage everybody to read. They are begging you to take actual action. How are you going to respond to them? We cannot afford to wait for change while thousands need affordable homes. Now, immediate actions such as adopting Generation Housing's right size fee program can significantly alleviate the pressures by incentivizing affordable housing development. We thank you in advance for your leadership in creating a city where everyone can afford a safe, stable home. Thank you. The next speaker is Maz, followed by Jamie, Ariel, and then Cassidy. Hello. Good afternoon, council members and staff. My name is Max Zhang. I'm, I am the research manager at Generation Housing. Uh, over the past, it uh, feels like two hours or so, we spend a lot of time here wondering and speculating about things we don't know or things we're unsure about. And I would like to remind everyone here that uh, as per the comments from my colleague, my colleague Josh, there are actually things we, uh, we are quite sure about, such as how much this policy will cost, how effective this policy will be. And while I, as a researcher, understand that we need good information before we can make good decisions, I cannot help but wonder how much time we are giving up to think and wonder and speculate and contemplate about what we don't know. I want the council to remember the things that we do know. Um, we know that housing here in Sonoma County is more unaffordable than ever before. 
We know that starting in November, billions of dollars of money for affordable housing will rush into the Bay Area, and Sonoma County and Santa Rosa will have to compete with other jurisdictions, and that those home builders who can build those houses for us will only be focusing on the jurisdictions where it is cheapest and easiest to build, as they always have. Uh, and we know that you, the elected representatives of Santa Rosa and the staff that tirelessly support them, you have the power to make this community an attractive place to build housing, to build a housing that is affordable and that is necessary. If Santa Rosa wants to spend time wondering about what it doesn't know, I propose you wonder about this. If we don't build housing, how many more longtime Sonoma County residents will leave? How many downtown business will, businesses will close? How many residents will become evicted or homeless? How many schools will close? How many families will be forced to double up in their homes? How many residents will skip meals and health care and time with their loved ones? If you want to wonder about something we don't know, let it be this. How much can a community suffer when its residents can no longer afford to live there. I hope we never learn the answer. Thank you in advance for your leadership. Thank you. The next speaker will be Jamie, followed by Ariel, Cassidy, and Olivia's mom. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor staff, council members, and staff. I'm Jamie, a lifelong Santa Rosa resident. I'm here to urge you to support the generation housing policy. As things stand today, I can't afford to own a home or even to move out, out of my parents' house. I love this city. I'm proud to be from Santa Rosa. But if housing keeps being like this, being out of reach for young people like me, I just might have to leave. We need housing policies that help us stay and build a life. Let's make sure that Santa Rosa is a place that we, where everyone can live. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Ariel, followed by Cassidy, Olivia's mom, and Keith. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, and City Staff. My name is Ariel Bussey. I am the new Youth Outreach Advocate uh, with Generation Housing. I'm here to talk to you about why now is a time for affordable housing. Housing is a basic human right and is a basic human need, yet so many people are living with unstable or no housing due to the rising costs. As well as working with Gen H, I also work at the Santa Rosa Junior College and the sheer number of students that I've had to help that do not have housing is astronomical. I just spoke to a young woman today who can no longer go to school anymore because she does not have housing. They are about to be unhoused. I spoke to another student as well who informed me that one parent is working two jobs seven days a week, the other working five days a week. Their income is 84,000 a year. The median cost of a house in Santa Rosa is almost 600,000. I know when my parents bought a house out here, it was 194,000. That house is almost $800,000 now. I cannot afford to move out of my parents' house as much as I would love to have my own place. We cannot afford to not support the efforts that Generation H is aiming for. If you look at the high cost of not providing affordable housing, it will end up costing the town and community members more. You will see businesses closing, as has been mentioned. You will see residents leaving. So I thank you for your time. And once again, I really hope you all can join in support of this proposed policy from Generation Housing. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Cassidy, followed by Olivia, then Keith. Madam City Clerk, pardon the disruption. Can we make sure that you are very close to the microphone so we can make sure to hear you down here? Hi, my name is Cassidy. I attend school here in Santa Rosa. I'm someone that feels that renting and especially home ownership is out of reach. 34,000 households or 18% of households in Sonoma County are paying more than 50% of their income on rent. And I was told growing up that your housing expenses should never be more than a third of your income. Living with a parent is currently my only option, but I'm lucky to have a family that is both willing to support me as an adult and is a healthy home to live in, which is not a reality for everyone. The high cost of living makes moving out an impossible task and de definitely a financial decision most would advise against. Petaluma found a way to support affordable housing by strategically reducing fees and serves as a successful model to consider. In conclusion, I support Generation Housing's proposed policy to address housing affordability. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Olivia, followed by Keith, then Adina. Olivia, Keith.
Mayor Rogers, council members. My name is Keith Christofferson. Um, I've built many homes in Sonoma County, uh, somewhere over 5,000 of them. <clears throat> and I can't say much here that can, uh, right now, that can offer, offer some relief here. But I will tell you that back in about 2014, we had, uh, I think that the Chamber of Commerce was involved in, in putting, this, putting this program together with, with uh, city staff. Uh, the only person I see here right now who was involved in that is, is, is Gabe. And we had, uh, we had meetings monthly with an agenda, and we talked about housing issues. And it was attended by everybody on the management side of the, of the, uh, of the planning staff, the engineering, uh, building, and there were builders that were, that were involved in, uh, in those discussions. Most of those builders are gone now. But nonetheless, we were on the threshold of really making some breakthroughs. I mean, important big dollar breakthroughs when the fires hit in 2017. And when that happened, all the, of course, those of you who were here, the, uh, the attention shifted to, uh, shifted to the fires. But even at that, we had, uh, we had meetings monthly at the, uh, at the Builders Exchange with staff, and we worked through issues to get these houses out of, out of the city, get them started, and get them built. And we were, the job was to knock down barriers. And uh, I have so much to say, but I don't have the time to do it today. Uh, but I would like to ask that, that you consider starting a group like we had back in uh, several, several years ago. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Olivia, followed by Adina, then Anna, and Susan. Olivia? Okay, Adina? I am the former executive assistant to the Santa Rosa City Schools Board, and I was forced out for questioning nonprofits tied to the school board. The board president at the time was Ms. Jenny Close, executive director of Generation Housing. I've seen many conflicts of interest. For example, Ms. Allie Gaylord ser serves on the board for Generation Housing, and she was the, in charge of housing for the entire North Bay for Mid Penn which is uh, on the proposal to remove the development fees. That's a conflict of interest. Mr. Peter, Peter Rumble, who spoke on behalf of the Metro Chamber, also a Generation Housing Board member. Mr. Michael Allen, the chair to Sonoma County Conservation Action. Mr. Chris Rogers, our council member, uh, his nonprofit where he's executive director. So there's a lot of middlemaning that goes on and it doesn't benefit the taxpayers whatsoever. I asked why Generation Housing was approved as a project of the Tide Center, being that Ms. Jenny Close had $85,000 in outstanding tax liens at the time. I was actually threatened by the federal government for asking this. I wanted to see those financials, which should be public record. The Tide Center is located in the Presidio, which is apparently federal land. So I was threatened by the National Parks Police under the Department of the Interior, who ironically funds the Tide Center. There's no record of where the funding for these projects are going. You want to bring in low-income housing, the Press Democrat has me labeled as the domestic terrorists of the county because I'm an activist who can read as a brown person. So now you're going to bring more people from Vallejo, where I just came from? You can't even deal with me, so how are you going to deal with more people of color when racism was labeled as a public health crisis? And if you're not somebody who is a token willing to go along with the agendas of white liberals, you will be exiled from this county like I was. So equity is a word that you use to push your agendas by indoctrinating communities of color. Thank you. Vote Michael Gray. Thank you. The next speaker will be Anna, followed by Susan. Hi, my name is Anna Diaz and I am from Roseland. What proof is that this will work? I am a loan signing agent and I am seeing a nonstop pattern of us housing people from the Bay Area who are moving to Sonoma County at a market price rather than helping locals who rent rooms, garages and trailers. Our local residents are being forced out of the area due to be these raised housing fees. 
It didn't work in Sacramento as stated today, so please help me understand how it will work in Santa Rosa. I have concerns about, utili uh, about Generation H to influence any decision making on behalf of the City of Santa Rosa residents. Their advocacy typically appears to be benefiting their friends and family serving on Generation H board rather than the community. For example, Ali Gaylord serves on the Generation um, Board. Casa de Tierras Roseland was endorsed by Generation H. Mid Pen Housing will be completing the development. Ms. Ali Gaylord, secretary to the Gen H Board, was the direct the director of the housing development. North Bay at the time of this project was approved. Mid Pen was included as the developer within Gen H letter requesting to waive development fees. Business deals are being work through Generation H to financially benefit the developers and their inner circles, which is negatively impacting the community at large. I am requesting for the city to decline Gen H pr uh, proposal to waive impact fees and that these new housing developments are negatively impacting the people of Roseland. There needs to be more outreach and surveys provided to the community members so they are informed, not just one-sided, that will benefit today's vote. Thank you. My, I yield my time. Thank you. The next speaker will be Susan. Hi, Susan Lamont, District 2. I didn't come here to comment on this today, but there's a huge elephant in the room that no one mentioned. The giant pillaging of every part of our economy by the wealthy and the impoverishing of local governments. There is no such thing as a law of supply and demand. That is a fiction. It is the law of greed. When the cost of something doesn't come up, for instance, that house that was under $200,000 that's now $800,000, there's only, only greed. If you just say, oh, well, I can take advantage of the fact that there's not enough of this. I'll just raise the price. It's offensive. So. Once upon a time, there was almost no homelessness. And why was that? Government built housing. And how did government pay for that? The rich were taxed at 90%. And you know what? They lived just fine. But then they found out they could buy off public officials. And then their tax rate dropped and we're seeing the results of this. The rich are never asked to sacrifice. We hear about, oh, we can't def defund the police, but defunding happens all the time. Everything else is allowed to be defunded. So city councils, I talked to this city council, not you guys, uh, years ago and said, this is happening, this is going to happen. You can't change the tax rate. But you can speak out about it. You can get your people to understand. You can talk to residents and say, this is the problem. Do something about it. Thank you. That concludes those who would, excuse me, those who registered for public comment or signed up to speak. If there's anyone else wishing to provide public comment on item 4.1 that has not yet provided a comment, please make your way to the podium. Mayor, I'm seeing no one else make a move towards the podium. Thank you. Bringing it back to council. Um, I do have a question. Why is this happening now? What funding or stream of funding did we have before where this wasn't an issue for like the city council um, to deal with this? I'll let uh, Alan chime in, but um, when redevelopment dissolved, um, a lot of cities were left with trying to figure out how funding was going to be, um, you know, how funding was going to be put together for affordable housing. So once redevelopment went away, you started to see cities struggle with housing. And redevelopment came from where, city manager? Redevelopment funds came from where? The state. I actually know where they came from, but the point is, is that when governments higher than us decide to make changes um, in how they allocate funds, then it's up to local governments to try to figure out how we have to 
piecemeal and, and patch it up um, and how we can do things that they have been doing. And I think that it's really sad to pin us against people that I know for sure, 100%, every single one of my colleagues that believe in affordable housing, that have children, that like have gone through the process of needing housing here in Sonoma County. Um, so yes, I listened to all of the public comment, but I think it's really sad to pin us against each other when we all have the same goal, and that is for us to have affordable housing for all here in Sonoma County. How we get there, it may be different, but we all have the same goal. Is there anyone else that has a comment? You look scared. Councilman Brokrefke. I'm good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, question real quick. There's been a lot of back and forth between us and, and, and the presenters, and I appreciate all the time you've taken. Um, I'm trying to recall, was there, when you said looking at the, the proposed, and I know we have had, we as a city and staff hasn't had time to analyze it or consider it in full, um, but did you say that there's a possibility that exists that in looking at that, the methodology used could comply with AB 602? Uh, there, is, there is a possibility. Just looking at the breakpoints on the unit calculations, I would want to further ana analyze before stating that those categories comply with 602. Okay. so. Um, if you're looking for any more direction from us, I don't know if you've gotten all the direction you've wanted, but um, I love the idea of AB 602 and doing that, but you said two years, correct? To, to, to be able to fully take that on and, and, and get a result? That's been the historic trend. Okay, um, still wanna pursue that, we have to, but uh, um, I'd like to get your guys' analysis from the proposal after you've had a chance to take a look at it. Um, from the, for the right sizing um, and, and see what we can do um, and also continue to um, work on the missing middle uh, work you've already been doing and see what we can do to further that. Um, I know that is a huge point of interest and, uh, focus, and focus for a lot of the people in this area. Um, so I would like, that, that would be my um, preference to see uh, the staff do. Councilmember Fleming. Thank you for bringing this item forward, Mayor, and for agendizing it. I know it took some bold leadership, and thank you to city staff for both doing a cautious analysis of our finances and providing us with options. Everybody brought something forward to the table, and now here we are at this moment where capital is really expensive and the need for housing is not going away, and it is incumbent upon us to put our, our budget where our values are. And so I'll speak for myself and say that here's what I'm in support of. I'm in support of the right sizing um, and doing the AB 602, um, but not with the, the Nexus study right now because I don't want to delay it. I do want to see it happen. I appreciate the Generation Housing adjusted their proposal to the tiers, and I'm in support of doing much of that. I'll tell you the pieces that I'm particularly in support of is waiving fees for multifamily housing and for missing middle housing. Um, I am not in support of waiving parks fees. Um, I am in support of our staff figuring out the creative, the most creative solutions to get parks funding um, deployed quickly and easily and in ways that, that meet the, the law, but also don't have a bunch of money in pots hanging around. I know that's not the direction that Mr. Osborne needs today. Um, but at any rate, I would propose a three-year um, waiver, which will give us some time to get past the housing bond in November, hopefully allow for, for rates to stabilize. And I would just say this, you know, many of us, I have struggled with the cost of housing. I know many of us have worked harder than we should have and missed out on more time with our families than we should have. And it's my hope that collectively the seven of us can do something that eases that burden for folks going forward. I know it's not always super pal palatable to do so because there are pieces of this that are, that we have to make difficult choices. And there are pieces of this that may seem like giveaways to developers. But here's the thing in the way I look at it is that, and the way I look at the Renewal Enterprise District for that matter is that government doesn't build housing. Developers build housing. 
And it may be greed, as one commenter noted. Um, it may just be the way that the banking system is set up under our capitalist system to prioritize profits. But it is what it is, and until we can change that system, which is far beyond the scope of this council, we have to look at what's before us. And what is before us today is a dire need for housing. And that is what I'm here to do. I'm here to do the job in front of me. If I'm ever in the federal government, then we can talk about that, or the state government, we can, Mr. Rogers can talk about that next year, right? <laughs> And, and believe me, he, he may block my number. But the point is, today we have a job, we have some opportunities, we have a chance to do something differently, and this is what I hope we do. Um, so thank you to everybody, and I appreciate any compromise we can find. And it doesn't have to be forever, it can just be for three years, and we can see how we do. And listen, if it doesn't work, and we get no housing built, we won't have lost any money. Councilmember McDonald. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you so much for the presentation and the back and forth and getting us some of that information that we talked about as far as the data of how much money is still left in reserves. I think that's helpful just for us to have the conversation. I agree with everything that Councilmember Fleming said. Other than I'd like to see the three-year waiver as coming back year to year so that we can have some information. So while we want to commit in theory to a three-year study or three-year waiver program, I want to make sure that we're coming back to see how many shovels we really are getting into the ground and so that we can actually see that this program would be working um, and really incentivize the developers that are out there doing the work um, locally uh, to, to actually get started on some of these projects that we know we need desperately right now. Um, as far as the park impact fees goes, I agree with you, Council Member Fleming, that we need to make sure that we're not cutting our nose off to spite our face. When we are looking at infill housing or specifically high density housing, my concern would be that we aren't creating open spaces for the families that we're actually trying to house right now. So that's something I think we need to know. First, how much money is still left in reserves and how we can use that money. And then second, what the impact of that's going to be. And then I still am interested in finding out the long term um, impact as far as how housing impacts our local economy as far as how many houses we've built. And I know, um, that Alan said that he could probably get me some of that information. But thank you, really, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate all the advocacy today um, from everyone that's here giving us their opinion on this, and I look forward to seeing it come back to us. If you're talking about the reserves for, like, the parks, I think one of the public commenters did say from their calculations, it was 25 and 15, but that has not been vetted by My understanding myself. was it was 25 million that's been allocated. I'd like to know how much is in unallocated. unallocated. So I want the total amount of the budget in both CFF and in park, park impact fees. And then I also, I think I mentioned earlier, the quadrants and how we can shift some of that money around so that we don't have a seven year program. We actually get some things done right now. Councilmember Alvarez. All right, well, a lot of things have already been said. For myself, I do believe that coming from Roseland, it's, it's evident that we need housing. It's evident that we do have multiple families living in one structure. It's evident that COVID did hit us hard. It's evident that we are, we are subjected to, to being at risk when, it, when it, there is a pandemic, when there is a fire, when there is any type of uh, disaster so to speak, and yet we're still tasked with making sure that Sonoma County as a whole keeps moving forward. But I do fear when it comes to quality of life, what this means, sidewalks, something so simple. When, when, when Rosen was still part of the county, you know, the developers were not, it, it, was, it was practice, not policy, where they were sub, uh, asked to, to, to implement sidewalks. And that leaves the Santa Rosa with Hearn Avenue. When we look at Southwest Park, where children try to make it to the park and risk their lives every day, there are still no sidewalks when it, when it comes to Burbank Avenue and Hearn Avenue. So I, I do agree that we do need a program, and, and the right size might be it. Uh, but I would like to see it be focused on the, the very low to, to, to the moderate. Uh, I do not support anything that says uh, for, for, for the market rate. Uh, there's absolutely nothing 
that justifies that in my mind. If you have enough money for that structure, I mean, leave it for those that still need it. And I believe that, that council member uh, McDonald stated correctly where we can actually move the funds for the areas that, that, that are not up to par. And that is part of my feeling of why the, the market rate should not be subjected or included in this packet. Um, I believe that the program should be three years, and I would appreciate updates. And council member Fleming made a great point about the park fees, that they should not be sacrificed. Uh, I, I do uh, support that. And, and it would be interesting to know, as Councilman McDonald stated, what has been allocated and what has not in regards to the parking fees. And I guess I would, I would leave with a question. If we, as a city, are giving more incentives to developers, is it now a practice or policy when it comes to infrastructure such as sidewalks? So I, I think the sidewalks are a bit of a challenging um, animal. The way it works with development is typically sidewalk connectivity is a requirement of the development. Uh, so the construction of the sidewalk happens with the development. Um, what happens in some situations is development is inconsistent and happens area to area to area. We run into connectivity issues. And oftentimes that gap is either closed by the city if the funding is there or through other development projects. Um, so I think really as we move this forward, what we'll do is an analysis analysis on looking at what seems to be the direction we're getting is the three-year program and really what does that mean from an infrastructure delivery standpoint during that time frame in the various CFF categories uh, because I think we have bikes, sidewalks, roadways um, and we can analyze what that looks like with what the development requirement is and what CFF would cover is really the gap there. I uh, hope that we can actually uh, find a solution to that because a lot of uh, the comments that I heard today was improving the quality of life and making sure that, that the residents of Santa Rosa are able to live where they work. But let us not put the children in danger when they're simply trying to make it to the park. So I'm hoping that the practice that was, that was from the county doesn't become anything less than policy of the city. Thank you. Council Member Rogers. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so first, I saw two colleagues asked how much uh, has is it unallocated. I'm not a lip reader, but when I see the assistant city manager go like this, I think he meant 20 million. Just if I had to, <laughs> it sounds like everything's been allocated. Thanks for the, the sign line. language. Yeah. <laughs> Um, for me, it goes back to that fundamental question of do we see housing as an investment in the community or not? Do we see it as economic development or not? Uh, particularly when we're talking about our very low and our low income, we know that it just does not pencil out for folks to be able to advance those projects, particularly in our community, especially with some of the other uh, competing factors that we have with folks in the Bay Area. We've talked for a decade, uh, really focused on the time, the certainty, and the cost of these housing developments. And what I hear over and over again from folks is well-intentioned uh, policy is great, but if it doesn't actually make the pro forma work out that the access to capital, the willingness for banks to loan money, it's just not there. And even if you own the land, you're still losing money as you wait for that to make sense. So whether it's interest rates coming down, whether it's some policy change from the council, you need that nexus between how much the bank expects to get as a rate of return on its capital to meet up with what your logistics look like. Otherwise, you're not going to get any housing. And to the point that we talked about, we're not losing any money by cutting fees if nothing gets built. Uh, I'm not really interested in doing a strict uh, waiver at the moment. Uh, I do think that we need to come back in our budget adoption and talk about how we're going to actually pay for it. Uh, but I think that it is a priority for the city. Uh, I think that we should have identified if so many projects that are in the pipeline come online are able to get their, uh, their financing plan approved. This is how much we expect it to cost and I think we need to find that money in the budget because it is a priority and it has been a priority for our community. I also think that because developers are trying to make their pro formas work that a waiver doesn't work like a reduction. 
I think if we have the council policy as a reduction in those fees, it makes it easier to go back and get that financing approved. I also think that three years is probably too short for us to be able to make that case to the public uh, and to the banks and, and to the financial institutions, uh, particularly given some of the broader economic forces where perhaps when we look a little bit out and the interest rates come down, that that's the time where the council can say, great, that created some room in that financial stack for us to go back and talk about our parks, to talk about our infrastructure. Uh, to me, it's a balancing approach of how do we try to make these projects pencil. Uh, and uh, three years, probably, given the economic outlook, not enough time for us to actually see this policy realized. What I heard was sort of conflicting on Sacramento. What I heard was that they reduced it and they saw a nine percent or a nine times uh, increase on how much they were getting and that they perhaps would not have gotten that had they not had similar policies. But I do think that it's everything. I think it's redevelopment going away and us trying to figure out how to fix that. I do think that it's us repurposing our city land and keeping that ethos of we're willing to work with folks to try to get what we want uh, and what our community really needs. And that's the low and the very low and the moderate housing. Uh, keep working on the missing middle. Keep working on advancing this project. For me, it's a no-brainer for us to do this per square foot as opposed to per unit work uh, and incentivize apartments and not just more McMansions or single-family homes that tend to pencil out on their own anyway. Uh, and let's bring back in the budget how we're going to pay for it. But I do think that this, com this council needs to continue to lead. Uh, and this is an opportunity for us to say to other communities in Sonoma County, we are going to put our skin in the game because we know that it's going to better our community long term. What are you doing as well to help? Vice Mayor Stapp. I just want to echo what my colleagues have, have indicated. Uh, I'm certainly in support of taking a closer look at our, at our impact field structure um, with a particular focus on the right size impact fee policy that's been presented. Um, anything we can do to, to incentivize, well, all housing, uh, but the particular very low income, low income, and missing middle. Um, but then as uh, well, actually both Mayor Rogers and Councilmember Rogers underlined, uh, we've got real budget trade-offs we have to consider. Things are tight right now. Uh, and we, we, well, we can't know with certainty what, what any, any future incentives or any future impact fee adjustments might mean for the budget. We can at least take a guess that it's going to be somewhere between 400000 and $1.5 million a year. Um, and that's a, that's a real hit to the budget. And so to Councilmember Rogers' point, I'd like at least a little bit of strategizing about what we're, what we're giving up if we want to incentivize housing in this way, which again, across the day as we do. Thank you. Um, so I'll just wrap it up by saying I think my colleagues said it wonderfully. Um, I do want to look at the missing middle, um, low, very low, low. Um, and multifamily is great. Um, not interested in waiving park fees. I do want to know how we are going to supplement this with our current um, deficit that we have and what are we going to have to uh, not do. And I would like a, I wouldn't call it a re-eval, but I would like a report um, annually just so we can see, even if it's saying we, we don't have anyone that is taking advantage of the, taking advantage of it right now, um, just so we can kind of keep uh, an eye on it to know what's going on, to see if there's something we can do to improve it or why aren't people taking advantage of it or where are we at. Um, so I'm looking at the two of you to see if you have the direction that you need. Yes, um, and just really quickly, the outstanding questions that I didn't answer to the two council members, um, just to make sure we're aware and the public has an answer to that. Uh, the number of affordable units that are really pending, ready to move to construction is 301. Um, so to Mr. Alvarez's question, um, that, that's the number. Um, and then the, the maximum justified amount on the fee study, that was set higher than the ultimate fee um, by actually quite a bit. Uh, so CFF for single family and multifamily, uh, single family was 25,000, multifamily was 18,000 and some change. Uh, for parks for single family, it was 16,000 and multifamily 13,000. Um, and those fees were ultimately set by the council at almost half those numbers. 
Um, so thank you for the opportunity to answer those. Um, as, as far as the feedback, yes, uh, I think that helps us frame up a policy. We have time frame to it. We have affordability level to it. Um, I think we can work with that, um, understanding that there is more of a desire to look at park, or less of a desire to look at parks and CFF, but we'll look at the impacts of both of those. Um, we will also follow through on the missing middle piece. That's part of the, the, the process in general, and we'll be doing that anyway. So this will be a companion to that effort. Um, so I know on our end, there's there, on my end, there's enough. Um, I, I really just do want to reiterate that the, the arena numbers are a challenge to meet, and Santa Rosa has come out of the gate very strong this year, and the community should be proud of that. It's not just the council and the staff. It's, it's also the members here in the audience that have played a significant role in that. Um, so it's, it's going to be fairly exciting to see where we end up this year, which I, I think is, is going to be strong. Um, so we appreciate the support and the feedback, and we have enough to move this forward on my end, and I'll leave it to my colleague here to add anything on his side. Yeah, I uh, I think I know uh, what to what to give. Appreciate the direction. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, the reserve numbers just, and then I'll I'll follow up and still give them in writing. Uh, I won't go too fast, but it it's still good to see them. So uh, for park development fees in the northwest zone, it's about ten million dollars in reserves. These are per our development impact uh, fee reports as of um, uh, June 30th of uh, 2023. Uh, so 10 million in the Northwest zone, 6.5 million in Southwest, uh, 4.6 million in Northeast, 8.4 million in Southeast. And for CFF, 17.7 million. And to be perfectly clear, those are all allocated dollars. They're in reserve, but they are allocated. There are no unallocated reserve dollars. Councilmember Fleming. Yes, there's just one tiny thing I wanted to add, which is Councilmember Rogers brought up a concern about three year period not being long enough. I'm hopeful that when you bring it back, you can give us a couple of different lengths of time to just to deliberate over as well as the corresponding costs. Yeah, I would I would recommend looking at a three to five year period. We could look at both just how and how development cycles work and three may be too short based on the need. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I was also thinking about that and thinking maybe we can do three years with a deeper dive and eval at three years. Um, so it's three to five and we, unless we stop it at three, it continues to, to five. So have a deeper dive. Yeah, and we can base some of that information on whether or not BAFA, the bond, is going to go on the ballot as well. So we will incorporate that information as well. Yeah, there, there will probably be a lot of factors that are changing, and that's why I want to continue to have us look at what is it de doing what we designed it to do. Yes. Yeah, and I think uh, when we have that conversation, I'd be interested in understanding or having a public discussion of what the impact of a shorter timeline has on the certainty that many folks who are trying to get their financing in place would face and whether or not five years makes more sense in terms of providing the certainty that they need to be able to get the financing they need to break ground. All right, and with that, thank you all for sticking with us, but we are going to take a short dinner break, so we will Thank you. We will be back at 6.50. Thank you.
before I start beatboxing. All right, all right. Santa Cora, Madison, Madam City Clerk, may you please take the roll. Thank you. Councilmember Rogers. Here. Councilmember Okrepke. Here. Councilmember McDonald. Here. Councilmember Fleming. Councilmember Alvarez. Vice Mayor Stapp. Here. Mayor Rogers. Present. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Councilmember Alvarez and Councilmember Fleming. Thank you. So I apologize for anyone that likes to go in order, but I'm going to do some sausage making of the agenda so we can get everything done um, as quickly as we can. So we are going to start with item 14, and that is public comment on non-agenda matters. So with that, Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate. Thank you. We are now taking public comments on item 14, non-agenda matters. This is a time when any person may address the council on matters not listed on this agenda, but which are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. If you are in the council chamber and would like to comment but have not yet provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. We will take 12 public speakers on under item 14. If we have more than 12 public comments on item 14 non-agenda matters, the remaining speakers will be afforded the opportunity to speak on item 18 non-agenda matters. As you approach the podium, please state your name for the record if you choose to do so. The first public comment will be Ruby, followed by Enhui, and then Susan. Hi, go ahead. Uh, Ruby, N Ruby Nunn Curtis, uh, District 3. I'm here to urge you to consider calling for a ceasefire. Presumably, you have already individually considered this and have dismissed it as outside of your jurisdiction. I'm not going to claim that the critical aspects of Santa Rosa City Planning are not important or worthy of time and consideration. The more City Council meetings I attend, the more I realize how vital they are. However, Santa Rosa does not exist in a vacuum. <laughs> we exist in a broad world, and to sit here and go about our business as if we do not is to present a strange, warped, and fundamentally self-serving version of reality. If we are a city adrift from the rest of the world, then we have no moral or legal imperative to attend to the atrocities that are committed outside of our line of sight. We become joyously uninvolved. It is comfortable to be free of any moral obligation in this way. However, you can look at anything that you have ever bought or any investments you've ever made and know that this is a world that, you, that is this is a world that you have internally constructed, not one that is reflective of material reality. This fabricated world allows you to guiltlessly avert your eyes from all you do not want to see. We are here to ask you to come back to an uncomfortable but grounded reality and consider this city for what it is, a small part of a highly interconnected world. What does this mean for us then, as a city, to be invested in weapons manufacturers? that our city can benefit from weapons that are being used to commit a genocide across the world, to be invested in a company whose bulldozers are used to deconstruct the infrastructure of Palestinian society. If you have any interest in these moral considerations, which Sonoma County did when it chose to divest from apartheid South Africa, then I would be more than willing to email you resources for how to approach divestment from the ongoing genocide. Thank you for your time and hopefully your consideration. Thank you. The next speaker will be in Hui, followed by Susan, then Tess. And Hui. Hello. <clears throat> Money for housing and education, not for bombs and occupation. Hands of Rafa. Greetings. My name is Inhili, uh, living in District 5. I'm grandmother of two. Free Palestine and free Jeju Islands. I'm here to tell city council meeting why passing ceasefire resolution is keeping Santa Rosa's 
commitment to sister city, Jeju, in South Korea. Since 1996, Santa Rosa and Jeju City in Jeju Islands are sister cities. And there has been lots of cultural exchanges. And uh, for instance, there is a stone grandfathers on uh, Sonoma Avenue. And in 1948, while Nakba in Palestine is carried out, there is a catastrophe in Jeju Island. Over 30,000 residents are massacred by the weapons supplied by US military to South Korean military police plus US military. They massacred over 30,000 people. So this is another example of how the money spent in militarism is also hurting our sister cities. So please, city council, to engage court, to engage in international dialogue, engage uh, production of knowledge, promote the benevolence and the contribute and the contribute to a better world and thrive. Court, it's on the uh, city website uh, about the city, uh, sister city in Jeju Island. Free Palestine, free Jeju Island. <coughs> Thank you, the next speaker will be Susan, followed by Tess, then Althea. Susan Lamont, District 2. In the late 1930s, the vast majority of the world stood silent as Hitler began killing Jews, LGBTQ people, Roma people, labor leaders, and more. Most individuals, organizations, and governmental bodies were silent. It was a shameful period in human history. The world did not go to war to save the lives of these people. They were irrelevant to the equation. If Hitler hadn't invaded other countries, the slaughter would have continued unremarked. Now there's a slaughter going on in full view in Palestine. That it is being perpetrated by descendants of Hitler's victims makes it no less heinous. And no one can claim ignorance. More people are speaking up, and yet the vast majority, including yourselves, remain silent. Refusing to put a ceasefire resolution on your agenda and to vote for it as Palestinians are killed, approximately a thousand since your last meeting, is not acceptable. Imagine if every city in the council in the country supported a ceasefire, or simply imagine that you could send your resolution to every city council in California and say, join us. Imagine if every governmental body that supported such a resolution could send it on to the state legislature, to the governor, to, the, to Congress, and to the president. It's basically what I was talking about, about tax increases. You can't increase, ta you can't increase taxes, but you have a voice. So every week that you delay, this unity is thwarted and people are killed. All our cultural hero heroes were brave. Be brave. Please do not recreate another shameful and silent era in history. If humanity survives the twin threats of climate disaster, nuclear war, don't be the ones people look back on and ask, what on earth were they doing? Why didn't they say something? Cease fire now. Thank you. The next speaker will be Tess, followed by Althea. City Council. Um, my name is Tess Caldwell. I was born in Santa Rosa. I still live in Santa Rosa. I really love this city and I love the people that I've gotten to know here. And over the past six months, I've gotten to know some of my community members much more deeply. I've gotten to know some community members who are losing family right now in Palestine. I've gotten to know community members who can no longer talk to their friends and their family because of internet connectivity issues because Israel has been cutting off the internet. I've gotten to meet people who have history and generations before them who survived genocide, whether it's from the Chimera genocide, the Jewish pogroms, and so many more that are beyond that. And the single thread that holds all of these people together is that they know that there is a, is a pain that runs through us all. It doesn't matter who you are or what your experience was that made you face a prejudice. The prejudice is still the same. There are people with power who are oppressing others. And right now in Palestine, people are being oppressed. They've been oppressed for over 70 five years and this isn't fair. 
I've grown up through the public school system watching um, school budget cuts because apparently it was more important to my federal government to bomb Iraq and Afghanistan rather than to fund my own education. As I listen to you all talk about the budget woes of this, this upcoming budget cycle, I fear that we may be entering into another cycle where the federal government would rather send our money that would do so much good work here in our community across the seas to bomb people mercilessly. We pay for the Israel Israeli missiles and bombs. We pay for all of that. Over $2 million of Santa Rosa taxpayer money is used to go towards bombs, missiles, F-15s, and other fighters. While well, you're trying to put the lines together and not go into red and stay in the black, they're sending millions and billions of dollars to Israel just to kill Palestinians. This is a local issue because this, the money that we send could be spent on our community here, and we deserve this. Please pass the ceasefire. Thank you. The next speaker will be Althea. Good evening. Uh, my name is Althea. I'm a lifelong Sonoma County resident, and I currently reside in District 2. Um, I'm here once again to advocate for a ceasefire resolution to be placed on the agenda. We've been begging you to represent us in our call for a ceasefire for months. The longer you go without doing so, the more we lose faith in your integrity, one of the values your council holds highest. Many of us already have. Your vision as a council is for Santa Rosa to lead the North, the North Bay. Embrace this vision of leadership. Be that leader by listening to the plea of the people to take the step forward to add a ceasefire resolution to the agenda. It only takes one of you to add an item to the agenda. It only takes one of you to enact that bravery, that integrity. Please, we are begging you. This is within your jurisdiction the same way addressing climate change is another one of your core issues. It takes many to address a global crisis. The Santa Rosa School Board is also in favor of a ceasefire resolution. Being an alumni of the SRJC, it is very clear that schools and education is a track for progress. Our zero waste initiatives influenced Santa Rosa as a city. Santa Rosa as a city can influence California as a state. California as a state can influence the federal government. We're not begging into empty air here. You are our voices to our representatives, to our state. And at what point are you, your inaction impeding us and impeding our voices from getting to our state representatives. We are only so loud with our single voice. We need you to act as a group voice for us. Please, please add a ceasefire resolution to the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Go ahead. Jason Sweeney, uh, District 5. Uh, I was listening on Zoom, so I got over as quick as I could. Just wanted to, again, uh, appear before you and urge you to bring forward and pass a ceasefire resolution. I wanted to take a minute to thank the uh, Sonoma County Board of, uh, Sonoma County Education Board of Trustees for, in one meeting, bringing forward the resolution and passing it, and the comments that they made that were so critical and so brave and so important. If you haven't heard them, I urge you to go online and, and take a listen to what they had to say. Um, I'm here because the situation is dire and we as a community have not done the bare minimum, which is to speak up and call for help when we see something wrong. I'm here because I'm ashamed. This is not the reality that I want for my daughter and I know that we're better than this. The bottom line is that the city of, Pen of Santa Rosa has gone on record as being unwilling to deal with this issue in the community division it has revealed. It has revealed, among many things, a lack of principle, the genocide being done right now in the name of the state of Israel and the so-called safety of some is grotesque and barbaric and could not have happened without the, US, the support of the US. Elon Pape is a renowned Israeli historian. He recently reminded us that Israel is behaving like a rogue state and rogue states don't just change their behavior, they must be pressured from the outside. And that's why we keep coming to you week after week. That's why we're meeting in the plaza, we're trying to get people to speak up for what is right. 
and we're, you know, we're asking you to join the chorus and call for an end to the violence. That's all we're asking. We're speaking on behalf of Palestinian people. Uh, oh, I was, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, we're, we witnessed recently the, the targeting, not once, not twice, but three times of a, a food aid. I mean, we can see what's happening. Thank you. Speaker, please go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Bree. I'm an unincorporated Sonoma County member, but I often come to Santa Rosa to receive medical care, do grocery shopping. Um, a lot of my sales tax comes to your city, so I believe I am one of your constituents in that regard. Um, I, you know, have heard many of our community members voice why this is a local issue to you all. Um, I would like to reiterate that it is a local issue. Um, but I think more importantly, it's important to hear voices from the Palestinian community regarding their experiences because I feel like that has a huge impact. So um, I have a poem, a poem here by Lena. She's a Palestinian refugee. She wrote a poem that's um, untitled, but it says, there is no recipe book that teaches how to make bread from animal feed, sand and sewage water, what makes it prove and rise and what you dip it in. The measurement of the ratio of despair to hunger. There is no parental guidebook that teaches how to calm unsleeping famined children how to get them to sleep, feeding on empty promises, how to soothe the growls of their tummies with feasts with angels they don't see or hear. There is no scientific way to pur purify sewage water, how to separate human excrement from human remains to fit for human consumption, how to distill rain carrying death, how to extract salt from tears. I think it goes without saying that this is a humanitarian crisis that we're experiencing right now as a community. I don't think that it's solely a global issue. I think it affects us directly. And I think that we see that in the faces of our community members. Everyone's showing up here weekly to beg you people to pass a resolution, please. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to provide public comment on item 14, non-agenda matters? Mayor, seeing no one else approach the podium. Thank you, and with that, we will now uh, go to 16.1, Madam City Manager. Item 16.1 is a public hearing, proposed recreation fee adjustments. Good evening, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Stapp, and members of the council. Uh, Jeff Tibbetts, Deputy Director with Recreation, and uh, not a skill I'm very good at, but seeing how early in the night we are, well, I'll do my best to be brief. Um, so before today is a uh, recommendation, uh, a public hearing on a proposed fee schedule uh, amendment for the Recreation and Parks fees. So just quick background. Um, Based off city code, uh, it is required that city council establish park user fees by resolution. Um, and while that term sometimes is misleading, just to clarify that the park user fees um, include facility rentals and admission fees within recreation as well. Um, and you can see that there's been a number of times that we've brought different things forward to the council. Uh, one of the key ones being in 1995, where resolution 22307 established uh, that there are certain fees that the uh, the authority to approve would be delegated down. And that was to the Director of Recreation and Parks. That was really critical, otherwise we'd be here pretty much every single meeting as we're negotiating contracts with contract instructors or corn dog prices go up or those types of things. So um, what that left with is the fee schedule uh, that we propose that are the fees that are actually set by council for, for different services and programs that we offer. Uh, so looking through uh, the what this just kind of overview of the presentation broke it down a few areas um, and really that 
the fee changes are broken into three categories there you can see is updates uh, simplification of the process and then fee increases so uh, I'll kind of generically talk about updates and, and the simplification if there's any questions on any of those I could address those later but as we go through each slide I won't go into too much detail updates are, are simple things right we have buildings the Bennett Valley Senior Center that no longer exist rooms that we don't use the way that they were used previously um, the simplifying of the process is really a focus on customer service, uh, upfront clarity with our customers, uh, those types of things. And then there's a few areas where we address fee increases, uh, and that is in relation to the fact that uh, the, his the historical list there, last time we brought any fee increases was 2017. Um, so obviously that's a seven year span, a lot has changed in that time uh, in our operations and the cost of staffing, those types of inflation, uh, those, those types of items. So there's a few areas that we've identified uh, be very clear this is not a comprehensive look at increasing fees uh, with a new director coming on board uh, we have kind of had a conversation there's some things that we want to look into as a department uh, around business plan and evaluation of what that looks like what cost recovery looks like um, a plan that could be approved by council that will better guide us as a department in the future to look at these types of fees and give you guys more detailed um, proposals that are based off of a philosophy that we've all agreed on in a, in a business plan um, so at this time, it was really just identifying a few areas where we are aware that having not increased fees since at least 2017, in some areas even longer, because not every fee got changed in 2017, that there's just a few areas for uh, fiscal responsibility with our general fund assets to make sure that we um, address those areas. Uh, and again, the program areas there, the, the different areas that we will go through for each one. So with our community centers, again, updates were really about removing things that buildings or rooms that we no longer have, um, change in how we do some operations with services, uh, the person senior, uh, person auditorium stage. If you rent the auditorium, we're not gonna charge you separately for the stage. If you rent the stage, you're renting the auditorium, so things like that. And then some services that just with our staffing levels are, are old uh, that we don't provide anymore, like coffee services or linen rentals or those types of things. We're really a rental operation, not an event planning operation. As far as simplification, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the first bullet point there just because it's it's important to what could be construed as a fee increase um, and that is that we have had a custodial fee that gets added on for each room um, and it does a couple of things that, that we're looking to remove that fee for simplification one it creates uh, an element for staff when when some user groups maybe feel like they don't need to clean up uh, one of the things they look at is I, I paid a custodial fee why am I also cleaning up after my party um, and that's not really the custodial fee is about the overall custodial of, of the facility um, it was never intended to be, you know, we don't have somebody using that money to have someone come in and clean up after their event. Um, and then it also kind of served as, as a hidden fee in some ways. Um, you know, you couldn't really look at what's my hourly rate and figure out how much my event's going to because you have to tack this on and tack that on and, and those different things. So uh, we based the formula off that of a four-hour rental, and that came down to a 15 per, that, that, that flat fee essentially worked out to across the board as a 15 percent of what the hourly rate was um, and so we built that in across the board while dropping off that fee so if you look at the facilities it looks like 15 percent across the board on the cost of rooms but again that's based off that formula the removal of of that fee um, we did some cleanup on our our nonprofit um, and commercial and resident rates we eliminated the difference between weekday and weekends. Again, the things that make it much more complicated for staff and make it much more complicated for the public to understand what it's gonna to cost to hold events. Um, we eliminated some fees for equipment like whiteboards and podiums. Again, these things that could be construed as a little petty and um, hidden fees and, and that type of stuff of, hey, you rented the room and then you get there and you realize you want a podium and we hand you a slip of paper that says it's okay, we're gonna charge you an extra $15 for use of the podium. Uh, we really wanna, you rented the room, the hourly rate, if we have it available for you, we're gonna provide it and we don't need to have those added uh, extra tack on fees. Um, same thing with our audiovisual equipment, right? You paid for every microphone you used, you paid for every piece of equipment, it's just a flat fee for, for those things now. Um, cleaning up our storage and then also uh, alcohol fee. We had a fee for every single room, if, as you see on the old one, and that's really uh, makes more sense to have it based off of attendance and size of the event, and so just having those two small and large alcohol fee on rooms. So again, the fee increases, I already kind of talked about that one. It's, it's not really a true fee increase. It's a, a shifting of a fee from a flat fee into our hourly rates. With aquatics, again, some updates. Um, 
we wanted to add, a, or we have added a membership for aquatics, and that kind of took the place of our flexi pass and public swim passes. So um, those passes were required the membership, and so they've really just instead of separate fees, um, since they're tied to the membership, they're just part of the membership fee, not a separate fee anymore. So we're not removing those discounted rates, we're just operationally changing the way that they're offered, um, and it's part of the membership, not a separate fee. Um, also, we had some outdated equipment that we removed from it. And then very exciting, uh, while it's not there yet, we're, we're planning ahead, and so uh, building in a fee to be able to accommodate the splash pad when that project is done at the Finley Aquatic Center. Um, as we looked at private rentals of, of facilities, uh, for that facility and, and the fact that the splash pad will be very attractive to parents of younger kids, that maybe the pool scares them. Um, we realize that there's an opportunity for us to have a rental option there that would be just the splash pad and not include the pool. And that drastically reduces the staffing that's required to supervise it, um, which allows us to provide an option that's a more affordable option for families to use just the splash pad if that's something that they're interested in. On the simplification, one of the things that the splash pad also does is it makes Finley and Ridgeway um, more parallel as far as a rental facility goes. Ridgeway had the awesome slide uh, and Finley did not, so uh, we were able to uh, make those fees more streamlined with both facilities being um, attractive to the public for different reasons. And uh, again, similar to the add-on fees of podiums or those types of things, uh, different equipment like dive rings or the, using the sound system or, or those types of things are just included in the rental. So we removed a, a number of fees that were related to those items. Um, we also eliminated the Ridgeway water slide fee. That is, don't, don't be scared. Uh, we will still have the Ridgeway water slide, but again, just a matter of operationally how we book it. If you rent the pool, we're assuming that you're renting the slide and we don't need to have separate fee structures for those. Um, and again, that's just with, with public uh, private rentals. Or excuse me, not public. <laughs> that is just with private rentals, not public. Um, so going a little more into that, this is an area where we are proposing a fee increase. And the reason for this fee increase is we're really at that tipping point now where, uh, again, these are not a public function of the, the public's using it, but this is when someone wants a private rental of the facility. This is never taking place during our public swim or lap swim or those hours. These are when the pool would otherwise be closed and someone does a private rental to keep the pool open. With the staffing levels and, and the increased cost of staffing, we're now reaching the point where we are barely cost recovery of putting our temp staff out there for the party, let alone the administrative costs that it takes to issue the permit and those things. So um, we're really at a point where uh, we don't feel that that private usage should be something that we're, we're uh, covering with, with general fund, that it should be cost recovery. So if you see currently 120 to $200 an hour, proposing that up to 225 to $315 an hour. Uh, again, the size of these parties, you're talking you know, 50 plus people at these parties, um, when you compare it to other birthday party options, it's still a very affordable option uh, compared to other parties that are a couple hours and four or $500 for 10 to 15 kids. Again, another, uh, another piece of that uh, increase is building in all those things into one fee. So at Ridgeway, you're not paying $120 and then also paying $60 for the slide. Um, so building those things in together. As far as updates are concerned, um, again, uh, or I'm sorry, moving on to the park permits. Uh, updates and park permits, I, I wanna be clear with something as we start talking about park permits is the purpose of park permits is not to charge people just for normal general use of the parks, right? Some of these fees make it sound like, oh, someone wants to, you know, I wanna go with my family to the park and have lunch. There's a picnic fee or the, again, these are for privatization of some areas, right? That we wanna be able to reserve a picnic site or those types of things. So it's really not a, a matter of revenue, it's a matter of service providing to the public um, to say, hey, you wanna have your child's birthday party, you wanna make sure that there's a barbecue and picnic tables available for you, you wanna rent that and reserve it ahead of time, um, that we can provide that service and, and that those services are cost recovery as well. <clears throat> um, so looking at you know, some of the things that we've removed or again, just really operationally, looking to add uh, a lot of our park special use permits are for nonprofits that are doing you know, running events or different fundraisers. Uh, and we have not, uh, the original special use permit uh, does not include the option for any discounts where we have in other places for nonprofits. So establishing a 10% nonprofit discount for the park permit side. Um, and then also the, uh, 
the fees are based off the size of events because obviously larger events have more impact on the park, more impact on the neighborhood, more impact on staffing. Um, and so we've really found now that we've been implementing these for several years is that we need another level. There's another level of size of event. Uh, we're creating it at 2001 plus people where it requires a lot more pre-event meetings and um, impact on the neighborhood and notices and garbage plans and all those different things that incorporate other departments sometimes, fire department, those types of things. So uh, adding another event there that uh, will adequately collect fees for, for those larger events. Simplification side of things, right? Addressing some of our non-resident rates for consistency with that. Um, our park special use permit and our picnic sites, uh, the numbers did not line up, so a small picnic site was 50 people, a small uh, special use permit was 25 people. So we made some changes just to, again, align that, make it much easier for us to communicate and educate the public on, on what we have. Uh, we also looked at our court rental fees um, and kind of create a system that would put those in line with our uh, field rentals. And so that is having a uh, private, normal private fee rental, but then having a discounted rate for league play and then having a um, higher rate for commercial. Um, and, and the difference there of private would be your family is having a family reunion, you wanna have a softball game, that's just kind of a private one as opposed to you're putting on um, a, a uh, profitable softball tournament and you wanna use the field, that would be the difference of how you'd be charged those fees. Uh, we had a duplicated picnic deposit fee, small and large, they were the same fee, so I don't know why we had two of them, uh, but we don't need them. And then uh, also looking for, um, out on our tennis courts or, or our sports courts, uh, fees being set up seasonally, again, makes it very, complicated, you have one permit that has different fees for courts because this is this date and that date. Um, and then also tennis was set up as match play instead of an hourly rate. While I understand the sport of tennis is based off of a match and not a clock, uh, the reality is we have to reserve things by hours. So uh, if you think your match might go over two hours, book it for three hours. Um, but the, the match play just really doesn't work for how um, we can reserve things. So again, in this area, there are some proposed fee increases. Some of it's just from the cleanup of aligning our picnic reservations and our park permits. So that gets to some of the picnic reservation fees there. Um, and again, really the, the big impact there is the park special use permit. As you see, the, the top fee going up to $3,150 a day. Uh, and again, stress that that $3,150 a day is for those 2,001 plus uh, size people size events. Um, so this is not your everyday people going out, you know, for doing things with the family. These, these are very large uh, events that have a, a major impact on, um, again, not just the community and neighborhood and, and the public use of the park, but also the, the staff time for uh, helping organize and make sure that, that everything is ready for the event. And then again, with the athletic courts and fields, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Couple things that we wanted to address there in, in lining it. Um, so making um, varying increase for league and private rates and then a more significant increase for the commercial rentals. So again, as we were readjusting those fees, we realized that there were some league play out there that would be uh, impacted by that more than, than really was our intention. So creating that league fee would, would make sure that we can continue to accommodate them. And then also increasing the field lights. Uh, currently that's a $20 an hour, proposing that up to $30 an hour, and really just comes to the cost of, of maintaining that, that equipment. The light bulbs are very expensive, the, the process of getting the lift truck and all those things. So it's expensive equipment to maintain. Out at Howarth Park, um, updates again are just kind of cleaning some things up. Uh, want to stress there as, as life jacket is listed, uh, that is not removing having life jackets available, that is removing um, the practice of charging for it. So in the past, um, a life jacket, it, it's always been free when somebody rents one of our boats, um, but the reason that that fee was on there in the past was if someone came out with a private boat that, that, that they could rent a life jacket from us. We want everybody on the water wearing life jackets, we're not gonna charge fees, um, and so removing that from there. And then also with the pony rides, uh, Unfortunately, that, that service is not back out in the park yet. We hope to see that back in the future. Uh, but even if it comes back, the fee, it's really not appropriate for the fee to be on this approved fee schedule because anytime we do uh, 
pony rights, that's going to be in a contract, and that contract is going to come forward with what the fees are and approved by council in that manner. And so what we've had in the past is we've had a contract come to you and get approved, and that contract is updated to the current fee, but the fee schedule didn't come to you. So now we've got two different things approved by council that technically say different fees. So to just clean that process up. Simplification, this gets into just kind of uh, to start the conversation around uh, the fee increase that we're proposing for Howarth Park is uh, it really is critical for customer service and, and efficiency on the park that our K-Land attractions, the train, the carousel, and the animal barn uh, are the same price. What that allows us to do is sell the same ticket. Um, something happens, the train breaks down, a kid is decides they're scared of the train, they don't want to ride it. Uh, you could take your kid on the carousel instead. We start changing the prices and not have that consistent. Now we have different tickets for everything and it becomes a logistical nightmare with refunds and, and those types of things in the park. So with that said, the fee increase that we are proposing for Howarth Park uh, currently is $2 a ticket for those K-Land tickets. Again, that's the train, carousel, and animal, animal barn admission ticket. Uh, we are proposing that to go up to $3. Currently, there is a discount ticket book of 25 tickets. Uh, that is $40. We're proposing that with the $3 uh, for individual ticket to go up to $60 for the discount ticket book. And then we also have the paddle boats um, that are out in, that we rent out at, um, on the lake, and that is currently at $12 an hour, proposing that to be up to $15 an hour. The reason we identified Howarth Park for potential fee increases, um, it was not increased in 2017. I actually couldn't find exactly when it was, but I know the most recent it could have been, because I ran Howarth Park from 2013 to 2018, um, is July 1st of 2012. Is the most recent we may have done fees. Uh, in that time, we know staff costs have gone up quite a bit, um, over $100,000 just on our temp staffing for the operations of Howarth Park from 2012 to the budget that will be uh, coming forward to you next month for approval. Uh, so that that's gonna help kind of just address that gap that we know that has been created without addressing those fees in the past. So impact, again, on the first one, is just kind of cleaning things up. The fee schedule will more accurately reflect what we're actually doing in, in practice. Um, again, efficiency for our staff, uh, better customer service, more clarity on what the fees are, why they're being charged, a better ability for customers to kind of come in knowing what they're going to be charged by just looking at hourly rates and those types of things and being able to figure it out and getting rid of the, getting rid of the hidden fees. And then on the economic impact, um, Proposing uh, the fee increases generate approximately $100,000 in additional revenue, most of that again being uh, related to the Howarth Park operations and the increase of the fees there. If you so choose, I mentioned you know a future business plan that we're looking at. So this slide is just um, while we're here this evening, if you have, uh, give you a sense of some of the things that we're thinking about, um, and if you have any feedback proactively to get that before. Uh, one is as we look to create this business plan that may lead to future um, present you know, future proposals of fee increases um, is looking at the non-resident fees. So roughly we're around 75, 80% of our um, res uh, uh, registrations and reservations are from residents, um, 20 to 25% non-residents. As we explore these things in the future and look at that business plan, um, right now our, our difference in fees from resident to re non-resident is pretty small. Um, in comparison to other cities. So is that something that you would want us to explore to actually look in the future um, with fee things is to say, hey, let's, let's look at expanding that and putting uh, a bigger discount on, on resident fees than what we currently do. Um, also looking at those things like the nonprofit or the league discounts um, from just normal private rentals and then the, the, ex the extra fees for those commercial type things. Uh, is that a model that you would want us to look at to, to potentially um, maintain discounts for nonprofits, leagues, maybe increase those discounts, uh, potentially increase those fees on commercial uh, activities? I also, you know, be very clear, it's, I didn't get into recreation so that I could brag about how much revenue that we generate. So um, I, anytime I have to come up here and specifically talk about money, uh, I'm going to find some way to make sure that I'm also talking about, you know, uh, access to our programs, uh, equal opportunities for our youth and, and our seniors and, and everybody in our community. That's obviously what's core to us. I'm really excited to say that we're exploring some really awesome opportunities with our scholarship program, how to build that out, how to develop it further than what it's been. Uh, the reality is it's really lived off of the work of our amazing recreation and parks team, putting on events that end up being fundraiser for the scholarship program. Um, for us to really elevate and take it to a next level, one of the ideas that we're exploring to possibly bring forward to you in the future is a $1 
two dollar or something like that addition to every registration that we do um, that that one to two dollars that's added on would go to the scholarship fund instead of going directly to the general fund it eventually is going to end up in the general fund because they're going to use that scholarship to sign up for a program um, but again that give us the capacity to build the the resources that we have available for the scholarship fund and make sure that as fees increase uh, that we're continuing to do what we find is critical to, to what we're doing and making it accessible to everybody. Um, so if there's any thoughts on that, I'd be interested. Uh, roughly, it's, it's very hard. I mean, we'll have to dig into those numbers a lot more. There's roughly around 60,000 registrations per year through recreation and parks. Um, but that number would be dwindled down quite a bit as far as how many we would actually apply it to. Um, for example, about 25,000 of those registrations are for our senior programs, um, and that might be an everyday $3 drop into play billiards. Um, wouldn't really be as equitable to apply a $1 add on fee to them coming every single day versus just $1 added on to a week of camp or um, a six week session of exercise classes. So we would have to dig into that more. And then the last piece there, again, uh, making sure that we are not just focused on revenue, but focused on the services we provide to the community. Our parks, our facilities are often used for critical social services. Uh, we saw that very much during the pandemic where uh, we were a place to get um, testing and, and those types of resources out to the community, um, food distributions, all those types of things. So. Um, we are very interested in potentially down the road bringing a um, proposal to you for a delegation of authority that would allow, um, it's, it's very hard to bring every single thing that comes to us as a contract to, to council to approve for, for waiving of the approved fees. Um, so could there be a delegation if certain uh, request for use of a park for food distribution or those types of things were to come through that delegation be delegated down to uh, department head or, or city manager's level. So again, none of those are part of the proposal, just if I'm proposing, hey, we gotta raise fees, I gotta stay true to our, to our roots and, and what we really care about in recreation and parks. So if you have any thoughts on it, we're interested to hear it as, as we take that next step with the business plan. So with that said, uh, the recommendation before tonight is uh, recommended by the Recreation and Parks Department that the council by resolution approve the fees for previous, uh, for various facilities and services effective January 1st, 2025, uh, which was attached to the presentation this evening. And with that, take any questions or comments. All right, uh, going to council for questions or comments, but I'm gonna kick it off. So um, I think the one to $2 would be great, but more like an elected uh, add-on fee. Or you know how Macy's gets me every time and they say, do you wanna round up? Yeah, something like that. Um, and then the resident discount, I think that that would be great to give our residents a discount. Um, Nonprofits, yes, and then also um, league discounts. So when I look at league discounts, there are different types of leagues. There are leagues where parents can pay like $500 for their child to be in a league that they still need a field or a court to play in. And then there are leagues that uh, children that don't have $500 to sign up for a league um, participate in and it makes it even harder when uh, the coaches have to either come out of their pocket to pay and they're already buying them cleats and balls and all this other stuff but then they have to uh, then pay for the field. I would like to find a way to help with that because I, I think that um, this is why we're here, right? Is to make, you know, our, our make things available for people that can't just go out and pay the $500 or the $600. Um, and then lastly, I wanna talk about uh, neighborhood parks. You can rent from neighborhood parks, correct? Yes. Okay, so then my, my question would be, um, I live in a neighborhood park and I wanna have a birthday party for my child, but then someone comes and rents, because this is what I can afford, because this is where I live, this is my neighborhood park, and someone comes and uh, rents the something, I don't know, the field. Uh, so then my child in having that birthday party can't play on the field, correct? So 
neighborhoods as far as a neighborhood parks as a category right we have community parks and neighborhood parks um, neighborhood parks as that category requires um, it doesn't have like the picnic reservations it requires a special event permit um, that is issued through us so our staff are looking at those things and most neighborhood parks we're not going to have multiple things going on at the same time um, and in most neighborhood parks as far as that category is concerned right now to the public, that doesn't always mean something, right? If I live right next to a community park, in my eyes, that's the neighborhood park, but community parks are gonna have assets like sports fields and, and bigger amenities that are issued um, in different ways or even you know gazebo reservations and those types of things. Um, so, I know that's, I, so I made your question more confusing, but. <laughs> you know what I'm asking though, because the feedback that we received that uh, people cannot use their own, and I wanna say their neighborhood parks, but correct me if I'm wrong, they can't use their own neighborhood parks because people are renting those facilities, so they can't use them. Yes, so yeah, more specifically to that, I mean that generally is around our sports um, courts and fields, and, um, Yes, so there have been some situations like around our sports courts. Um, again, since that goes through our permitting, we do have the ability. So there were basketball courts that we were renting out during COVID um, because for a while our focus was how do we support these businesses? The, the community quickly let us realize, hey, you forgot another element and now the kids who live in this community can't use these amenities. So. Um, Fortunately, we have the flexibility in there. I mean, that was a matter of a few weeks and, and getting that permit squared away before we distributed that. And um, But yeah, when it comes to our sports courts and uh, our sports fields, the reality is we don't have enough. And so they are impacted. Um, so whether you live next to a sports field or there's a sports field that you like to drive to, uh, they are pretty much, if they're not closed due to all the rain that we've had lately, um, they are, they're pretty much booked by all the different activity that's taking place, unfortunately. Okay, um, for my constituents, I hear your answer, but I don't like it. Um, but we'll move on with that. So anyone else have uh, Councilmember McDonald? Thank you, Mayor. So um, a couple things. I I, I read about the splash pad, the splash pad, and um, my concern is how many splash pads, that's hard for me to say, how many splash pads do we have in the city? So we just have, when this opens, we'll have the second one. Um, one of the things that's happened with splash pads is law recently changed, uh, I don't remember exactly when, they are considered aquatic facilities. And so they have to recycle the water, do all those types of things. They have to have showers available um, to the public. So uh, the model of moving like this one is to being a, already a part of our aquatic facility where we've already made all those accommodations at the Finley Aquatic Center, uh, I think makes a lot more sense. Now, it's less desirable because it's not available to the public all the time um, and they have to go and pay admission to the Finley Community Center. Um, but for example, when the Howarth Park, there used to be one at Howarth Park, when that one needed to be renovated um, was around the same time that those laws had gotten in place. So the price tag to um, obviously for, for conserving water, not having the water just go down the drain, we would have to build in the recycling, to put in the showers in the middle of Howarth Park to do all those types of things, um, really made it something that, that we couldn't accommodate at that point. So you have the, just this one. So my concern Prince around Memorial, yeah. renting it is, is it sort of like the pools where you're renting it after hours or is it correct? not just during the daytime? Because if there's only one in the city of Santa Rosa and we're renting it out during the daytime and other children can't come to play on it, that would be concerning to me. No, correct. So when we looked at the, the, the private facility rentals that only take place after public hours, um, we just wanted to add that if that yes, you could rent the pool and do a pool rental, but if you have younger kids, you don't want to use the pool, we're creating a fee where you can also rent the splash pad. Um, so it would be that the pool is only open for those 50 people who are coming for that birthday party and they're using the splash pad, they're not using the pool. It would never restrict during rec swim or any of those types of things from other kids utilizing it. 
Thank you. And I don't mind adding a dollar or a $2 fee to all the registrations of the current um, system that we have so we can create a more stable funding revenue for scholarship programs. I think that is an opportunity for you to actually see what the budget would be based on you know how many um, registrations we have throughout the year. If we're looking at that and really creating that opportunity for kids to be able to participate um, in our in our program. So I, I am not opposed to that so I'm glad to hear that you're actually thinking about bringing that back to council to say that that would be and then actually having it go back into that same program I think would be um, something I would be interested in seeing so other than that I appreciate the um, presentation those were my two concerns was around the splash pad and 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 for the additional fee thanks and I'll sub in for a second other council members questions councilmember Alvarez Thank you, Vice Mayor. For myself, just a recommendation or just something that kind of crosses my mind. When it comes to neighborhood parks or community parks, where we do have the issue where we have leaders within that said tight-knit community who are looking to help children from that tight-knit community, if there's a way to offer them incentives, whether it's waiver of fees, whether it's, it's um, preference uh, on how to offer them the parks where they live. And I don't know if, if maybe we're, we're, we're three quarters of the majority of the children that are being served by this group live in that exact community might be a way to uh, validate the, 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 the waiving of a fee. And I don't know the legalities or how that can even be done. But you know, when, when I see people within the community stepping forward to help our future leaders, I think there should be some type of reward to their efforts and really pick up the pieces where others may not be able to. And really being able to be those within said community that do have the trust of, of their neighbors. And, and it's really just a thought. And maybe you can make it into reality. Yeah, just say to that point, um, you know, I, I mentioned looking at a, a delegation of authority for some of the fees, um, I think it would be something for us to look at, you know, what would that look like? Um, because the other avenue, again, would be every time that that pops up, the staff time and everything to try to put together a very specific contract for that then to bring forward. Because again, uh, without that delegation of authority as a department, we cannot waive those fees or set new fees. And with that being said, uh, I would definitely would support the delegation of authority, and I would actually vie for that opposed to league discounts or even discounts for commercial fees, just because I see it's, it's serving uh, those that, that, that really are sometimes underrepresented and even more so underserved. Council Member Fleming. Great, thank you uh, for bringing this forward and for all that you do. One of the things that always impresses me about your your presentations is that I feel like you like your job. And uh, that's really cool, you know, to see somebody who's doing exactly what they're meant to, meant to do. And that really comes across in your attention to details. Um, I wasn't under the impression that this was necessarily a study session that you were looking for a lot of feedback, but everything you've, you propose sounds really good. On the, the fee structure, I would recommend you know, figuring out a percentage of the fee so that everybody who uses our services can participate in your great scholarship fund um, to capitalize it to the point that you need it rather than, you know, having a, a blunt instrument of a dollar to, you know, just a percentage that becomes essentially part of the fee that goes towards um, our, our future amazing scholarship program. I did have a question for you about splash pads. I didn't know that they were considered aquatic facilities. Is that a regulation of the state or the federal government? I'm going to go with it's a state government because that sounds like something California, my favorite home state, would do. Um, and <laughs> it's very excessive in my mind. Is, um, does that mean our Prince Memorial facility falls under that? Yes, and, and we do have the restrooms with the showers there because of that reason. Okay, so we have two in the city then. That, that uh, one. The Finley one will be the second one. The yeah. Finley one will be the second one, and the Howard one was shuttered due to this regulation? Or because it was just the... So, yeah, Howarth Park was at the point it was going to need to be replaced. I see. Um, and then once we realized all the new regulations to replace it, um, it was cost prohibitive right. and just functionality prohibitive. Right. Well, I'll just add this now so that I don't have to after we go through... Um, 
public comment and so forth. But what I really like about this is that it sort of places the user at the center of the experience without nickel diming them so that somebody can come and use our services, our facilities, and feel like they're getting good value for the price, even if the price is a little more, that they got everything that they needed out of it. And the attention to detail is, is noted and appreciated. Um, I'm, th those are my comments. Thank you. Vice Mayor Staff. Thank you, Deputy Director. Um, you, you didn't want to you didn't want to highlight the revenue generation, but I will. Thank you. Thank you very much for for sharpening your pencil. Um, we want to we want to make sure that these amenities are available, as my colleagues have indicated. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we're 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 covering the cost of providing these services, especially given some of the other activities and other, the, that we're that we've discussed even this evening in, in terms of other initiatives the city wants to support. So thank you for for taking a look at the fee structure. Um, with respect to, to finding funds for scholarships, um, I'm certainly completely supportive as well. Um, with, the, with the quiet conversations around resurrecting the, the Parks Foundation, that might be an interesting, interesting avenue for the Parks Foundation as well, um, some, some philanthropic work, um, in addition to any, any fee increases with the city. Um, I certainly support delegation of authority. Uh, anything that we can do to make your job easier and staff's job easier in terms of coming up with, with efficient ways to run these programs, um, by all means, bring those ideas forward. Uh, and then lastly, on a, on a very selfish note, although selfish also for Councilmember Rogers as well, so I've got my aquatics membership here. And, and I noticed, um, I'm, I'm certainly happy to participate in the five to ten thousand dollars of revenue generation for aquatics. How's my membership going to work? So, the, the the fee changes there are really around those private rentals. Um, so membership is not involved with the private rentals piece, right? So the membership is essentially, right, that discounted rate that you get as a member every time you do lapse them. That, am, am I losing my dollar discount? No. Um, so, that's, yeah, so that's what I was trying to explain, right? You had, you had, we had FlexiPass. Well, FlexiPass is only available to members, so we don't really need an approved FlexiPass fee. That's the membership fee that's now there. When you pay membership, you get the dollar discount. Um, so it was, it was duplicated, basically, as far as the fee structure was considered. Understood. I'm supportive. Thank you. <laughs> oh, gosh. Can't make this up, can you? All right. So with that, we will now open the public hearing. And Madam City Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. We are now taking public comment on item 16.1, the public hearing for proposed recreation and park fees. If you'd like to provide a public comment, and you're in the chamber and have not yet provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podium for public, oh, there we go, hi. Let's see here, please, speaker on the east lectern, please go ahead. Santa Rosa. Um, I'm a mother and a grandmother. I'm just hoping that you take into consideration the low-income families, um, like with the um, increase and in, like all of the well, and everything, um, especially for those families who are like on AB, EBT and Medi-Cal, um, like the museum, the Children's Museum over on West Hill Lane offers discounts to low-income families. I'm hoping you guys could do the same. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker on the West Lectern, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Tess. I was born in Santa Rosa. I still live here. I have uh, enjoyed Haworth Park and so many other places in Santa Rosa throughout my life. Um, I would like to echo the comments of the previous speaker. Um, there was a period of time where I was accepting EBT for about a year and a half, and thanks to programs at uh, the Children's Museum, I got to enjoy multiple days there at a price that was affordable for me with my second youngest sibling. Um, in addition like museums in San Francisco do it and I, I got to take my six-year-old brother to the Exploratorium which would have cost me like 45 bucks I got to go to the Academy of Sciences I got to go to the de Young with him I got to experience all of these amazing things 
because I didn't have to sacrifice either saving for my rent or paying for my groceries. Um, I went with my nephew and our family to the rides at Howarth Park maybe about a year ago, and because he was so young, he didn't want to go on alone, so instead of paying for a ride ticket for one two-year-old, we paid for seven ride tickets for the entire family, so we ended up all riding the train together. Um, if I was a family with multiple children with a child like that, I would then have to pay like $21 to do that activity versus 14 before when frankly like $21 is a lot of money for a lot of people and there are so many people in our community who deserve access to these amazing amenities and even though many of us may not budge or really notice three extra dollars, one extra dollar, there's so many people in our community who do notice that difference and we should think about them and implementing programs so that low income, people who accept food stamps, people on HUD, different programs can access these things without having to sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you, is there anyone else in the chamber wishing to provide public comment on this item? Oh, speaker, please go ahead at the east lectern. You can raise the podium on the right-hand side uh, and get the microphone up closer to your mouth so we can hear you down here. Thank you. Can, can, my name is Carolyn Spencer. I, I just wanted to, now I can't see the person. Uh, I just wanted to say, have you thought about partnering with part, partnering with the schools and offering some type of services to further enhance the education of the underserved population that we have in Sonoma County. That would be kind of a cool program for you guys to do. Thank you. Mayor, I see no one else approaching the podiums for public comment on this item. Thank you. We will now close the public hearing and bringing it back to council for final comments or questions. Would you like a motion first? Oh, no, I wasn't. I was going to just ask for if, if there are any final questions or comments. No? Uh, Alvarez. I, I guess my question would be, what are the obstacles with, with partnering with our local schools or, or if we've had any conversation? Yeah, uh, we do it quite a bit in Recreation and Parks. You'll actually have a contract on consent uh, next week um, for a very exciting new partnership with Santa Rosa City Schools and some summer programming. It's gonna solidify a recreation sensation program that we've run through Neighborhood Services for many years. And it's also gonna establish a new program for both the city and, and the school district uh, to provide a, a science camp in the morning um, instructed by the school district and then uh, Neighborhood Services, Recreation and Park staff coming in to uh, make that a full day program. Perfect. And I guess my con last comment is, as a a frequent user of the railroad system at Howard's Park when I was a little kid, I have to thank you for all your efforts. Although right now I don't know how to go for the train if I hopped on, but nonetheless, though, I do appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been telling people that'll be my last shift is I'm driving the train around and I'm getting off the train and going home. So uh, I'll make sure you know so that you can be on with me. All right, doesn't look like there are any more comments. I just wanna say you guys are doing a, a great job. I think there's always room for improvement and we see that with what you're bringing forth um, to us today. Uh, hope I wasn't too hard, it's just my job to let you know what we hear in the community is to pass that on to make sure that we can try to implement those changes that the community members would like to see. And with that, Council Member Fleming. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it gives me such joy to know that Councilmember Alvarez was an tr avid transit user from such a young age. <laughs> you know, transit is really uh, near and dear to me, and I can see him making his transfer up there by the ponies. So with that, <laughs> oh boy, with that, <laughs> I'll bring a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa establishing new and revised fees within the city's fee schedule for the Recreation and Parks Department and in my great mercy, I will waive further reading of the I second. Okay. We have a first by Council Member Fleming and a second by Council Member Alvarez. And with that, Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote. 
Thank you, Councilmember Rogers. Aye. Councilmember Okrepke. Aye. Councilmember McDonald. Aye. Councilmember Fleming. Aye. Councilmember Alvarez. Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. Let the record show that passes with seven affirmative votes. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation and for sticking it out with us. Uh, moving on to item eight, which are our staff briefings for the night. Madam City Manager. All right, tonight we have two staff briefings. The first one, 8.1, is the 2024 Earth Day event in Courthouse Square. Okay. Oh. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and members of council. I'm here today. My name is Alicia Kulichi, and I'm the Research and Program Coordinator for Santa Rosa Waters Energy and Sustainability Division. And I am here to invite you all to our 15th annual Earth Day celebration. And it's happening on Saturday, April 20th, from noon to 4 p.m. at Old Courthouse Square. This is a free family-friendly festival that brings our community together through fun activities, performing arts, great food, and inspiring exhibits that, that raise environmental awareness. So for the live performances, this year we'll have the Pomo Dancers, the Taiko Drummers, Erica Ambrin, and King Dream Band. There will be eco-friendly activities for all, including our um, kids activities that will be brought to you by recreation and parks. They'll have some nature discovery tables, seed planting, relay races, and a lot more. There will also be free bike parking, and that'll be courtesy of Sonoma County Bike Coalition. We will also have the hydration station, which will provide ice cold tap water to the event goers. And our stormwater and creeks team will be there to provide pollution prevention tips, as well as our water use efficiency team that'll hand out, that'll be on hand with water smart tips, rebates, and programs. We'll also have an irrigation controller workshop, and that'll be from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., but registration is required for that, and you can find more info and register on srcity.org slash earthday. Classroom Safari, Classroom Safari will return again this year to provide education about wild animals and conservation. And there will also be free public transit on April 20th on Santa Rosa City Bus, Sonoma County Transit, and Petaluma Transit. This year, we are going to implement Sparkle Reusables, and this is a reusable foodware company. And what they'll do is provide plates, utensils, and cups to the food trucks, as well as the beer and wine tent. This will eliminate the need for single-use plastics, and it complies with the zero waste foodware ordinance. How it works is when an event goer goes up to the food truck, they'll order their plate of food, and for each plate of food they order, there'll be a $2 refundable deposit. They'll go to the tables, eat their delicious food, and then they'll return whatever foodware they received from the food truck to the Sparkle Reusables tent, and they'll, that's where they'll get back their deposit. And this will eliminate the need for any, any waste at all, so we're gonna try that out this year. And we're still looking for volunteers, so pre-event, um, which is 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. volunteers, as well as 4 to 6 p.m. If anyone wants to volunteer, you can find more info and volunteer at srcity.org slash Earth Day. And I hope you all can join us on April 20th from noon to 4 p.m. Thanks. I can take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members? Seeing none, thank you very much. And we'll public comment. Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 8.1 for the 2024 Earth Day event. If you'd like to provide public comment but have not provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podiums for this item. All right. Again, thank you very much for that briefing. Item 8.2, Community Empowerment Plan Update.
Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council. I'm Ana Horta, Community Engagement Manager with the Communications and Intergovernmental Relations Office. I will be providing you with a Community Empowerment Plan update. The Violence Prevention Partnership will be participating in several community events over the next month. On April 10, they will attend and bring the Mary Lou to the Richway High School Career Day at Richway High School from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., 325 Richway Avenue. On April 19, they will attend the Santa Rosa Community Health, Health Care for All Forum from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at 1300 North Dutton. On April 23rd, they will bring the Marilu to the Dale Multicultural Day at Roseland University Prep from 9 to 11 a.m., 1931 by Wana Drive. In addition, VPP will bring the Marilu to the Roseland Cinco de Mayo event on Sunday, May 5th from 2 to 7 p.m. The event will take place on Sebastopol Road between Dutton and West Avenues. Next, the Santa Rosa Fire Department is hosting Women in Public Safety Day on Saturday, April 27, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. The event will take place at the Santa Rosa Fire Department Training Tower on 2126 West College Avenue. This Educational Career Expo will offer live demonstrations and networking opportunities to encourage more women and girls to enter the field of public safety. For more information, the community can call 707-543-3500 or email fdoutreach at srcity.org. Lastly, the Santa Rosa Police Department is hosting the next group participating in the community police experience. The experience will consist of a session at various locations around the city. Plus, there will be a graduation ceremony on Thursday, May 30th from 6 to 9 p.m. at the City of Santa Rosa Utility Field Operations Building, 35 Stony Point Road. You can learn more about this program at srcd.org slash cpa. And that concludes my, the update. Thank you, and if you have any quest questions, let me know. Thank you for the presentation. Looking to council to see if there are any questions. Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate public comment? Thank you, Mayor. We are now taking public comment on item 8.2. If you are in the chamber and would like to provide public comment but, not have, but have not yet provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podium for public comment on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. All right, so just really quickly, and we'll go by hand raising just so I can take a pulse really quick. Who here from the public is here for item 15.1? Oh, sorry. Okay, 15.1 is the approval of a five year economic development strategic plan. All right, thank you. Anyone here for item 15.2, the South Santa Rosa Specific Plan Community Engagement? All right, anyone here for 15.3? And is anyone here for 15.4, which is the, a budget amendment, one-time budget funding? Okay, so let's go ahead and start with 15.3. Jason, as you're getting ready, we're going to go ahead and do consent. Madam City Clerk. Okay. <laughs> okay, item 13.1, resolution approval of a grant of easement to PG&E over a portion of Rincon Ridge Park. Item 13.2, resolution approval of professional services agreement with Applied Survey Research Inc. for Choice Grant Program Evaluation Services. Item 
Resolution, rescinding resolution number RES-2021-199 and adopting a revised resolution authorizing the submittal of an application requesting an amount not to exceed $11.36 million to the State of California Department of Housing and Community Development Development's Home Key Grant Program and authorizing the mayor or designee to execute the application of the Home Key documents. Item 13.4, resolution approval and issuance of a purchase order for the purchase of one 2028 Pierce Enforcer 107 foot aerial fire truck utilizing the pricing from the Houston Galveston area HGAC interlocal cooperative agreement number 10-2428 Pierce HGAC contract number FS12. Dash two three with Golden State Fire Apparatus Inc. Item thirteen point five resolution approval of First Amendment to Professional Services Agreement with BKF for additional design services associated with the Highway 101 bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing project. Item thirteen point six ordinance introduction ordinance entitled Pardon me, uh, Ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Ordinance 1544 to convert Riley Street between 5th Street and 7th Street from a one-way street to a two-way street. Item 13.7, Resolution, Transportation Development Act TDA, Article 3, Grant Application for Fiscal Year 2024 through 2025. Item 13.8, Ordinance Adoption Second Reading. Ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa adopting zoning code text amendments to Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code, Section 20-38, signs to provide clear standards for both business identification wayfinding and civic public amenity wayfinding in Section 20-70.020, Glossary to add definitions related to wayfinding signs, file number REZ23-009. Item 13.9, ordinance adoption, second reading, ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, amending Santa Rosa City Code, Title IX, Health and Safety Code, Chapter 9-22, bicycles, skateboards, roller skates, inline skates, and similar devices to allow scooters to operate on public streets, public alleys, and public gutters. The end. All right. Thank you very much. Looking to council to see if there are any questions from the consent items. Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate public comment. We are now taking public comment on item 13, the consent calendar. If you would like to provide public comment but have not provided your name or your speaker card, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approaching the podiums for consent. Thank you. And with that, I'll pass it over to Vice Mayor. Thank you. I'll make a motion that we approve items 13.1 through 13.9 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion made by Vice Mayor Sapp and a second by Council Member Rogers. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the... Thank you. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Okrepke? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That passes with seven affirmative votes. Thank you. And with that, our next item will be, and thank you all the staff that uh, stuck around. Thank you very much. Um, our next item will be 15.3. Madam City Manager. Item 15.3 is a report item. Jennings Avenue at grade bicycle and pedestrian railroad crossing real property license agreement with the Sonoma Marin Area Trail Rail Transit District, SMART. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. I'm Jason Nutt, I'm Assistant City Manager. I'm joined today by Adam Abel, our Assistant City Attorney, uh, and we're gonna walk you through the, uh, a presentation relating to negotiations that we've been having with SMART over a real property license agreement uh, that might allow us to proceed with an at-grade crossing at Jennings Avenue. Just to provide a fairly quick uh, background, I know that it's late, so I won't belabor. Uh, we did start this back in 2008 with the passage of Measure Q. Uh, 
it uh, was ultimately identified that there would be a north station located in Santa Rosa. Uh, in 2012, Council adopted the North Station Area Plan, which proposed the Jennings Station to be located at Guerneville Road rather than at Jennings Avenue. Uh, and ultimately, uh, we moved to uh, a request from Council that City staff work with SMART on the development of, an, of a crossing at Jennings Avenue. Uh, so that we could fulfill the bike and ped master plan component of including a comprehensive east-west facility that would ultimately connect uh, the junior college district uh, with uh, the west side of town along Jennings Avenue. In 2016, uh, we were granted an approval by the California Public Utilities Commission uh, to add a, a, an at-grade crossing at this particular location. Uh, since that date, we've been working with SMART to try to accommodate a potential agreement that would allow us the, the opportunity to build a crossing at that location, but it has required two extensions of our approval by the California Public Utilities Commission. And in August of this last year, we submitted a third request uh, to move that um, further along. Uh, Judge, Administrative Law Judge Kelly at the California Public Utility Commission did uh, hear our request and agreed to delay proceedings while the city and SMART proceeded with a level of negotiation hoping to come to resolution. Just a quick little bit of background, and I did notice as I looked through these slides earlier, the red lines and the, and the yellow dot actually got shifted as we were putting this on the slide. Uh, this is an, an attempt to demonstrate and show the half a mile detour that resulted from SMART having closed the unofficial crossing at Jennings Avenue uh, in advance of starting active rail service. Uh, that was important from the perspective of public safety to ensure that we had a safe space where we weren't putting individuals at, at risk uh, while we were starting that service. Uh, it was intended between the agreement of the city and SMART it would be temporary as a measure simply to provide for immediate public safety while a permanent crossing is approved uh, and ultimately constructed. I want to provide just a quick overview of the project that's been proposed. Uh, this is the at-grade crossing in plan form. Um, it shows many of the features that are included to try to protect community members who, you, who wish to utilize this particular crossing. Um, it also provides you with a quick demonstration when we talk about or when you read in the proposed drafts the term license area, we would anticipate that what you see on the screen screen within the unshaded areas would constitute more or less the license area uh, that will ultimately show up as Exhibit A in the proposed agreement. From a uh, photo simulation perspective, this would be Jennings Avenue looking east. Uh, so the type of improvements that we're looking at from a bike and ped perspective, uh, just so you have some care, uh, some idea of the improvements that are being proposed. Now, following the CPUC approval, we went through many different iterations of conversations with SMART. How are we going to accomplish this? Uh, could we accomplish it? Ultimately, we were informed by SMART that they were no longer supportive of an at-grade crossing, and we spent many days, hours, and weeks trying to contemplate how we might find uh, a common ground to keep this moving forward. Um, with the arrival of the new general manager, uh, we spent time recognizing and talking with one another that this was likely the one issue in the relationship between SMART and the city that was, uh, that was difficult. Uh, and we both made a commitment that we would strive to, uh, to complete this particular project. The way we were going to do that is we came to a common agreement. The common agreement said this is how we were going to embark on negotiating a path forward. And with that, uh, we determined that uh, 
we would all, we would both mutually agree that an agreement can be reached, that there was a place that both the city and SMART could arrive at that would allow this to move forward. We also ended up agreeing that SMART doesn't particularly want this, but they are, but they are going to be willing to get to that place. We also acknowledge that the city really wants it, and we may have to accept a higher level of responsibility for the, the occurrences at, that, that may happen at that particular crossing. To embark on this, we knew that we needed to do something we haven't done since, we hadn't done since 2016, which is to have a public meeting. Uh, actually giving us the opportunity to stand in front of the constituency, uh, in front of those individuals who have been proponents for this project for a long time, and, and provide them, one, an update on the program that the city has been working on, and two, give SMART a public time to be able to describe why they've expressed opposition to the at-grade crossing, and to be able to propose an alternative to that at-grade crossing. Uh, actually, I thought the meeting was uh, well attended. I thought it, uh, it went fairly well. Uh, but I think, but the feedback that we heard from the constituency that night was, uh, we told you we want an at-grade crossing, we'll want to continue to have an at-grade crossing, and that is uh, the final stance moving forward. As we started seeing that we needed to apply for a new extension uh, coming up in 23, um, the general manager and I sat down and began to discuss how we might uh, create a license agreement that could get us closer to this. The key for me was the easiest place for us to start was to, was to ask SMART to prepare their, the, the first draft. Um, if they were going to be the, the entity that doesn't want us there but committed to helping us find a place, they should uh, prepare the language that we were going to start from. And in January, I'm sorry, in September, uh, they did provide us their first initial draft. Uh, and since that time, we've met with them almost monthly to talk about various iterations, to talk about specific language, uh, to discuss why we have a specific position one way or another. Uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, we are looking at a final draft from SMART dated January 26th, 2024, and that's where we're going to be starting the discussion tonight. With that, the key piece for us to remember as we move forward is the January 26th draft is, at this point, the one draft that has the, mo the highest potential of achieving success at getting the Board of Directors to sign off on the city's proposal for an at-grade crossing. Uh, and so we're going to walk through some of the areas of concern. Uh, we're going to highlight some of the sections that uh, our city attorney's office have uh, provided uh, to uh, that, that our city attorney's office has asked us to really identify and, and highlight so that we know the level of concern, uh, that we know um, some of the nuanced language that results in um, it challenges from a legal perspective and what it might mean for us moving forward. In particular, we're going to start with uh, Section 14. Section 14 deals with assumption of risk and liability. Uh, what this particular section does in the draft they provide is it, ass it assigns and assumes all risk and liability uh, based on the location, placement, design, and establishment of the crossing uh, would, be, uh, would be borne by the city. Uh, and it uh, further identifies uh, a level of difficulty for SMART uh, in the fact that they use the term gross negligence for the first time and willful misconduct. And where that's significant, and I'm going to hand it over to uh, Assistant City Attorney Abel here shortly to discuss the, 
why those those words are important but it does ultimately transfer risk to the city even even where smart's sole ordinary negligence has occurred When we look at item uh, at section 15B, which is the indemnification provision relating to licensed property, so again, we're talking about that license area. Um, it identifies that the city is responsible for all losses from claims, suits, actions arising from any cause whatsoever, except to the extent that such claims shown by a non-appealable judgment. Again, the non-appealable judgment is a term that Adam will provide a little bit more detail about and explain the significance of, of how a non-appealable judgment impacts the city when it comes to the cost of providing legal services uh, for SMART in defense of their particular case uh, should they be uh, should they be identified as being uh, negligent or grossly negligent or, or with willful misconduct. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam to go through this next piece. So just a little bit of additional information and good evening, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor and Council Members. So I'm, I'm really gonna be discussing SMART's January 26th agreement and then uh, pivot to a alternative agreement that Jason and I put together and the reason why we created a secondary agreement. So just to piggyback off of what Jason said, under the agreement that SMART has written, we do essentially assume all risk and we have no control over minimizing the city's risk because of the very specific terminology that the smart lawyers have crafted into this agreement. To be specific, they have what's called but for location language. In other words, their position is if any incident claim fatality arises because of the city's desire to put this crossing at Jennings Avenue, the city holds the bag. In other words, even in a situation, I'll give the most simplistic example, a train operator falls asleep at the wheel and strikes a pedestrian crossing at Jennings Avenue. Under the agreement as authored by smart staff, we're on the hook for that. And we can't control that because we don't work for SMART. It's worse, however, because of the but for location. So based upon the language that they have crafted, taking that same simplistic example, the train operator falls asleep at the wheel, but strikes a pedestrian, uh, as an example, a half mile on the tracks in either direction. If that pedestrian who was killed entered the smart tracks at Jennings Avenue, the way the agreement is crafted, we're on the hook for that fatality. As Jason indicated, the only exceptions in the SMART agreement where the city would not be legally responsible to pay any judgment for any property damage claim, uh, personal injury claim, fatality, is if after a final non-appealable judgment, which I will discuss in a minute, if there is a non final non-appealable judgment by the requisite court that SMART was grossly negligent or, willful mis or their willful misconduct is responsible for that claim. That is the only carve out where the city would not be responsible to pay any judgment. That said, the agreement is written in such a way that the city has an absolute duty to defend. And what that means is under any claim, the city has to defend and indemnify them, we will be required 
to retain outside counsel because they won't let my office do it because they will claim a conflict of interest. And unless and until uh, there is that final judgment, we are on the hook. And even when the court determines that smart, your reckless conduct or your willful misconduct is responsible for that claim, we still are on the hook for all of their attorney's fees and litigation costs. So we have no way to recoup our litigation costs, even in the most egregious contact, uh, conduct uh, on the part of SMART. The terminology, as, as Jason mentioned, gross negligence uh, is something that we uh, debated with uh, SMART over the, the, words, the word gross negligence and the word sole negligence. And the reason this slide is relevant, under California law, there's two forms of negligence. There's gross negligence, which is akin to reckless misconduct. And then there is ordinary negligence, which is really a reasonable person standard. The way the agreement has been drafted by SMART Again, the only carve out where the city would not be required to pay any adverse judgment is if their conduct was gross negligence or recklessness. So in other words, taking my hypothetical simplistic example where the train operator falls asleep at the wheel and kills somebody at Jennings Crossing or anyone who entered Jennings Crossing and got struck down the, down the, the tracks, that would be considered ordinary negligence. A train operator fell asleep. That's not reckless conduct. And so even in a situation like that where the city has no control over a smart operator falling asleep at the wheel, we're on the hook for that. So essentially, smart's position is we will accept, we smart will accept responsibility, although you're going to give us free legal representation. Uh, and, but we will pay the judgment so long as our conduct was reckless or willful. But if we were simply negligent and we are solely responsible for any property damage claim, personal injury, or fatality, you sit here on the hook, not only for the attorney's fees and litigation costs, but payment of any judgment. So turn to, turn to the... So what Jason and I did was come up with an alternative license agreement. The, the goal being to try to present something that we felt was more balanced. We recognize uh, that SMART has indicated they don't want this crossing and the city has indicated that it does have interest in the crossing. So we recognize that we weren't looking for a fair and balanced alternative, but certainly a balanced uh, alternative so that the city's exposure is limited. In other words, what we did with this uh, alternative language is we took out the but for location language so that the city's exposure is limited to the four corners of the proposed crossing. We're talking about a crossing at Jennings. We don't own or control the tracks that go for miles in either direction. And so we believe a, a balanced approach would be the city will assume uh, responsibility for anything that occurs within the four corners of that crossing. We also uh, felt that it would be a more balanced and reasonable approach that if there is a determination that what the, whatever hypothetical claim we can imagine was caused by SMART's sole negligence, SMART should be responsible for that. We have no control over SMART's negligence. But in order to make sure that the alternative uh, agreement was balanced and still uh, in favor of SMART from a liability perspective, we crafted it in such a way that the city would agree to defend and indemnify SMART even for their concurrent ordinary negligence. In other words, 
So long as SMART contributed to any hypothetical claim through ordinary negligence, the city would still defend and indemnify them. And we felt that was a much more balanced approach and would allow the city to control its risk to the only thing we can control, which is the, the crossing itself. Now, now I want to, um, I want to remind the council where we started, which was an agreement with SMART that we would come up with something that wasn't a no. And the negotiations that we had with SMART did start utilizing some of the language that's proposed in this revised agreement. And we were unable to negotiate or unable to land on some of those points. And the agreement that they presented to us in January was the best terminology that we were able to negotiate over the course of the last six months. As you've heard from the, the assistant city attorney, that agreement is certainly not what we would hope would be the end product and what you've what they've presented in the revised alternative is much more in alignment with what we hope we would get but that's not exactly what's on the table from smart that would be a, a counter proposal from the city and the and, and we just need to, to take that into consideration as we deliberate this um, I do believe that the general manager did what he could to try to come up with a reasonable solution. And when I say reasonable, it's reasonable because it's not the no that we started with two years ago. Um, there was an agreement that we would take on a higher level of responsibility and uh, that's why they ended up with the language they did. I think the revised language that we've crafted for a second alternative is something that's more in alignment with what makes sense on how we wish we would be proceeding. Uh, and it's something that we would, if council requested, would be presenting to SMART and the Public Utility Commission with some potential to continue negotiations. What that lands us with is a series of alternatives. It allows us to have council take the consideration of the draft that was presented to us by SMART. As I said, that, is, that was presented by SMART staff, prepared by SMART staff, uh, and has the, easy, the greatest potential to find success, even though it comes with the highest risk to the city. The second alternative would be, would be utilizing the draft and revised language uh, that Adam described for you, which is based upon SMART's template, but takes specific sections and alters that language that we feel is more balanced uh, along the way. Uh, I don't have confidence that SMART is going to accept those terms. Uh, but it does establish and set the stage for us to have potential additional dialogue as we get called back into a public hearing with the California Public Utilities Commission. And the third item here uh, is more of, a, more of a position of where we're at uh, in, for real. Um, and I know that it's unpopular, but the bottom line is, if we are unable to achieve a, a mutually agreed upon license between SMART and the city, the judge will retract the uh, crossing application and we will be back at square one where we were in 2015. Um, and I don't feel that if we can't come to an agreement, I don't feel like we wait for, that we need to wait for the judge to take that action. Uh, and so I've incorporated that here for your consideration, not because staff has determined it's the best course of action, but it is a rational course of action given where we're at in this program. And so that's why that has been included. Some of the parting pieces I just want to 
uh, throw out there before I let you all debate and ask questions. Um, one is there will come with this a construction agreement that we have yet to discuss with SMART. That construction agreement is going to be likely similar to the one we signed in 2017 uh, that went unsigned and unexecuted by SMART. Um, it will establish the terms and conditions by which the city pays for the construction of the facility. SMART will ultimately end up managing the contractor that will do that. Um, we anticipate that that's about a four and a half million dollar total construction project. Um, we, uh, and we have roughly about $1.1 million available in the account remaining from our earlier version of trying to get this uh, in the ground. Once constructed, this license agreement also establishes that there'll be an ongoing maintenance uh, a, a component of uh, our relationship. With the city's uh, agreement of either of these two uh, license proposals, um, we would take on 100% of the operation and maintenance. Now, SMART's not going to have us hire contractors. They're going to hire the contractors, and we're going to pay them for the services that their contractors are providing at this particular location. It means if something breaks, we'll be paying the bill for whatever breaks. Uh, and from a perspective, that's, that's only fair. It's, it's our crossing. We asked for it. We want to see that happen. Uh, and therefore, that's built into this as well, is that the city will take on that level of responsibility. Exhibit B, which is not in here today, um, but Exhibit B will outline with detail the, the areas that the city is responsible for and the areas that the at that SMART will be responsible for. Um, I've provided in the staff report an example of what could be included that are city and, and, uh, and smart responsibilities, but you need to know that comes with an annual cost uh, to the city as well. When we think about liability for any of these incidents, uh, the city has double checked uh, and this is covered under our insurance policy. Um, through our joint powers authority. Uh, we do have, uh, and, and Adam may be able to describe it in more detail, uh, we do have a uh, $1 million deductible in essence, uh, and that will be helpful as we move forward. Uh, that insurance premium will adjust based on the number and severity of claims that occur over the course of time at that particular location. So while we feel that we're in, that we're adequately covered from an insurance perspective at this point, uh, time will tell with this particular location as to whether or not there's adjustments that may have an increased or additional burden to the organization. If we move forward with this and if we're successful, one of the components we want to consider is requesting not just the standard extension from the administrative law judge, which the PUC typically issues a two-year extension, and that's what the last two extensions have been, but recognizing we have a budgetary shortfall, also recognizing that should we be successful coming to mutual agreement, this particular project would be very grant-worthy, but there's times any time we deal with competitive grants. We, we would likely need more time from the administrative law judge to complete this. The way an extension is written, all work has to be completed and the crossing has to be activated by the end of the extension in order to comply with the terms uh, that they've laid out. So I, wanted just, I just wanted to provide you that additional information uh, so that I've been clear on where the project currently sits and some of the additional components should we be successful moving forward. And with that, uh, Madam Mayor, I'll hand it back to you and Adam and I are here to answer any questions. Thank you. So thank you for the presentation, but also on top of that, thank you for all the work and hours that you both have put into to bringing this to us today. Um, and I know that there's a lot of other staff that have also helped and been supportive of you too. So I would like to thank them also. Looking to council to see if there are any questions. Councilman Krepke. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, so with that two year extension and, and what are the consequences? So let's say two years ends and we're 85% complete on the job. What, what's the consequence of that? Uh, 
My belief is, is if we're in that position, we're submitting a request for the administrative law judge to extend, showing progress. I don't see that they're going to deny us an extension of that. If in two years we have not broken ground, that's where my concern is, is if we're continuing to negotiate in one form or another, or if we're waiting on fulfilling a funding, that's where my area of concern is, and I, and I, and I don't have a good feel from uh, the work that I've had with the, or the, the experiences I've had with the administrative law judges as to whether or not they will continue to perpetuate additional extensions. And, and just one additional comment. I mean, if, if the two entities came to a meeting of the minds, they are typically two-year extensions, but when we go in front of Judge Kelly in the not-too-distant future, if it appears that we are close or we have a meeting of the minds, we will ask for an extension well beyond two years so we don't fall into that position. Okay. Um, in terms of the legal fees, just um, – can you confirm for me that while we would be responsible for the legal fees, we have no control over the legal team? That is absolutely true. And as I indicated, council member, they control the litigation. That's how their agreement is written. And there, there is an inherent conflict of interest for my office, my litigation team to defend SMART. They would never allow it. So they, we will have to agree on who they appoint as their litigators to defend any hypothetical claim, but they will control that litigation team and we will be paying the freight for it. And as we discussed, uh, absent any final determination of willful misconduct or reckless misconduct under their agreement as drafted, um, we're going to pay any judgment as well. And another concern that I have from a risk perspective is if their lawyers who the city is paying for are controlling that piece of litigation and as a fellow litigator if I know that my client's smart if the handwriting is on the wall from from that requisite court that it appears that the conclusion is going to be that the claim was caused by smarts gross negligence or willful misconduct they'll settle the case before we get the willful misconduct or reckless determination and we can't control that in which case in almost every situation we would be paying not only attorneys fees and litigation costs but any settlement or judgment okay in your experience as a litigator um what restrictions do you put on yourself when you know that Further fighting for maybe a just settlement, a settlement you think you might get, is too expensive to pursue. And by that I mean, if that restriction doesn't exist for SMART because they're not paying the bill, are they will? In your experience as a litigator, does that kind of free, in theory, the litigator, the litigators for SMART up to go as far as they want, even it's even it's for a dollar more? I mean, frankly, I deal with indemnity clauses all the time because I'm a <clears throat> thirty-year-plus litigator and. Uh, you know, Jason and I are well aware, although he's dealing with the general manager, we know that the smart attorneys are crafting the agreement. And I'm no dummy. I've been doing this for decades. And so I think it's crystal clear why they included the language that they did, which is so extremely troublesome to me as a litigator and somebody who defends the interests of the city. And whoever the city pays to defend smart's interests is going to take the same approach uh, with regard to their client smart against the interests of the city. Yeah, I guess the point I'm trying to get at is, is, is as you say, if somebody else is paying the freight, which I appreciate the double entendre there, uh, or the, the, the pun there with paying the freight, um, but if someone else is paying it, then who cares if you take longer, work more, or whatever, because your client's not paying, somebody else is. Right. Is that a rational assumption? Uh, uh, that is a rational assumption, and I, I, I would hope in my world that attorneys uh, spend the least amount to get the right result. But I, am, I have some real concerns the way this agreement is drafted. If an attorney is representing the interests of SMART, they have to do what's in the best interest of SMART. Mm -hmm. Now, they may also want to rack up attorney's fees as well, and as Jason indicated, uh, under our joint pool, the good news is it will cover 
any and all claims related to this crossing, but because of the fact we have a $1 million self-insured retention, but like for example, when I'm litigating on behalf of the city, I'm not charging the city attorney's fees, but when outside counsel does, that eats away at the $1 million SIR. So for example, in a hypothetical claim where we have to hire outside counsel to defend SMART and outside counsel spends half a million dollars in attorney's fees, there's only half a million dollars left of the city's SIR. The concern is that the pool, as Jason said, our pool, like any joint powers pool, they look at how many claims is an entity in their pool getting and what's the value of those claims. So it, there's going to be more claims. There's going to be uh, high payouts because the attorney's fees is going to cut into a good chunk of the city's underlying one million and uh, that could increase our rates significantly with our pool. So what you're describing is the loss ratio. They're going to look at the loss ratio. How much money we're getting versus how much we're paying out, which is a very common insurance carrier thing to do. Absolutely. Um, and I think our community is very well aware of how common that is for an insurance carrier to do that. Um, so you said, I want to be clear, you said our losses will be covered. Will the legal fees be covered? Have you confirmed that? Because those are two different things. Legal fees are not losses. Be, because of the fact that we have confirmed that our pool will cover any claims related to uh, this crossing if it is built, yes, the attorney's fees are covered, but it exposes the pool to higher payouts because of the fact that, again, I won't be able to defend SMART. so. Our, our million dollar SIR would only be for like expert costs, but because of the fact that we will have to pay outside counsel, that's going to take up much of what the city has to pay for the initial million, more payout by the pool, higher rates that we're going to suffer uh, as a consequence. All right, and seeing no additional questions from council members, Madam City Attorney, did you have something to say? I was just going to add uh, to what Assistant City Attorney Adam Abel said about the rates. Um, we would have in that situation where we have retained outside counsel to represent SMART, um, we would not have control that we would normally have over outside counsel um, that the city hires from time to time where we can review the bills and really make sure that um, the bill is being managed, the services are being managed. We would not have that ability. Our only recourse would really be a fee dispute where we would have to prove to the court that um, the fees were not reasonable. And so um, they would need to show that their fees are within the range of being reasonable, which is a, looks a lot different than being able to go through and actually manage a bill. So. Um, it, it, it isn't without boundaries, uh, council member. Um, they can't just charge anything they want and hand us the bill. There would be some um, reasonableness requirement on those bills, but again, it's a pretty difficult standard because we wouldn't be in the position to be really able to review them or review the entries. And in fact, we probably would also be in the litigation. Um, and so we, they would be litigating probably against us. And so we would also have the resources um, of defending the city, which would either be um, internal with uh, the team at the city attorney's office or um, outside counsel as well. So we essentially would, be footing a bill for um, for both defenses. Right. I, I'm not saying they'd be unreasonable billings. What I'm saying is in insurance claims, you get to a scenario where it's we're not going to spend $20,000 to get $50,000. But if you're not footing the bill for that $20,000, then you, it's a free $50,000. Correct. Correct. All right. Councilmember Krepke, we good? All right. No addition. Uh, Councilmember McDonald. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a question around, um, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. It's getting too late. Um, it was around the attorney fees, but that's okay. I'm gonna have to skip it. I apologize. All right. 
We will come back for uh, comments and to wrap it up after public comment. So with that, Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate public comment. Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 15.3. If you are in the council chamber and would like to make comment but have not yet provided your name or a speaker card, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. First speaker will be Victor, followed by James, then Alexa. Victor, are you in the room? All right, James, we'll move to you. Please go ahead, James. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, I thought someone else was before me. I'm James Duncan. I've been a party on behalf of the city in the underlying CPUC proceeding since 2015. I have written almost 40 briefs to maintain the city's standing to build the crossing against the opposition of SMART and the CPUC staff who wanted a crossing in the West End of Railroad Square area closed in exchange for Jennings. That was their only reason. I urge you to have confidence in the CPUC's judge. He's not only the current judge in the city's proceeding, he's also the judge in a proceeding that I have against SMART which is outside of the scope of the discussion this evening. So I wouldn't be hesitant to follow up with your proposed uh, proposition B, send it to SMART if SMART doesn't like it. You can explain to the CPUC's judge to his satisfaction what's going on here, and he can implement action to correct the situation. Also, you should be clear that the judge cannot act uni unilaterally. The commission itself, the five members appointed by the governor, are the ones who make the final decision. It's unlikely, given the trend over time, that they're going to um, knuckle under to SMART's demands. It's very possible that in the short term it will work out better for the city and worse for SMART, and in the long term, the voters of Santa Rosa may decide they don't need to fund SMART anymore if that's the way SMART's board is going to treat citizens here. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Alexa, followed by Chris, then Eris. Hi, I'm Alexa. I need to use the document camera, which I've never done before. Okay. Let me Do I just press switch this? it over and then it should pop up here on the screen and you just need to focus it. There's a little focus toggle. Okay, and sorry you could, about the delay. I know we've all been here forever. And you could flip on the light right at the top near the, um, there you go. That looks really unillegible. How do I focus it? Turn the dial. Does somebody know how to use it? Thank you so much. There's a focus button on there, Lon. I don't know if it's on the um, lens or on the, the base of the unit that will bring it into focus. Oh, that big button that says focus? Mm -hmm. You've got I'll it. I'll try that one. <laughs> Thanks. It was obviously you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alexa Forrester with Bikeable Santa Rosa. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor and Council. Um, I want to just share a couple maps that weren't in the presentation and also thank the staff for the incredible job that they've done advocating for the city at this. This is a stretch of the smart tracks. Um, these are the two crossings that currently exist. This is where there's currently no crossing at Jennings. Both of these are on our high injury network, which means that if we ask people to walk or ride their bikes there, they're likely to get injured. Um, and so there's really not safe crossing even a mile out of the way. I wanted to compare that to this same length of track just south of college down to Third Street. There are four at grade crossings. It's really hard for us to accept uh, arguments that this crossing would be unsafe when these four crossings are safe. This is mobility injustice manifest. The, this area of the city is free to move about their neighborhood. This area of the city is not. And if you doubt that people need to use this crossing, of course there's Cottingtown on one side and there's tons of services, restaurants, Target with household goods, but I just wanna focus on one destination. 
This is the Safe Routes to School creates these maps of uh, where the students that attend various schools live. This is um, Helen Lehman Elementary School. This is over 50 elementary school children that live to the east of the tracks and currently have no safe way to walk or ride to school. When we say we want this crossing, it's like saying we want to eat. Yeah, we want it, we also need it. People need to be able to move. And SMART has imposed a one mile long barrier on our community and they need to take responsibility for that. But you as leaders cannot give up on this crossing. It is not a want, it's a need. Thank you. And there. This on? Okay, there it is. Um, so I had a whole comment prepared about how important the crossing is. You guys know that our whole campaign exists to create a viable network for alternative transportation in the city. This is a really vital connection. I won't belabor that. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm a person, I'm an adult. This agreement is a giant middle finger <laughs> from SMART. And I don't think that they have stuck to the spirit of the agreement between uh, Assistant City Manager Nutt and uh, General Manager um, Cummins. So I think it's reasonable to continue to negotiate. I know the council's in a really difficult position, but I think it's really bad politics for the city and for SMART to ignore what the community is asking for here. It is not unreasonable. We've worked for it for 10 years. We need to keep working for it. We certainly should not give up and allow them to bully us into submission. So I don't know how we get there, but I think we have to keep fighting. I also want to encourage the council. There's a lot of talk about safety with this. I find a lot of the claims that SMART makes about safety specious for the reasons Alexa just highlighted. People could enter the track at any of those other crossings and get killed two miles down the track. So that's crazy. <laughs> But there's a lot of talk about the cost as well. And when I made comments earlier on the impact fees, I said we should think systemically. I think that is true in this case. So yes, we can avoid the headache and the cost of this crossing. But if we give up and we don't have this crossing, we're gonna have many, many more headaches, many, many more costs. In particular, this is not just about the people who will move across that track. People all across town will benefit from this crossing because of the reduced traffic burden on our streets, which cost us millions and millions of dollars a year that we do not have. So building this crossing, creating a viable network is a way to make our city work better for all residents, not just people in that area. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Eris. Harris Weaver, um, as executive director of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition, I get concerns about liability. We were threatened with a lawsuit in the past year, and it was uh, it was a pretty pretty distressing thing. Um, and I've been following this and being involved with this since 2017. I think you're entirely reasonable in submitting the revised agreement uh, that's more favorable to the city, that's more fair, and see what happens with it. For, for the life of me, I still cannot understand why after all of the CPUC um, decisions, I sat in some of those hearings, met with one of the previous administrative law judges. I don't get how SMART even is allowed to say no to this, given some of those previous rulings. Um, but I urge you to not stop. Uh, not go with option three to submit the revised version and I'll certainly be doing my uh, part to influence SMART um, to do the right thing here and stop obstructing this. As has been previously mentioned, this crossing is desperately needed. Their arguments are illogical. Their demands of view are unreasonable. And please, just don't let them get away with it. Don't let them get away with this. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the chamber wishing to provide public comment on item 15.3? Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Tess. I wasn't expecting to hear about this tonight and I wasn't anticipating to make a comment, um, but during my senior year at Sonoma State, I lived in the Annadale Apartments just off of range. Um, I lived there for 14 months with me, my partner, and my dog. 
and this was COVID, we had a dog, so we would take a minimum of one to two walks every single day, and so we would head to the corner of our street, go down Jennings, go up towards, uh, oh, up towards college, go down across the tracks and go up Dutton around college. And we would talk about how funny the end of Jennings was, especially when we got to the other side of the road, the tracks, and we realized that Jennings just went all the way through. And it was so, um, it blocks off entire communities from one another. Like there's a community health center, there's restaurants, the bank that I bank at was on the other side. Meanwhile, on my side of the tracks, there's like Whole Foods and Target and you're completely separated by, if you wanna go around a whole extra mile by foot. And I think that the community would really benefit from this. Hearing that this started in 2015 is wild because I would have benefited from this when I lived there. And a part of me feels like Smart's giving you the ring around and I wish that they would stop, but at the same time, the city has an obligation to its residents. And like, that's a very dense area where people deserve to be able to bike and walk and have access to the things they want. And so I hope that the city council and the city as a whole can do what they can because I would have enjoyed this when I lived there. And I know that people who still live there would love it whenever it comes to pass. Thank you. Mayor, I see no one else approaching the podiums for public comment on this item. All right, thank you. Uh, bringing it back to council for uh, final comments and we'll start with Vice Mayor Stapp. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you also for all the work that you've done. Um, what, a, what a long campaign. Um, You've laid out very clearly why the first option, the original option, is a tough one for the city to swallow, probably irresponsible. Uh, but you've come up with a really good second option. Maybe not ideal, it's not, our, it's not our, our dream language, but it's at least viable language. And it keeps, it, it puts the ball back in Smart's court and keeps the option for this project alive. Um, in addition, you've, you've underlined there that should SMART agree to this, as we hope, that there will be a need for this council, for this city, to find additional funding. I believe the amount is somewhere in the range of 3.4 million. Um, but again, given how important this project is to that neighborhood, I'm certainly supportive of finding that funding if and when the happy day arrives that, that SMART says, yes, this, this alternative language is viable. Thank you. Council Member Alvarez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Has, has anyone from SMART made an offer to come speak with, with uh, City Council and, and maybe hear from our constituents who, who are very passionate about this crossing? So I did have a conversation with the general manager last week. Uh, we discussed whether or not uh, someone from SMART would be in attendance today. Um, he did notify me that they would not be in attendance. Uh, he did mention to me earlier this week that they've received many uh, correspondence from community members over this specific issue. Uh, and uh, I anticipate uh, with their upcoming board meeting that there will be even if it's closed session, that there'll be an opportunity for community members to express their interests moving forward. At some point, uh, the Smart Board of Directors will likely have a, a public discussion, um, but I don't know the specific date and timeline for that. Thank you. Councilmember McDonald. Thank you, Mayor, and I did remember what I was going to talk about, so I appreciate you coming back to me. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was around the gap in funding that we don't have to actually do the crossing. So um, if the judge was to come back in our favor and allow us to start moving forward, um, what are the chances of us being able to get potential grant money to be able to do a project like this? So the concern is that um, around the budget for how much it would cost to actually do this pr this plan. So those of you who've worked with me long enough, you know that I'm, I'm pretty optimistic when it comes to our chances at getting grants. That doesn't mean I'm always successful. Uh, I actually think this is a very good uh, potential for this crossing. I, I think um, what you've heard from the speakers is true and real. And I think the, the 
granting agencies will see that as being a value and a benefit. Um, with that said, uh, we've had a number of projects we've submitted for multiple times that have an equal value and benefit to our community, and we've either been unsuccessful because of the level of competition, or it's taken two or three times for us to see success. So while I believe this is a very good project, uh, we would be banking on a one and done, that we'd be successful on our first go, um, if we're looking at grant funds. Uh, I, I, do, I do have fears, and I understand what the Assistant City Attorney said, that, that if we have an agreement, the likelihood that the judge is going to cut us off may be slim. I do think that there is still going to be a timeline to that, uh, and it will likely come in the form of the city will need to look at other funding sources other than waiting for some grant money to show up. Uh, but I think out of the gate, if the decision is to proceed and if we can get agreement with SMART, that should be our first initiative is to find a grant source that could that we could apply for to try to fill that gap before we look to um, reprioritize our current capital improvement program or to uh, adjust or delay some projects that may be coming up in the queue. Thank you. All right. Um, Councilmember Fleming. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for all your years dedicated to this and to both of you for your attention to uh, the city's liability in this situation. You know, one of the things that I think that the public who has for far too long waited for this crossing to be available does, you know, may not see is how much SMART is a benefit in terms of um, bringing money into the city for housing projects. We've gotten a number of housing projects along the corridor financed and funded in particular affordable projects and other other grant monies because we have this asset and yet while well, it brings so much good for these transit development projects it, it is this stranglehold on not just the northeast but connecting the northeast or the northwest but connecting the northwest to the northeast and when I look at this project, you know, that we've all been working on the overcross for years, I think, well, what good is this overcross if you can't get across the tracks? And who does this overcross benefit if you can't get across the tracks? And so while when I read the language in the proposal, I'm not thrilled with it. I'm not thrilled with the fact that the city has to come up with this funding when in the past we've had grant funding that more than doubles what we will need in this situation. I think that the public has been really clear about what it is that our community wants. And I think that we have a responsibility where we're here as representatives of the public to deliver in as responsible a manner as we can. And so you have my full support to go forward with this, to negotiate to the best of your ability with SMART, and to bring us as reasonable a deal as we can that ends this, this um, unnecessary divide in one of our most valuable communities in the city of Santa Rosa. So thank you and um, good work. Oh, Krepke. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, AC, I'm not, you said something earlier that um, I wanted to follow up on that it just kind of sparked something that I may have heard a little while ago. You said that at some point SMART sealed up the makeshift crossing can you, what do you mean by a makeshift crossing? So there was a, a point in time, and actually I could probably turn to Mr. Duncan and he could give me the exact date. Uh, there was a point in time when the county was looking to construct and expand Guerneville Road. Uh, at that point in time, the county and the city jointly agreed to release the current and existing Jennings Avenue crossing of the tracks to gain the Guerneville Road. And at that point in time, that actually, from a legal perspective, closed the Jennings Avenue crossing. That's why we had to apply for permission from the Public Utility Commission to create a new crossing. In the interim, the roadway, the crossing itself was gone. There were barricades or uh, uh, guardrails at both ends of the road in approaching the tracks. 
but individuals on the order of about 100 a day uh, were walking over, were carrying their bikes, were carrying strollers. Um, so the term unofficial crossing is they used it, they used the specific state, that specific location, but it had no standing when it came to the Federal Railroad Administration or the California Public Utilities Commission until we received the approval recently. And with the closure or the fencing that was placed there, it prohibits those folks from using it as an unofficial crossing today. Okay, so I, I guess my comments would be this. Um, that informs me a lot more than, than legalese um, that this is a dire, dire need for this community, for this area, in this neighborhood. Um, because if they're willing to carry bikes across train tracks and, you know, in, in, let's be honest, unsafe conditions, then it's not because they're lazy, it's because it's needed, right? That's, it's not because, oh, I just want to take a shortcut, it's because it makes sense, it connects communities, and they want something, they want something they can use. Um, so I know I harped on the, the, the liability and, and the legal fees, and that's because uh, I agree with some of our, our community members and some of my colleagues that number one is just not an option for me. Um, and because of what you just said, I think number three is not an option for me. Um, number two, I know there's a lot of if-thens, and I know that um, we have to ideally hope for um, grant funding and that if that doesn't come through, we have to have some real honest discussions about where those, uh, um, those, uh, those funds come from, um, what projects get prioritized or not. However, um, because I've been called pessimistic and persnickety by my colleagues in the past, I'll, I'll err on the side of hopefulness for this, um, that we can get that grant, <laughs> that we can get that grant. Um, also hedging my bet that there, we may have to have some hard discussions, but for now, I, that's the pathway that I feel most comfortable with. All right, we're all getting tired. Okay, so um, I, in addition to thanking staff, I wanna thank uh, members of the public that have consistently came uh, to council, member, uh, council meetings and told us uh, what they needed, why they needed it, and why it was important. It is very important for us to hear from you, um, and your persistence is golden. So thank you very much for continuing to, to come and tell us what it is that you need. And with that, I will hand it over to Council Member Rogers, but I do want to know how old he was when we started this. <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> I certainly had fewer gray hairs, uh, and Jeff forgot to mention wet blanket, which is my favorite way to describe him. Um, I'll be really brief. Uh, I think folks know uh, where I've been on this issue. Uh, I, too, lived in the Annadale Apartments in 2018 and 2019, uh, worked for the State Senate when we were first uh, advocating for, uh, with SMART's help, for the crossing, uh, and I've seen this all the way through, and I just want to thank folks who have stuck with this to continue to fight for it. Um, we are going to keep moving it forward. Uh, Jason was very diplomatic in how he approached uh, many of his descriptions of the discussions, uh, so I'll be less. The CPUC has said this is a safe crossing. The CPUC has told SMART, you have to build it. They told them again, you have to build it. They told them a third time, we really mean it, you have to build it. Uh, the public's interest has not weaned uh, from lack of action from SMART. Uh, and I think that part of the problem has been a history up until this new general manager, and I've got to give Eddie a lot of credit, he's been willing to have harder conversations with the board, uh, but previously this was classified as an operations issue, uh, which meant that it was completely shielded from policy discussions, shielded from board members having to take a difficult vote. And I think when you have been told for a decade at this point that the crossing is unsafe and that elected officials who vote for it are going to be in the paper if something happens to a kid crossing, that's pretty powerful to get people to not do anything. Uh, but the reality, as you heard, is that families have been impacted by not being able to have this crossing. 
Uh, folks are taking a riskier, less safe path to be able to get around in our community, and it's time for some courage. Uh, the city is moving forward with an indemnity agreement that makes our city attorney, I know, a little uncomfortable, uh, and we're putting our skin in the game, and SMART needs to meet us uh, here, not in the middle, because in the middle would not be this, it would be what we originally proposed, but at least certainly recognizing that the city is taking on a lot of liability to try to deliver for our constituents what they have habitually been asking for. And I know uh, Eris and her Marin counterparts are going to flood the next smart board meeting to tell folks uh, what we think of this in Sonoma County. With that, I will move to direct the city manager to one, negotiate and execute, subject to approval as to form by the city attorney, a real property license agreement in a form substantially the same as attachment two to the staff report for this item, but also including complete versions of exhibit A and exhibit B that are substantively similar to the description of those exhibits in the staff report, and two, notify SMART and the CPUC regarding this council action and waive further reading of the text and not in legalese, that means option two, uh, the revised language being proposed by Adam and by Jason. And thank you both so much for your work on this. Second. Second. We have a motion made by Council Member Rogers and a second by Council Member Alvarez. And I would like a nod from the city attorney before we proceed. I have no changes, but thank you for asking. Thank you very much. And with that, Madam, oh gosh, it's so late. Um, <laughs> Madam City Clerk, may you please call the roll. Thank you. Council Member Rogers. Aye. Council Member Okrepke. Aye. Oh. <laughs> Council Member McDonald. Aye. Council Member Fleming. Aye. Council Member Alvarez. Aye. Vice Mayor Stepp. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. Let the record show that passes with seven affirmative votes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, public here for any more items? Nope. Yes. Nope. Okay. Um, see, we used to go a lot later and we got spoiled. So now. So I know they used to go a lot later. So uh, we'll go up to item uh, 15. Point one, and we'll I'll hand it over to Council Member or Vice Mayor Stapp. Item 15.1 is report approval of a five-year 2024 to 2029 economic development strategic plan. Good evening, or rather good night, Madam Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, members of the council. I am not Jill Scott, and if she's listening, uh, we, we hope that uh, she has a speedy recovery. My name is Darielle Dunstan, I'm the Assistant City Manager, um, and my colleague here, Director Osborne, will be giving a presentation, but before he opens, I do just want to acknowledge that um, this strategic plan before you is a long time coming. Um, we have deliberated on this ad nauseum, uh, and we believe that this incorporates all of you all's feedback to date, um, as well as our partner agencies, not only in the region, but with the state. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge uh, the work of the incredible team uh, not only that is currently with us, but those who have gone on to other agencies. I do want to call them out by name. Uh, Raisa De La Rosa, Claire Hartman, uh, Rafael Rivera, who is still with us, but also Tara Thompson, and Jessica Rasmussen. Um, without their contributions, um, we would not be able to deliver this report to the extent that it is. 
uh, and we are so excited to finally be presenting this final strategic plan um, because we're eager to hit the ground running and get to work. So without further ado, I will pass it to my colleague, Director Osborne. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the council. I will be respectful of the lateness of the hour and move through the content as quickly as possible. Um, uh, this is actually a really exciting event for us. So the, the five-year strategic plan really is going to set our focus from an economic development strategy for the next five years. And really, it, there was a lot of work put into this over the course of the last few, um, as Mr. Dunson mentioned. Um, over the last year, the Economic Development Subcommittee has really helped form this. Uh, there were four or five occasions where this was discussed in front of the Economic Development Subcommittee. Uh, what was also brought to the Council as a study session in December of last year. And really, we're focusing on three main pillars that you'll see is the theme of this strap plan. Uh, so since the study session, uh, really what we've been working on is really aligning with our regional partners, um, Sonoma County Economic Development Board. Um, we have Sonoma County Tourism, Santa Rosa Metro Chamber, and Visit Santa Rosa have all informed this document. And really what we're trying to do is align language, understand regionally how we're moving things in tandem. Um, so we have a more holistic strategy for not only Santa Rosa, but the county as a whole. And that was really an important part to this. Um, and of course, when, when we're dealing with really general information in basic buckets, you know, the important piece is the aesthetics of a document of this nature. Uh, so um, Director Peterson from our communications and intergovernmental team uh, really put a lot of work into the design of this document. And as we move this forward, that design will change. Uh, we will fresh images, we'll change colors. Um, there, I did notice there was one slight typo right after that. We'll be fixing that as well after the uploading, excuse me. Um, but I think the important point is the content, the objectives and the strategies we want the council to inform moving forward. So those will hold over the five-year plan. Um, very important for us to really align with mission, vision, and values throughout the city. Uh, so the council goal statement, economic and community vibrancy, sustain and develop a diverse and thriving economy that benefits Santa Rosa residents and businesses, contributes to the community economic health while preserving historical and cultural integrity. Really try to align the objectives with this. Um, our also general Santa Rosa mission statement, provide high quality public service and cultivate a vibrant, resilient, livable city. Very important to the document. Um, also, an interesting timing of events. We're moving forward with our general plan adoption, and as we align our themes in the general plan with our economic development strap plan, really what we see is live, work, and recreation becomes the, the, the core functions of this document. Uh, so as we went down this road, we presented this to the um, council during the study session. Uh, we did surveys to understand what the community wanted to see in this plan. Uh, we received over 600 respondents in that survey. It was performed both in English and Spanish. And the themes generally from business owners and residents really were prioritizing housing and affordability. And I don't think that's a surprise with what we've seen come up in other areas. Um, as the next priority, business owners um, selected business development, um, whereas non-business owner selected equity and inclusion as their secondary. So one of the main pieces to this document is demographics. These are fluid. They do fluctuate. Um, we will be updating this with time. Um, so we have a total currently of um, around 8,500 businesses. Uh, that really uh, falls into a few different major categories. Retail trade um, is our biggest. Uh, healthcare is our next, uh, to the tune of 15 and, uh, 16 to 15, excuse me. Uh, public in administration and accommodations and food, uh, professional, scientific, and tech are, are the other factors. Um, what we see is an employment rate of 4%. Uh, based on more recent information, we assume that will be dropping here in the very near future. Um, we have a labor force participation rate of um, almost 66%, and our labor force of those 65 and older is a little over 18%. So we'll also produce demographics based on the fabric of the community. Um, we have uh, almost 36% of our residents um, are of Hispanic origin. Uh, we have a median age of almost 39. Um, our per capita income is around 48,000, and we have a little over 23% of residents have a bachelor's degree, and our median home price is hovering around 760,000. 
So with the document, um, and we wanted to show some of the images, uh, we're really trying to make impactful statements with some of this, make a very attractive document, but this really focuses on our three main pillars. And the first is business growth, economic vibrancy and resiliency is second, and community investment is third. Uh, business growth, and we'll talk about this in future slides, really focuses on small, small business and big business support, uh, retention and attraction. Um, economic vibrancy is really just the investments we're making in the community and the overall impact infrastructure. Um, and then community investment really is our upstream approaches. Um, a lot about child care and labor force and, and that will play out in that pillar. So business attraction and retention really falls into two categories um, and we've separated it out recognizing that there are different tools in the toolbox that maybe have, may have to be utilized for the different categories. Um, we're really trying to create a big business and middle business a retraction, retention, and expansion program. Um, and that is really coupled with small business support. Um, and being proactive, going after big businesses, understanding big business needs, understanding how you would develop incentive programs around that is very different than small uh, supporting our small businesses and understanding that it may be sign ordinances or it may be smaller things that they're dealing with to expand their business. Um, so this is all about separating our staff to be able to cover those two buckets. Um, and it really it creates fiscal stability for the businesses. Um, it supports a thriving workforce. Uh, we support and grow our small businesses. Um, we also create opportunities for entrepreneurship. Um, we understand remove barriers for immigrant, BIPOC, and women-owned businesses. And I think it's important to note that this will be a study that's going out in the very near future to set our base for those, those individuals participating in those businesses. So economic vibrancy and resiliency is the next pillar. Um, and this is really about creating a vibrant and livable city. Um, and it's about infrastructure and economic accelerators. So a big component to this is bolstering our downtown. Um, and a lot of the initiatives that went into that will continue those moving forward. Um, it's increasing the revenue of existing business. Uh, it also gets into really an infrastructure piece of that. Uh, how do we create walkable neighborhoods? How do we create those um, business centers that focus on multimodal? Um, um, and how do we really promote and enhance climate action goals and sustainability principles. And our final pillar is about community investment, and this is really how we invest in the people and the upstream approaches. Um, so it focuses very heavily on some of the diverse needs of the community. Uh, child care is a big component of that. Uh, we've, we've played that out already with some of the initiatives that we've done with our ARPA programs and how we've uh, created service fee reductions for child care facilities. Um, but that's a really critical piece to that. Um, strengthening early education and understanding how to build that workforce um, and providing the resources for individuals that need that child care care to work within the city is incredibly important. So that gets us to, to implementation. Um, really what we're looking at is obviously the, the implementation will be over a five-year period. Um, most of what we see today it develops goals and strategies and metrics. Uh, we want implementation will be a staff-driven approach and we need to be very nimble. Uh, so we'll be over the course of the next year aligning our staff to meet the goals of this, uh, this strategic plan. Um, but to be able to report out what we're looking at is developing tracking mechanisms, reporting structures, um, but then also having regular updates with the council on where we are in year one. Um, and just the envision with year one or the vision of year one, it's obviously the organization is staffing, a lot of focus on big business support and retention. Um, and I think that's really understanding the businesses that exist that aren't necessarily necessarily in Santa Rosa and how do you go after them and bring them in, understanding those incentive programs and starting to shift our resources to that. Um, but then also being nimble to be able to still handle the small business support as well as, well as the upstream approaches. Uh, so we'll be laying out the staff, uh, there will be a five-year implementation plan and we'll be looking at ways to do dashboards and metrics but also reports out to the council. So with that, that brings me to the conclusion. So our recommendation today is that the council adopt our five-year strategic plan, and I would be happy to answer any questions the council may have. Thank you both, and I'll look to my colleagues for questions. Councilmember McDonald. More just a comment. I just want to say thank you so much for the, st the strategic plan that um, lists out the goals, but then also lists out the action steps within the plan. So I appreciated the time that it took to do that, and then it really helps us understand what you're doing to um, actually achieve all the goals. So I just want to compliment you more than anything. Thank you for the work on this, and I'm excited to see it done too. Any other questions? All right, Madam City Clerk, let's go to public comment. 
We are now taking public comment on item 15.1. If you're in the chamber and would like to provide public comment but have not provided your name or speaker card, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Vice Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podiums for public comment on this item. All right, back to council. Any comments? Councilmember Council Member Rogers? Yeah, just a, a quick thank you to all the staff that have worked on this. Uh, we've done a couple of study sessions. We also did, I think, five different meetings for the economic development, <coughs> excuse me, some committee meeting. Um, I want to thank my colleagues who served on that as well. And then I know that they're not in the room. Uh, many of the folks who partnered with us and spent a lot of time walking through uh, how best to support economic development. Um, and I also want to just really acknowledge that Santa Rosa is one of the few cities that when we talk about economic development, pull in things like childcare and pull in things like housing and other types of issues that cross uh, many different spectrums in our community. Uh, and I appreciate the council's willingness to take a holistic approach to that. And I'm really excited to see this across the finish line. Thank you, Mayor Rogers. I just want to say great job for those of you that are still here. Thank you for the presentation. And for those of you that are not, it is definitely a village effort. Thank you. And I'll just add um, as my final comments that this, it, it's hard to think of a more important topic for the city right now. For all the discussion that we're having about, about budget issues, this is the long-term fix. We've got to grow the pie. Um, and so I'm, I'm very glad this is a focus. And on the subject of metrics, when we have those developed, uh, I, I at least would be interested in more ref, more frequent report outs to keep this you know top of mind for for the council in terms of what what strides we're making in the areas of economic development locally. All right, and with that, can I have a motion? Yeah, uh, just real quick um, to echo Council uh, Councilmember Rogers. Um, thoughts. Uh, thank you to everybody who participated in this. Um, ACM Dunson, thank you for mentioning my name. I think that's very important. There's a lot of heavy lifting by a lot of people for a long time on this. And while the three of us uh, on the Economic Development Subcommittee know this, um, we'll call it intimately, uh, thanks to the, the numerous times we've seen it, um, I think this short presentation does a little bit of a disservice to how cool of a project this was to undertake. Um, this is one of the first meetings I had as a council member and to be able to spitball about, you know, protecting cultural identity, um, uh, child care, sports tourism, um, the idea of uh, things like attracting businesses and letting building their own um, housing for the, on, on their own campus. Like having those kinds of conversation is kind of like what local government, like really gets you motivated as, a, as someone in local government because that's like the cool stuff you really get to do. And uh, I really appreciate everybody uh, putting their, I don't want to, I hope no blood, but I'm sure there was maybe some sweat and tears into this. Um, so I really do appreciate it. Uh, and with that, I'll move to adopt a, by resolution a five year 2024 to 2029 economic development strategic plan and wait for the reading of the text. Second. Second. <laughs> All right, we've got, we've got a motion by Councilmember Krepke. Who, who wants credit for the second? I, I think Roger's got it. Wh which one? <laughs> All right, we're going to give the second to Councilmember Rogers. Um, Madam City Clerk, want to call the vote? Thank you, Councilmember Rogers. Uh, Councilmember, <laughs> pardon me. Um, thank you, Councilmember Okrepke. Aye. Councilmember McDonald. Aye. Councilmember Fleming. Councilmember Alvarez. Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. Let the record show this passes with six affirmative votes. Thank you. Let's move on to item 15.2. Thank you, team. Item 15.2 is a report, South Santa Rosa Specific Plan Community Engagement Strategy and Engagement Advisory Committee. Committee. Um, yeah, mm, let me start over. So report, <laughs> report item, South Santa Rosa Specific Plan Community Engagement Strategy and Engagement Advisory Committee Formation. Uh, 
Uh, thank you and good evening, Mayor Rogers, members of the council. Uh, I'm Jessica Jones, Deputy Director of Planning. Um, with me is Connor McKay, Senior Planner. Um, we also have here in the chambers um, Jane Riley with Four Leaf, who is our consultant for this project. Um, Connor is going to give the presentation. Good evening, uh, Mayor Rogers and members of the council. Um, so yeah, the South Center Specific Plan Community Engagement Strategy, we're gonna go into some background on the specific plan itself. Um, so the South Center is a specific plan um, was, uh, is funded by a grant from the Metropolitan Transportation Commission Association of Bay Area Governments. And we are preparing a specific plan and environmental impact report in South, the South Santa Rosa area. Um, this document will address planning concepts such as land use and circulation and assess infrastructure needs such as roads, water, and sewer, and also, like I said, um, prepare an associated environmental impact report pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act. So throughout this process, um, we want to ensure the community's vision for the plan area is incorporated into the goals and actions and policies, and the community engagement strategy is our roadmap to achieving that. Here we have a graphic that shows the plan area for the South Santa Rosa specific plan. It encompasses approximately 1,900 acres, 500 of which are in city limits, and the remaining are unincorporated. Um, as I mentioned, the community engagement uh, strategy, or the commu community engagement is <coughs> a critical component of the success of this specific plan. And the strategy Excel itself, which is included as attachment three, um, identifies several examples of various approaches to community engagement and has been designed to solicit participation from a wide variety of folks in our community. Um, the overall goals of the community engagement strategy, um, we're trying to emphasize that the city's approach to engagement reflects a partnership and a commitment to plan with the community and not for the community. Um, our engagement aims to recognize and remove the barriers to participation in the planning process, um, specifically for people of color, seniors, the youth, and people with limited English proficiency. Um, another huge goal that will inform how we conduct this uh, engagement is that we're trying to meet people where they gather already and not invite people to come out and meet, meet us where we're at. And you'll see that um, exampled in some of the events that are included in the strategy itself. Um, here are some of the methods that we are planning to conduct our community engagement. Um, I just want to highlight a few that are on this list and that are our, um, kind of just referenced um, on Ash Wednesday, which was February 14th. Um, we conducted some outreach at the St. Rose Church for the Ash Wednesday service. Um, we engaged with over 200 attendees of the Ash Wednesday uh, service and provided flyers and had some brief discussions as folks were entering and exiting the service about the kickoff of the specific plan process. Um, this Saturday, I'm very excited to join the Sonoma County Regional Parks and volunteers at the Andy Lopez Unity Park Volunteer Day. Um, I plan to show up nice and early and greet um, volunteers as they arrive and kind of introduce myself as a city staff member. Um, not trying to hijack the point of the, um, of the volunteer day, but just letting people know that the South Santa Rosa specific plan is um, in the process and the park itself is in the plan area. Um, so I will also work uh, my butt off alongside the volunteers and then offer um, to stay after to discuss the specific plan and any questions that they have about what's the specific plan, how would this affect me, what's the timeline. Um, and then finally, as was mentioned earlier tonight, uh, Earth Day uh, planning will have a presence at Earth Day and we'll be showcasing the variety of planning efforts that are happening throughout the city, including the South Santa Rosa Pacific plan. Um, as part of the engagement for this process, we are going to form an engagement advisory committee. Um, this will be a committee of interested parties, that be residents, um, renters, people doing business in the South Santa Rosa plan area. Um, and this will ultimately re represent their communities and hopefully bring others into the process that we wouldn't necessarily have direct access to. Um, 
We'd like to emphasize that staff knows that the plant area is a mosaic of communities. It's not just one South Santa Rosa community. And we're hoping to um, take that knowledge and really conduct the recruitment plan that is included in the um, community en engagement strategy to get some representative folks from those important communities in that area. And then um, a bit of a technical kind of slide here. So as part of the recruitment for the engagement advisory committee, um, staff is um, asking council to waive policy 000-006. Um, so a couple of requirements for the, that are um, associated with this policy is that um, committee members must be Santa Rosa residents. And for this situation, as I mentioned, um, 1,400 acres is not incorporated into the city. So we need some folks that are not in current city's, city of Santa Rosa residents to be part of this committee. Um, and then the formal application process is really kind of um, potentially an unnecessary barrier when we know some community leaders in that area that we can just directly engage with to see if either they or um, their designees would be interested in serving. Um, oftentimes, the formal application process can be just um, another step that are, is not ne necessarily um, important for this type of work. Um, and then also sometimes life happens and folks who are on the engagement advisory committee may not be able to fulfill their commitment to membership anymore. And if um, we had these requirements that are outlined in this policy, it would be a bit of a hassle to reappoint members and we're really trying to keep this project um, on the timeline and under budget. Um, with that, we'll move on to time frame and next steps. So right now we're in the um, phase two, the consultation phase. We've kicked off our engagement and um, that is discussed in the community engagement strategy that I'm, we're asking you to accept. Um, we will then move on to developing the alternatives that will be informed by community input that we've um, gathered throughout this engagement process. And ultimately, the adoption of the South Santa Rosa specific plan would occur near the end of 2025 and early 2026. So with that, that is, it is recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department that the council by motion accept the community engagement strategy for the South Santa Rosa specific plan and waive council policy 000 06, regulating appointments to boards, commissions, and committees to allow staff to appoint the members of the EAC for the South Santa Rosa specific plan. And with that, um, I'll pass it back to the mayor. Thank you both. All right, bringing it back to council. Questions? All right, council member Okrepke. Yeah, just one quick question. Um, from phase four to five on that last slide, um, can you explain why there's so much time between those two from July, it's about 28 months, from July 2025 to November of, I'm assuming that's 2025, or is that 2026? So it is uh, July 2025 and then with adoption expected in early 2026. Um, and so a lot of okay. that is, um, it is collecting all the feedback that, we've that we have received on the draft specific plan, solidifying that draft specific plan, and then developing the environmental impact report that has to go along with that. So it, it all takes time. And this timeline here of uh, about two years is generally speaking what it has uh, traditionally taken us for these types of of, uh, similar projects. All right, thank you. All right, Council Member Alvarez. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, first, I want to applaud you for your efforts on engagement. The Ash Wednesday, I mean, that's exactly what it takes to reach a community who normally doesn't engage civically. And in respect to the outreach or continued outreach, I know that we as policymakers have burdened staff with having to decide between policy and procedure when it comes to what method and, and really what language we're approaching the community with. And with that said, I'm hoping that, that the Spanish language is, is, is one that we're engaging in. Those flyers are bilingual. Uh, and, and also, I'd make myself available, should there be an ad hoc or liaison needed for, for this committee, I would like to volunteer, should that be needed, and just make that known. Thank you, Council Member. Any other questions? Then we'll move to public comment. Madam City Clerk. 
Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 15.2. If you have not provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. I'm seeing no one approach the podiums for 15.2. All right, back to council for any final comments. Mayor Rogers. Again, a job well done, definitely great. Uh, the community engagement, seeing you guys in places that I wouldn't normally see you were like, oh, why are they here? So it was really nice. So thank you very much for all the hard work you guys put into this. Councilmember Alvarez. Question, I know that we're giving the liberty to our staff to put together this team. Is there a way to, for us council to ratify the group once, once it's been formalized, or at least the last check-in? If that is the wish of the council, we certainly can do that. Um, in the past, uh, the council has um, appointed members um, to these advisory committees. Um, we've run into issues with quorum problems because we, you know, people drop off um, the committee for one reason or another. It takes some time to get um, uh, new members appointed. Uh, giving staff that ability to do that um, creates a lot of flexibility and, and a way for us to move this more quickly through the process. Um, but certainly if council wants us to come back um, to solidify the group, we can certainly do that. I retract that request, but I do see a, a comment by, by our legal counsel. It's my understanding the intent of this is that this is a advisory, this is a um, community advisory group and not uh, a new Brown Act body. And so if we want to keep it that way, then it would not be something that you all created or then ratified. Um, we would then have a lot of legal requirements and staff implications. Um, for staffing this, it would become a much more expensive proposition in terms of resources. So um, I just want to make sure that we don't inadvertently create something that is more than, than we have the bandwidth to manage. Excellent. All right. Council Member Alvarez, do we have a motion? I'm glad nobody asked. <laughs> yes, I'd like to uh, put forward an action uh, to approve a waiver of council policy 000-06 regarding appointments to boards, commissions, and committees to allow staff to appoint county residents within the specific plan area and to allow city staff to appoint members based on the EAC composition included in the strategy and secondly move to accept the community engagement strategy for the next South Santa Rosa specific plan and wait further reading of the text. Second. Second. All right, we've got a motion from Councilmember Alvarez. Second. And a second from Councilmember McDonald. Madam City Clerk. Thank you, Councilmember Rogers. Aye. Councilmember O'Krepke. Aye. Councilmember McDonald. Aye. Councilmember Fleming. Absent. Uh, Councilmember Alvarez. Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. Let the record show this passes with six affirmative votes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. And again, thank you for just being in the community. I think it is definitely great. 15.4, uh, Madam City Manager. Item 15.4, Budget Amendment One-Time Project Funding. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, my name is Alan Alton. I'm the Chief Financial Officer. Um, I'm going to scoot through these things as quickly as I can. I think you guys have probably seen more of me than you'd care. So uh, as we move along, um, as you know, as we go through the budget process, we there are some items that we cannot fit into our annual budget, uh, and we try to uh, uh, come back at a later point. 
using uh, uh, funds left over from the previous year, appropriate those out of the general fund reserves, and, uh, and use those dollars to pay for one-time needs, generally of a critical or at least important nature. Um, so this is the, what, what this uh, item is about. We have gone through that process. It used to be known as our, our mid-year budget adjustment. Uh, we're a little past mid-year, so uh, we won't, won't go through that. There is sufficient funding available in uh, the reserves to pay for one-time projects. Um, uh, uh, these we could not fit in when trying to keep our balance, our budget balanced as we go, go through the, the normal process. So, uh, uh, we, we went through a rather extensive process, um, of the departments bringing projects together over a period of time. They were vetted. There were additional questions asked. Some fell off the list, some kept going. And what you are, have before you is uh, a proposed list of projects totaling uh, $3,060,000. Uh, and uh, um, uh, with approval, uh, we would appropriate funding out of the general fund unassigned reserves uh, to fund these projects. Um, for the most part, and what you'll see as we go through here, we have, um, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had project start dates and uh, targeted completion dates. Uh, uh, so you know that these were uh, um, shovel ready, project ready uh, projects, if you will. Um, and so you can see how we, uh, uh, what these dates are. So as I shoot through and find my notes. So the first off is with the Human Resources Department and its NeoGov assessment. Uh, this project would utilize a consultant to, per, uh, to pro provide uh, a review and assessment of all current NeoGov models, modules, excuse me, uh, to optimize the use in HR and provide much needed uh, training. Uh, this is important to ensure that the city uh, is using the system to its full capacity and get the most out of the considerable investment that we put into it. So this is uh, an efficiency um, item. Uh, it would be $100,000 to do that. We expect to start that project uh, um, in July of 2024, and we're targeting uh, an October 25 completion date. Most of these are gonna be in about the one year, uh, little year, year and a half um, uh, timeframe. Next one is uh, an internal control audit update. We did our last uh, internal control full uh, outside uh, auditor come in and do specifically internal control policies. Back in 2016, they developed a management plan. Uh, we, at that point, we actually uh, had in-house staff uh, internal auditor that allowed us to go through that plan, uh, create policies, uh, uh, audit existing ones, and and so the uh, we've unfortunately have lost that position over over time, but um, so this would be to come in and do a refresher of that that management plan. Uh, uh, see if there are other things that need to be tested. Um, but in full disclosure, this will create the plan for us um, and we would need to find within our budget a way to uh, have an outside auditor come in and do the future work of auditing and testing of those policies. But all of that starts with the plan and we need help to be able to do that. And it has been a number of years since we've done it last. In uh, transportation and public works, we have uh, two projects. One are uh, in-ground vehicle lifts. This is out at the fleet maintenance facility. Um, so it will remove four in-ground lifts that, uh, and replace them with new lifts. 
Um, the original ones were installed in 1986. Uh, their parts are obsolete. Um, they are uh, provide a significant resource for us to be able to uh, service 190 medium and heavy duty vehicles, including transit buses and fire apparatus. Um, so there is also the potential for soil contamination uh, uh, should we leave the existing lifts in and they start to leak. So uh, we would uh, take the funding that we are asking for here, uh, the 932,000, we would add it to existing funding that has been um, uh, uh, put forward by Santa Rosa Water and Transit for a total of a $2 million project. And uh, we would start that in July and it would take us about a year to complete the program. Uh, we also have the fleet mass uh, electrification master plan. Um, Santa Rosa Water and Transportation Public Works have jointly submitted an application um, uh, in formula funding from the uh, Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program. Uh, so we are going to receive that, uh, um, but we need 160000 to uh, uh, complete the, the cost of, of that master plan. Uh, so the water part has theirs coming through on the grant. The, the general fund part would come through uh, from reserves. For information technology, we have three of them. Uh, one is video security in the downtown campus. Uh, uh, we would start in, uh, right away in April. Um, targeted completion date is June uh, 2025. Uh, this will provide funding for the equipment and labor to complete the installation. We've already started it. Uh, this would complete the ins uh, installation of the external video uh, security cameras in downtown City Hall, the chamber building and uh, bank building areas and parking lots. Uh, this is uh, come forward as a um, employee safety issue uh, and and again we've been trying to address this over a number of years. Uh, there is a Mitel phone replacement um, uh, again ready to start right away on this uh, targeted completion October 2025 $167,000 for the uh, the city's Current phone system uh, is being discontinued by the vendor and will no longer be supported for updates, enhancements, or security patches after December 2025. So it is uh, in our best interest to replace that system. Uh, and then $80,000 for uh, the on premises Excella system. So, same with the phone system, Excella is uh, permitting. An inspection system will no longer be supported by the vendor after December 2025. Um, so we need to look to replace that. The $80,000 is a one-time funding request to assist with the implementation and data uh, migration and, and interface costs. There will be a larger full project cost, but that will be um, uh, directed through our IT cost allocation plan to the departments that specifically use that, namely uh, planning and economic development and fire and any other system that uses or department that uses the system, but it's mostly those two. Police, uh, we have a radio upgrade project. This is $800,000. Um, this project will address ongoing coverage es uh, issues uh, throughout the city, uh, in the hospitals, uh, uh, Sonoma County Jail, and areas in Oakmont, uh, upgrading the radios to provide uh, uh, connection to cell towers and Wi-Fi, as well as the current radio network. Uh, should solve the coverage issues that we're having and provide uh, reliable coverage during mutual aid responses. 
Uh, this upgrade will also provide GPS tracking for our live monitoring of staff during critical uh, incidents. And uh, it should purchase or will purchase 170 portable radios and 63 in-car radios and the required software subscription for two years. Uh, we would start this uh, in 2024 and my understanding is uh, we are ready with a, uh, a bid right away so we should be able to have this um, uh, in place hopefully by the fire season this year so we're targeting early or late summer early fall uh, and a police server uh, upgrade this solution will provide uh, a more secure backup system for critical police data um, including case data and video surveillance and provide capacity for incoming technology needs the current data storage solution for the police department is outdated and has no space for growth and requires replacement. Uh, and for Rec and Parks, we have the Doyle Park ball field upgrades. Uh, I'll note that there's a typo under the department total. It should be $500,000. That is the ask. Um, this project will fund upgrades to the Doyle uh, um, Park ball field. Uh, really starting with new concessions and then a number of other uh, water, sewer, electrical upgrades. Um, th this will be combining with other funding that they have uh, in order to make this, this project go forward. Um, uh, this would, we're targeting a July 2024 start with a completion in December of 2025. And finally, we have a, a future project to talk about um, just briefly, because I don't have a ton of information on this, but it is exciting and we wanted to bring it to the council's attention. Uh, we had intended, uh, we, we've been talking about doing HVAC uh, um, upgrades for a very, very long time uh, and we, we're actually prepared to make a $5 million investment into those uh, upgrades. However, um, uh, we there is a program that would allow us to use those funds uh, or uh, an amount of funds uh, as to leverage federal, as seed money basically to lever leverage federal money to come in to do a more extensive energy efficiency upgrades. So we would not only get our HVAC system done, but other energy efficient upgrades throughout the city we would be able to do, it would be phased in over a number of years. And we're still doing our due diligence with this. So we're not prepared to come with the full program now. We will come back in a later date and discuss uh, those opportunities. So by way of fiscal impact, so these are uh, one-time uh, projects. Um, uh, um, so there's, on the surface, there's no ongoing costs. I, I did note in some areas where we are dealing with with the initial impacts or uh, there, there may be some budgetary uh, um, uh, ab or absorbing future costs and future budgets. Uh, but for the impact of this, this is, uh, these are all one-time uh, important projects that are shovel ready to go, um, can be started uh, within either this month or the next couple of months and, and be completed. There are, uh, we would be pulling from the general fund unassigned reserves for this. Um, as of June 30th, June 30th, 2023, our reserves uh, totaled about $60.8 million or 31.7% uh, of expenditures, which is well above our 17% um, uh, policy requirement. Uh, if we were able to do this action, um, uh, it would reduce our reserves 
uh, uh, down to about 28.6% uh, um, of expenditures, expenditures or about $22 million over the council policy. So with that, uh, the finance department recommends the city council by resolution amend the fiscal year 23-24 uh, adopted budget by increasing appropriations in the amount of $3,060,000 to fund one-time projects as set forth in Exhibit A of the resolution. And I'm available and those that are still awake are available to um, answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you for the presentation and for those of you that are still awake, thank you for uh, still being here. Looking to Council Okrepke. Yeah, just one quick question. For those Doyle Park upgrades to the concessions, would those be consistent with what um, maybe Councilmember Rogers would be better uh, educated on this? What would a minor league team per se would be looking at for uh, a concessions area? So the scuba, scuba divers? Any hypothetical minor league, pro, pro-am league? Yes, that, I, that's the goal. Yeah, I think it would definitely put us down that path. Look, man, it took three months for me to get the hat. I just need to be able to wear it. All right, any other question, questions? Councilmember McDonald. I have a question on every single slide. I'm just kidding, I know. <laughs> I just have a couple of little things. Um, one, thank you for doing the audit control. I appreciate that we're going back and getting some of those back in place for my long-term finance and, and just making sure that that's back. Um, targeted completion on the radios for police. I didn't see a completion date. I just wanna make sure that we're moving forward to support that. Yes, uh, we are, I apologize that was a typo in the slide. Um, uh, I'm glad I found it. Yes, thank you for that and pointing it out. That was very, <laughs> uh, yes, um, I, I went through that pretty quickly and I apologize for that and to the interpreter. Um, uh, the, the hope for that, we, we are ready to, for the purchase uh, uh, pretty much right away. In fact, I believe there will be an item on a, a future council agenda that will deal with that and the idea would be to have these in place by uh, late summer early fall of this year right away so okay. yeah we want to get them in place by the fire season okay just two more things on the Doyle Park can, is this not something we could use the park impact fees for yeah yes we could we could. So my question is, is there another way that we could spend $500,000 on other capital improvements and be able to use some of those reserves from park impact fees? Hold, hold please. Not all of them. If I, if I went back and added the math from what we were told earlier, there was still a few million dollars, but Sorry, the, the, I already <laughs> struggle with my hearing, so. <laughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. So, again, the the park implant or uh, the park development fees that are, uh, um, uh, they are all allocated. So there aren't. Uh, if if we were to switch this out and maybe I, I'm looking over here and I'm hitting, I'm seeing nods and I don't know if we're, if that's exactly what, what we're gonna do. So um, maybe what I should do is, is confer I, with I'm them really with the quick when this. you're asking your other question and I can get a more coherent answer from the fine gentlemen that are to my right. Yes, yeah, so I'm fine with approving it as it is, but I think that if you have an opportunity to pull from another reserve and backfill this money to do something else, mm -hmm. that's what I prefer specifically on this. If there is actual money that's not allocated, since we do have money in another account. Yes, yeah, so the park fees are actually allocated 
allocated, what you we can bring you um, an updated um, spreadsheet. Some of the um, programs are fully funded, some of them are not. If you would like for us to go back and take a look at what's been funded and what's fully funded, we can make adjustments if, if you would like for us to do that. I think if you can do both, that would be great. Um, and then the last thing is when you replace the HVAC equipment, I'm not sure if we've taken into account the reduction in what we're gonna be spending in PG&E because that should also be considered for general fund that we'll be able to see some of those revenues increase. And, and that's part of the study and is part of the due diligence that we're doing right now, but obviously that is why it's an attractive program Agree. Uh, uh, to use. So um, I look forward to coming back to that at a later date. Thank you. Vice Mayor. I like that we're doing a deep, vi deep dive. I'm here for it. Um, no, in reality, I, I'm glad you underlined the fact that these projects were shovel ready and that we can, we can make some good things happen right away. Um, and secondly, I just wanted you to check my math again. So if we, if we have about three million that we feel comfortable at allocating to one-time projects, does this mean that we think that our, our budgeting is going to come in or that our actuals are going to come in around a percent and a half of the, of, of the original budget? Uh... <laughs> And if that's a hard question, you don't need to answer it. I was thinking you could take yeah. a victory lap with. Um, no, I, I wish. I, I I think we're where we are at last. Uh, where where we've last reported on it, and there'll be spoiler alert: a new uh, third quarter budget performance at the end of this month with the finance subcommittee. So we'll have an update of that. But um, uh, we are still trending to uh, be very close to budget. But again, remember, we began the year with a deficit. So we're trending to match our deficit. Um, uh, we are looking very, we're, we check it monthly to see if turn back is, is, is rising or, or anything that is going to, uh, help us cover that, and so far we haven't seen it uh, um, uh, that anything that's significantly changed from where we are from mid-year. So what this is telling us is that we have sufficient reserves to do this now. We think these, um, these projects are important to move forward now, but please keep your eye on you know, in a couple months, and then the next year, and the next year, you're you're going to start seeing the reserves probably get smaller. I I, I really do. Uh, um, what we're seeing in terms of trends is that our um, our actuals are hitting on line with budget, and which is great, except for we're coming to you with deficits, so that makes it bad. So we're, it's good and bad. Um, Understood. Thank you. Any additional questions? Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate public comment? Yes, we are now taking public comment on items 15.4. If you'd like to provide public comment but have not provided your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podiums for public comment. All right, are there any comments from council members? Comments? Nope, nope, nope. I'll just say um, I wanna thank you, CFO, uh, for your hard work and for uh, just being patient with us. Um, both you and the city manager are handling the budget in a way that I think a lot of us council members have not seen and those of us that have been here for a while. So thank you for your patience um, and thank you for handling uh, the city's funds appropriately and in a good manner. I am very appreciative. So with that, I will hand it over to Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I move that we approve this resolution amending the fiscal year 2023-2024 budget by increase, increasing appropriations by $3,060,000 to fund one-time projects and wait for the reading of the text. Okay. 
I have a motion made by Vice Mayor Stapp and a motion uh, and a second from Councilmember Okrepke. Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate the vote? Yes. Sorry, my fingers are moving slow now. Let's see here. Councilmember Rogers. Aye. Councilmember Okrepke. Aye. Councilmember McDonald. Aye. Councilmember Fleming is absent. Councilmember Alvarez. Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. Let the record show this passes with six affirmative votes. All right, and I tricked you guys, we're not done. Um, so we're gonna head back up to item six, and that is the report out on study and closed session. So I'll hand it over to Madam City Attorney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, there was no reportable action taken in um, the closed session. And as you may recall from a very long time ago, earlier today, we did have a study session um, that was a very robust conversation about um, impact of development, I'm sorry, the impact of development impact fee waivers. Um, and that is the end of my report. Thank you. Any questions from council members? Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment on this item? We are now taking public comment on item six. If you'd like to make a comment, please make your way to the podiums. Mayor MC, no one approached the podiums. Perfect. We already completed our staff briefings. Madam City Attorney and Madam City Manager, do you have any reports for us? I like those shaking heads. All right. Um, we are going to continue to item 10. No, we really can't do that anymore because we've already done all the business, sorry. Okay, so we are going to uh, go to our mayor and council members reports and I'm very sternly looking at all the council members and, oh God. <laughs> are you guys joking? Oh. <laughs> council member Rogers. Thank you so much, Mayor. I have three things for the council tonight. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, beginning of the month, we have most of our regional bodies. Uh, just wanted to put on the council's radar that at the Sonoma County Transportation Authority meeting uh, yesterday, it's been a blur, almost two days ago at this point, um, we had our first look at the greenhouse gas emission update uh, for all of the region. In the staff report for yesterday's meeting, there's a temporary link that goes to a dashboard that looks at how each jurisdiction is doing in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the top level for Santa Rosa is that we've seen a 28% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions between our peak and this was the 2020 inventory update. The 2022 is underway right now, so look forward to that. Wanted to make sure folks had that on uh, their radars because it is really interesting uh, information. Sonoma Clean Power, we got an update on our GeoZone initiative. For those who don't remember, we are investing in three different geothermal plant technologies to try to advance renewable energy projects in our region. I will skip the in-depth explanation of how this is different, but feel free to ask questions at another time. And then finally, the third item, I would like to add to the council agenda a discussion about a senior overlay for our mobile home parks. Second. Second. And we can bring that back at another council meeting. All right, so, Madam City Clerk, we have a request by motion by Council Member Rogers, second by Mayor Rogers, and we'll come back with that one. Thank so you. I'll make sure I get it added to the next available agenda that is in accordance with our preliminary requirements. Perfect, thank you so much. And with that, we'll go to Council Member Alvarez. Thank you. Expect a new website. I have no idea when it's going to be launched, but keep checking the internet. I've seen a preview of it, and you're going to like it. Uh, with that being said, I would like to put on the future agenda uh, an item to discuss the burden that we are placing on our staff in regards to language uh, other than English when it comes to uh, notices in, in, in our Hispanic communities, and I would hope that we can have that discussion. Second. 
We have a motion made by Councilmember Alvarez and a second made by Councilmember McDonald. Madam City Clerk, hoping we can get that one on too. Uh, I would also like to put on future agenda items, a little bit more work. And this one is in regards to the buffer zones when it comes to cell phone towers. Second. We have a motion made by Councilmember Alvarez and a second by Councilmember McDonald. Thank you again, Madam. Yes, ma'am. Can I just, uh, uh, through the mayor, I'd like clarity on the first um, request for a future agenda item by Councilmember Alvarez. Just for clarity, discussion, a future discussion of the burden we are putting on staff regarding noticing in other languages? Correct, because uh, the reason being that I've seen the confusion that we've placed on those shoulders of staff when they're trying to decide whether it's policy or practice. And I'm hoping that we can create policy. Can, can we change it around to maybe um, what is the policy and if we want to revisit the policy? Correct. And to have it applied to where? So have that discussion, is that okay? That, that is correct. Uh, you made a second, is that okay? All right, so they are okay. Does that clarify your request? Thank Madam you. Sir? Just as a summary, a discussion of the development of translation policy requirements? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You good? All right, so now we're going down to Okrepke. Um, yeah, Lon's here, so if he wants to talk about when the website's gonna launch, he can. Uh, so we saw that the Open Government Task Force, it's, it, it's great. So if anybody wants to ask Lon, he could, he could probably give you an idea of when that's gonna get launched. Um, other than that, um, I'll skip over the fun stuff that I did over the past week, but uh, I do wanna say on um, April 23rd at 9 a.m. here, we will have a public safety subcommittee meeting and we'll be discussing illicit massage businesses as well as the public will get its first look at the fire department strategic plan. Thank you. Um, Councilmember McDonald, are you sure? You're gonna have to hold it for two weeks. All right, now you've, now I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to um, quickly announce I was the speaker for the advocacy group for Santa Rosa Metro Chamber and I just wanted to thank them for the invitation to come and be their speaker at lunchtime as well as attending the service awards. So I'm not skipping over the fun stuff because I really want to thank our employees for their dedication to the city for all their years of service and I'm happy that we're getting caught up on the many people that have deserved so many awards and it's so great. Those are like the, the sugar for me that when we get to go and see all of our great employees and recognize them and all their dedication to the city. So I just want to say thanks to staff for putting that on and for the opportunity to attend. Were you there by yourself? It'll no. just help all of us if you just say who was there. Mayor was there. Vice Mayor was there. Okrepke was there. Your council. Because <laughs> we just love saying your name. <laughs> who else was there? I can't remember. But Okay, the, everyone who, who was there was, was there. there. Okay, <laughs> perfect. All right, thank you. I know it is, it, we're almost done. Bear with me. All right, so um, for mine, really quickly, on uh, March 27th, the Sonoma County Homeless Coalition, formerly COC, met the coalition approved recommendations for 7.9 million in funding to 14 uh, agencies under the fiscal year 24-25 local homelessness services notice of funding availability, also known as NOFA. Um, the coalition received 40 applications totaling over 12 million. The funding recommendations will go to the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors in June. Um, now I don't have to talk about the Employee Service Awards, thank you. On 4-7, I was able to attend the Operating Engineer District 10 picnic, um, and that was special because I was also able to meet with some of the Santa Rosa's own staff um, and their families, so that was really great um, to see them there and not at work. Um, April 8th, the WAC Water Advisory Committee met. Sonoma Water staff presented the final fiscal year 2024-2025 budget 
um, and rates to the WAC, and the WAC unanimously recommended approval. The uh, rates result is 9.88% increase for Santa Rosa. Sonoma Water staff provided a water supply update, noting that Lake Sonoma and Lake Mendocino are at their maximum allowable storage um, for this time of year. And Sonoma Water staff also provided an update on the Ill Russian River Project Authority and noted that the authority selected the pump back design as the option to move forward to allow for the continued diversion of the Ill River water to the Russian River. There were uh, four designs, no, three designs that were uh, put forth, three or four, I don't remember, and they selected um, the pump back design. And with that, Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate public comment. Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 11. If you're in chamber and would like to provide a comment, please make your way to the podium. You will have two minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of the period. Mayor MC, no one approached the podiums for public comment on item 11. Um, so now we'll move on to item 11.2, matters from council regarding future agenda um, items. And uh, 11.2, was matters from council regarding, nope, not that one, 11.2.1, request for agenda item regarding temporarily vacating portions of 4th Street, uh, which was brought by Mayor Rogers and a second from member or council member Rogers. Council member Rogers. Um, so now we take a vote. Is there any discussion that needs to be had amongst the council? Yes. Yes, for uh, ACM Dunstan, um, how many full-time employees do we currently have in economic development? Permanent employees? How many people are actually working full-time in economic development right now? So currently we only have a temporary, or uh, not a temporary, a interim person which would be Jill, who is actually our real estate. She's actually working in real estate, so she's interim deputy director of economic development. And then Raphael, who was um, working as, I guess, a program specialist, not um, exactly sure what the title is. He is now uh, being used as a liaise um, on the permitting side, but is still doing some work in the economic development department. My question is, is who would be doing this work? Through the mayor. Uh, it would be myself, Director Osborne, Acting Deputy Director Scott, and a contingent of other staff from Planning and Economic Development. That doesn't exist is what you're saying. So I, I guess my discussion point on this is I think this is a worthy discussion to have. I think it's worthy that we have this discussion at some point. We literally do not have anybody to do the work right now in order to, do, to, to take this on. That's my biggest concern. Now, once budget comes and we have people that are staffed or, or, may, or we go through, because we are in the recruiting process, I assume, once all of that is done, I, I think that'd be an appropriate time. But we literally do not have people to do this unless we take people off of other jobs, overseeing departments and, and, and things of that nature. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, may, uh, anyone here for public comment on this item? Seeing no public comment, Madam City Clerk, may you please? We need a motion and a second. Oh. Okay, I'll, I'll make the motion. So I'll like to make a motion to uh, to close portions of, of 4th Street temporarily. Can I the, offer a clarifying amendment? Go for it. Specifically from D Street to, I can't remember if it's Hinton or Exchange, whichever the, the first street by Beer Baron is. 
and then jumping over to the other one, which is by La Rosa, to B Street, so that that way we close 4th Street for uh, bicycle and pedestrian use, but also maintain the traffic flow specifically around the square. Yes, Madam City Attorney. If I may, Madam Mayor, um, the item in front of you is to determine um, whether to put something on the agenda. So um, the motion you'd be making would be um, to have staff come back with an item uh, to determine whether to vacate those portions of 4th Street. You're not actually doing it this evening. Yeah, I just felt a little more clarity in the motion might alleviate some panicked phone calls. All right. Yeah, yes, you do need to vote on it, but the motion is to um, whether or not to agendize this item. Mm -hmm. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote? I didn't hear the second, Mayor. I'm sorry. Second. Uh and again, the motion language is to place a discussion of impacts of temporarily vacating portions of 4th Street to a future agenda date as amended by Council Member Rogers. If I may, through the mayor, um, the term vacate, my understanding is a legal term, and so we would prefer that the term be closed, not vacate. I'm good if you're good. Thank you. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember Okrepke? No. Councilmember McDonald? Aye. Councilmember Fleming is absent. Councilmember Alvarez? Aye. Councilmember or Vice Mayor Stapp? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record show this passes with five affirmative votes with Councilmember Fleming absent and Okrepke, Councilmember Okrepke voting no. All right. Moving on to item 11.2.2, uh, request for agenda item regarding development of process to uh, activate vacant parcels. Um, the motion was made by Council Member Rogers and it was seconded by Council Member Okrepke. So now we'll have any discussion. All right. So seeing none, we'll now take public comment on this item. Seeing no one moving to the podium. All right, so no public comment right now. Madam, oh, I need a motion. Moved. Second. All right, I have a motion made by Council Member Rogers and a second from Vice Mayor Stapp. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember Okrepke? Aye. Councilmember McDonald? Aye. Councilmember Fleming is absent. Councilmember Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor Stapp? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record show this passes with six affirmative votes. Thank you. Moving to item 12, which is our approval of minutes. We have one set of minutes, March 26, 2024, which was a special meeting. Council, are there any corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, oh, actually I can do it. Um, if you would like to make a public comment, please go to the podium. We see no one moving towards the podium, so we will now um, adopt the minutes as presented. All right. We already did consent. So we will now have our second 
Oh, written communications are attached on to the agenda, item 17. If you would like to make public comment on item 17, written communications, please make your way to the podium. There is no one making their way to the podium. Moving on to item 18, which is our public comment on non-agenda matters. This is our second time that the public can make comment on um, items that are not on the agenda but are within our jurisdiction as council. Um, if you would like to make a comment, please make your way to the podium. Seeing no one making their way to the podium, we will now close public comment. And. Um, we have nothing else on the agenda, but I would, before I adjourn, like to congr congratulate our colleague, um, Councilmember Rogers, on making 40 under 40. And thank you to our other uh, colleague, Councilmember Okrepke, for making the nomination. Um, so congratulations, and thank you for keeping your colleagues in mind, Councilmember Okrepke. And with that, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much.